pizza or salad? Which one do you think I'm having for dinner tonight? Well, one and 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 Slow it down. Small islands will feel it the most. Especially the people them with the fun the coast. We're losing the reefs and the beaches. Flooded in the coastal communities. Changing climate, some lifestyle changes we got to make. Emission of gases we have to reduce. Turn off the lights when they're not in you. So much of the warming changes we see mm -hmm. are caused by human activity. Chemical poisoning in the air. Poisoning the air. Greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Oh, yeah. This is a warning. Change is happening. Real. We've got to do something. I tell you. Act now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When or how. When or how. Climate change. Happening right now. Happening now. Worldwide. See the signs. See the signs. They all reveal. They all reveal. Global climate change is real. And it's not a Cryptocurrency, where fortunes can be made overnight. And 2021 is the hottest year on record. Bitcoin set a new all time high. Ethereum. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Allow me to welcome you back to day three of the workshop, and we thank you so much for sticking with us. We remind us that our, our aim is looking at building climate resilience in the agricultural sector and emerging applications in climate smart agriculture. And today we'll delve even further. You had such a lively discussion and you were exposed to a number of tools available to you. And even today we'll spend some more time looking at some of the innovative climate impact assessment tools that are available. Allow me, our ladies and gentlemen, to acknowledge Mr. Orville Gray from the Global Climate Fund, Ms. Elizabeth Emanuel, and Ms. Gina Sanguinette Phillips from the CRIF SPC, and Ms. Yunome Gordon, the Climate Change Division. And our colleagues will be properly introduced later on in the day. So on day one, you were reminded of our climate change context and had an introduction to crop simulation modeling. 
and some climate services. On day two, you would have heard about disaster risk financing instruments, the climate smart dilemma, make some of the tools available. And today we're gonna to spend some more time on those innovative tools and how you can use them to understand a little better climate modeling and how it impacts on, on our food security. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the day. I won't delay us. I wish for your productive day. Thank you so much for joining on day three. Have a beautiful one. Morning, all. Morning, everybody else. Okay, thank you very much. We are very happy to be with you on uh, the final day of our workshop. Uh, it has been a very enthralling day, um, enthralling series of events. We are very, very heavily um, to so many persons, and we're very deeply encouraged by your words of appreciation and encouragement. I want to use this opportunity to say that today is a very critical day. We want to start with uh, a presentation, a series of presentation from our donors. Now, you don't often get the opportunity to speak to donors whenever you have a conference. They provide their funding, and after they would have done so, then they disappear. We have an opportunity, a unique opportunity this morning, not just to provide uh, a chance to hear what you have to say, but also, to, as, as Steve Maxime would say, to interrogate the information that they're providing. Allow me, therefore, to welcome to the panel or panelists. Uh, we have um, the CRIP SPC, um, Elizabeth Emanuel, who is the technical assistant manager. Um, team and is also the head of the CRIF Corporate Communications Manager team. We also do have uh, Dr. Orville Gray. Uh, Dr. Orville Gray is a Jamaican at heart. Of course, he was here with us um, in the Climate Change Division. Um, they say has gone to greener pastures or fire pastures, take your pick. But he's the regional manager uh, for Caribbean and Brazil for the Green Climate Fund. Um, Dr. Gray is a Ecologist by training and climate change researcher. He holds a PhD in environmental biology from the University of West Mono and has over 20 years' experience in the field of environmental impact assessment. Um, his bio is actually in our booklet, you can read a bit of it. Um, but Orville, really, really, thank you so very much for taking the time. You're at the, the total other side of the world in a total different time zone. Um, you can tell us what time is it there now. We know it's a sacrifice. We thank you so much. And Narada George, it's not Mrs. Narada George, is in Barbados. Um, well, well, in Barbados, between Barbados and Grenada, she's the readiness consultant there for the GCF and has also joined us as well. Thank you very much. And we also have program coordinator for monitoring and evaluation with the Climate Change Division, uh, Ms. Uh, Shamoy McLean, who is a representative for Ms. Dunamay Gordon and comes very highly recommended. And she, at, you know, at the notice that was given, has kindly consented to be with us. Thank you so much, panelists. I'm going to um, invite the panelists, to, first of all, to give a four-minute brief presentation, each of them. Um, so they need to share their screens. Uh, Michael, if you could help me, or Roddy, you could help me with that. I'm going to ask Orville Gray to start. Um, so Orville, thank you so much for being with us. Um, let me know when Orville's screen can be shared, Rodico. Um, so Mr. Gray, you can go ahead. Dr. Gray, thank you so much. Morning, everyone. Um, are, are you hearing me, Dave? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Great. Um, thank you for having us. Um, we're delighted to be supporting. Um, a happy new year to everyone. And we are certainly looking forward to this um, conversation. Let me get this up and running quickly. All right, so let me, you're seeing the screen now, I hope. 
It's over here. Okay, great. Let me jump right in because I know time is of the essence. So I'm the regional manager with um, focus on the Caribbean region um, for the Green Climate Fund. We are headquartered in, in Korea, as um, most of you are aware. And we were established um, as an instrument under the UNFCCC, um, where we had our first board meeting in 2012. Our first projects were approved in 2015, and we are currently up to $9.8 billion pledge for GCF1. That's the first replenishment period. Um, you know, we are, we are over 190 projects, over 100 projects on the implementation, over 100 accredited entities. So we are doing quite a significant amount of work with respect to climate change and climate change financing globally with respect to developing countries. How, did you, how to access the GCF support? So there are three main ways that we look at it. We engage with accredited entities to participate in existing approved GCF programs. We engage with our accredited entities and our national designated authorities to develop proposals in line with entity work programs and country programs. This is because we value country ownership. So we, we put the emphasis with the countries on their pipeline, what are their priorities, where climate change is concerned and how we can support them. And we discuss with our NDAs the potential to use the readiness program to increase the private sector engagement because this is a critical area that we anticipate that a lot of funding will be necessary because the private sector is the one that's going to lead us um, through to achieve the goals at the end of the day because the public sector will not be able to finance everything. In terms of our financing modalities, there are several different modalities in the GCF. There's a proposal um, approval process, which everyone knows. That's where all the funding proposals primarily come in. But within that, you can have what we refer to as a simplified approval process for proposals that will not have significant environmental impact or don't require you know, serious geotechnical work, et cetera, that would um, have significant risk associated with them. Similarly, the enhancing direct access. We do have technical support that can help to prepare these project um, concepts through the project preparation facility. And we have the readiness and preparatory support program, which is essentially the one that NDS command that gives them that $1 million cap per annum to help with strengthening, um, preparing frameworks, or, or looking at adaptation planning at a national and subnational level. And as I said, who do we work with? We work with who we refer to as accredited entities. So these are entities that have gone through some amount of vetting by the GCF. And these are these entities we channel the funds through for the implementation of the projects. In the Caribbean region, we have quite, we have a few accredited entities, some that are well known, such as the Caribbean Development Bank or 5Cs, for instance. But outside that, we do have entities with government such as the Department of Environment in Antigua and Barbuda. We do have quite a good pipeline of project uh, of accredited entities coming through, and we're looking forward to ramping up and getting some uh, more coming through, especially in the private sector space. For GCF in terms of um, our portfolio in SIDS, because that is where um, Caribbean islands would be primarily concerned, $1.2 billion in SIDS financing has been committed. And as you can see, this is representative of roughly 45 projects, so quite a bit there, but still a gap that we need to finance for seeds in the Caribbean and elsewhere. In terms of looking at it from the perspective of um, the sector that you are looking at today, health, well-being, and food and water security for us is roughly $43.8 million in financing to the Caribbean region right now. Um, so that's about 11% of the, the financing that's there. And for the total financing in the Caribbean region, we're looking at just over $400 million to date with at least nearly $53 million dispersed so far. So there's still work to be done, but as you can see, there's a good spread in terms of the financing that has been done to date. Um, we have in terms of the readiness program, over 71 approved so far, um, you know, valued at in excess of $15 million. We have under the PPF program, we have five approved PPF. Several of them are multi-country um, proposals, some in the private sector space. 
And in terms of project pipeline, 20 public sector pipeline projects representing um, a commitment from GCF of over $380 million and seven private sector action pipeline projects representing GCF financing of roughly $930 million. So quite a bit there to be done. Looking at the agriculture sector, we do have a number of GCF sectoral guides and we have one specifically for agriculture and food security. And when we look at this sector, we're looking at three complementary pathways, how to promote resilient agriculture, facilitating climate informed advisory and risk management services related to this sector and how to reconfigure our food systems. And tying these three complementary pathways together, we have six cross-cutting issues that we focus on, including capacity building, communities and leadership, women and youth empowerment, because that is a very important and critical area for us, as well as private sector engagement. And we cannot let, leave out the monitoring, evaluation and learning component that we hope to, to bring things forward. And just to quickly wrap up my opening section, we do have, for instance, a, a bit of work going on at the readiness level. This is one example. Regional readiness support that's being done with the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, which is being led by the Ministry of Environment and Housing from the Bahamas, supporting, I think, about six or seven countries with a grant amount just over one, one point, just about $1.2 million, and looking at three relevant outcome areas. You know, how, how to look at relevant country stakeholders that are establishing adequate capacity systems and networks to support their planning, programming, and implementation. Looking at GCF recipient um, countries that can develop or enhance their strategic frameworks to address the policy gaps, improve sectoral expertise, and the respective enabling environments, and increasing the number of quality project concept notes that can be developed and submitted to the GCF for financing. So with that, I, I rest my opening lines and look forward to the conversation that we will have. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Somebody just sent a message. Can you hear me? Okay, good morning. Um, apologies for that break. Um, okay, because I asked, um, Ms. Chamoyo, can you mind the other story or a Google? Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. I'm trying to share my screen, but. I'm not being allowed to share my screen. So in the interest of time, I'll just go ahead and talk. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sure. But what is this? Okay. All right, good morning again. So the Climate Change Division it became operational in September 2013. We are currently under the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. Our mission is to lead, provide strategic support, coordinate and monitor the transformational change towards a climate resilient society for Jamaica. Um, within the CCD, the climate change agenda is organized and managed through 
two distinct tracks, adaptation and mitigation, where we focus on several cross-cutting thematic areas to include finance, research, capacity development, and public education awareness and behavior change. These, of course, are all done through stakeholder engagements. The CCD plays an integral role in strengthening GOJ's institutional capacity to access and plan for climate finance through collaboration with ministries, departments, and agencies, the private sector, and civil society. As focal points, the Climate Change Division ensures in-country coordination, monitoring, and reporting with several international mechanisms. And these guide international processes, especially for accessing climate finance and some of the mechanisms to which um, the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation through the CCD serves as focal point um, are where the national focal point to the UNFCCC with the responsibility to ensure close, oper close cooperation with the convention secretariat including the identification of national financial and technical support needs. We're also the national designated authority to the Green Climate Fund with the responsibility of engaging stakeholders, issuing no objection letters, approve readiness support, provide nomination letters for direct access. We're also the designated authority to the Adaptation Fund with the responsibility of endorsing project and program proposals by implementing entities for adaptation project in the country and accreditation applications of national implementing entities to access resources of the Adaptation Fund. We are the national designated entity to the Climate Te Technology Center and Network, CTCN, which has the responsibility of managing technical assistance requests made to CTCN for addressing barriers that hinder the development and transfer of climate technologies. And in addition, we're the co-focal point with the Planning Institute of Jamaica to the NDC partnership with the responsibility to provide guidance on in-country technical assistance needs and to develop and implement a partnership plan for the implementation of the nationally determined contribution. There are several um, sources that Jamaica obtains finance. Uh, we get funding through bilateral sources such as the EU, Canada, China, Germany, et cetera. We also um, access funding through UNFCCC sources, such as the Global Environment Facility, the Adaptation Fund, and the Green Climate Fund. CCD also um, access source, sources through non-UNFCCC um, sources, such as the UN Red and the Climate Investment Fund through their Strategic Climate Fund and Clean Technology Transfer. Also through national and regional um, sources, such as Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility and the Seed Caribbean Development Bank. And there are other sources, such as our domestic budget, um, through private sector, uh, from households, institutional investors, private equity, and venture capital. Uh, I am aware of the four minutes, <laughs> four minutes restriction, so I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that very timely presentation. I'm sure that we will have more time. <coughs> Sorry. I'm sure that we'll have more time to further explore some of the other ways to respond it can be provided by the CCD. Um, I'm going to ask now our colleague from CRIP to go ahead. Um, Gina, can you go ahead, please? Good morning, colleagues. I will just share a short presentation, even though some of you who are here the first, the first and second day um, will know some of this information already. But um, okay. Um, so basically, I just want to make a caveat, of course, CRIF is not a funding agency per se. As you all know, uh, we're a parametric, a company that provides parametric insurance policies to Caribbean and Central American governments, and as of 2020, also to electric utility companies in the Caribbean. So CRIP actually operates as a development insurance company 
in that we do work in partnership with regional organizations and such as SEDEMA and Five Cs and CIMH and so on, as well as our member governments to increase climate resilience and resilience to natural hazards of all types. Um, so one of the key things that CRIP is able to do is to provide insurance coverage for areas that are not available in traditional insurance. One example being the electric utilities policy, which provides coverage for transmission and distribution infrastructure for utilities, which is not generally available on the traditional insurance market. And so we like to stress that CRIF insurance and insurance in general is one key component in a country's disasters financing strategy. So the overall strategy must include other instruments that are better suited to address other hazards, for example, your annual floods and so on. CRIF is meant to deal with catastrophes and, and high impact events. And the main, not the main selling point, but the key selling point is that CRIF provides quick liquidity, allowing governments to quickly access resources to assist the most vulnerable in their communities. So CRIF provides five products currently, earthquake, for tropical cyclones, which are based on wind and storm surge, and excess rainfall, and as of 2019, fisheries policies under an initiative called COAST, and for electric utility companies. And so CRIF's parametric insurance products are different from the traditional insurance in that it makes payments based on the intensity of an event, such as the wind speed and storm surge for tropical cyclone, ground shaking for earthquake and volume of rainfall for excess rainfall products. And the payments are based on the intensity of an event and the amount of loss calculated in a pre-agreed model caused by these events, looking at the impacts on the exposure of the country. So since 2007, when CRIF was formed, it has made 54 payouts, totaling 245 million US dollars to 16 member governments. And CRIF's proposition is that all payouts are made within 14 days of the event. And the graph shows you some examples of how countries have used payouts in the region. So CRIP is also involved in a project called the Climate Risk Adaptation and Insurance in the Caribbean Project, which promotes micro insurance, which is targeted at low income individuals and potentially small organizations such as co-ops or um, MSMEs and so on. So the livelihood protection policy is the microinsurance product developed under this program, and it's available to farmers, fishers, market vendors, any persons whose livelihood is potentially affected by um, adverse weather events. And in this case, speak about rain and high winds. And so it's an example of an individual level policy that can help communities recover after a natural hazard event. And currently we're working in five countries as listed there, but with the ultimate goal, of course, of expanding throughout the rest of the Caribbean. And those are the partners there are supported by the German federal government. And just another note, in addition to our insurance products, we do have, CRIF does have a technical assistance program and it includes a variety of initiatives which focus on organizations as well as individuals. We have a range of partnerships with regional organizations such as the University of the West Indies through which we are participating in this forum as well as with a number of other organizations implementing initiatives that increase resilience in the region. We do have a small grants program for NGOs, community-based organizations, um, academia, to implement small-scale risk reduction projects. So this is up to 25,000 US dollars for a grant, and we 
um, encourage interested persons to apply or to, to split, spread the word about this program so that your stakeholders and constituents with which, with which you work um, would apply for this program. We also provide scholarships at the undergraduate and postgraduate level um, at the University of the West Indies and at, oh, I'm sorry, that's not here, but we also provide scholarships at the postgraduate level for study in the Caribbean, as well as um, UK, US, and Canada. And we are currently offering a course at the University of the West Indies on disaster risk financing. That's a permanent course at the university and persons are invited to participate in that as well. And a recent addition has been our Disaster Risk Reduction in Schools program, where we are working with schools or will be working with schools. We recently produced our first publication targeted at children eight to 12 years old. So if you're interested in that, you can let us know. And so if anyone has any questions, I mean, this is part of the panel, I'll be happy to discuss them. But even after today, if you'd like, information, uh, please contact us at prcrif.org. Thanks, Dale, that's it for me. Sure, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate that so much and um, you've laid it out very well. Okay, uh, we are now open for questions. There are 71 people on Zoom. I don't know how many are on YouTube. Um, Dion, if you can check on that for me, please. Um, how we are going to do the interaction, you will type your questions in the chat and we will ask you when you're doing so to please indicate to whom your question is being addressed so that the respective panelists can be aware that you are trying to ask them a question. Um, I'm going to get the ball and I'm going to go to Orville. Orville, we have a question here for you. Can you tell us, um, and I'm going to refer to everybody by first name if there's no offense, uh, what is the duration between, the average duration between application and approval and approval and disbursement? There's a two-part question. Can you, can you answer that for me in general? Uh, th th thanks for that question, Dale. Um, that, that's a very tricky question to answer. Um, it, you know, it, it's pretty hard to say uh, an average time because each individual proposal has their own complexities. And again, it depends on the type of proposal we are speaking of. I mean, a readiness proposal versus a uh, a project, full funding project. So, so there, there, there's a difference there. But what I would say is that um, we can push through, for instance, a full funding project um, from start to finish within um, six, six to eight months it, 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 for a full funding proposal. It's possible. We've done one recently with a, a, a one that's even impacting the Caribbean region. I think the Global Coral Reef Fund project um, was one of the, the faster ones that went through the system and it's actually private sector. So that's, that's a big significant achievement. On the readiness side, um, we can approve a proposal within three to four months. Um, the challenge with approving proposals is the, the turnaround time between us reviewing and it going back to NDs and delivery partners and the time they take to address the comments that we have, uh, we have identified, hopefully um, doing so to our satisfaction and coming back to the GCF. Um, we, we have a challenge with sometimes um, NDAs and delivery partners sitting on proposals in excess of six months, and that can cause a significant delay in getting um, proposals approved. But there, we do admit that on the GCF side, we do have some delays at times that lead to um, the frustrations of our colleagues. On the disbursement side, um, that again depends on the, the time it takes to go through the negotiating process to have the arrangements in place because um, the first disbursement comes once the negotiations are done. On full funding proposal side, we have what we call an accredited master agreement. We have in that case um, proposed um, projects that have been approved by the board that have gotten their AMA signed off within a few days to a week of the approval by the board, and hence the disbursement can start quickly thereafter. Um, for readiness, it's, you know, we have um, proposals where agreements are done within a month easily and uh, disbursements follow. And if it's a delivery partner that has what we call a framework agreement with the GCF, 
the disbursement for those tend to happen almost immediately. All right, thanks. Um, all right, in the interest of time, Orville, I'm going to ask, thank you so much for that. I, I want to squeeze in as many questions as we can. So colleagues, please remember to consist in your question. Orville, just, just a, a quick follow-up. Um, there, there are some people that are here about the GCA for the first time. So can you just, in, in, in a very short sentence, explain the difference between a readiness grant and a full grant? What is readiness? I mean, when I hear readiness, I, I think about putting on the clothes, but clearly it's something <laughs> Can you tell us what it means? Very briefly. Yeah, so, so readiness is, is essentially that preparatory program that's in place that it provides a, a source of financing. As I'd mentioned, there's $1 million that's available to each country per annum. And it, it really provides support to help countries to put the enabling um, environment in place. So this could be things like capacity building um, for the nationally designated authorities or um, accreditation support. So it could be providing funding to help um, nominated entities address gaps so that they can become accredited to the GCF. Um, it, it, it's also, you know, support to, for instance, putting in place um, adequate policies, um, updating relevant um, plans or, or, or strategies, anything that is needed to set the framework for the, the funding projects coming in to be successful. Can research be done to strengthen the climate rationale? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. So some amount of research can can be, but that, that is one that we would have to look closely at at what is being requested. Again, okay. it, it, it's yeah, it's it's specific to the project. But we'll get back to you on that one. Sure. And, and let me go to um Shamoy. Shamoy, um just on, on the note, you mentioned in your presentation um that you you are the focal agency for the PIOG, and I noticed when we asked the PIOG to sit on the panel, they immediately deferred to the CCD, so that's good. But what I want to ask is, how, when you get a pool of funding, how do people know that you have funding? Is it that it is published in the papers? Is it that you send out a call for proposals? Is it that people just have to hope and pray that they're in the right place at the right time? How do people know about the funding? How people know about the funding that we have? Yes. Um, well, we, I did mention that we have um, a research, not, not a research, sorry, um, a public awareness um, initiative within the CCD. But also um, persons do send us proposals, different um, agencies and entities send us proposals, and then we would send those off. Orville is here, Orville. Um, the GCF is one of our key funding partners. So people are aware of the role of the CCD. They um, either know us through different entities that we've worked with before or um, from hearing about us in the media or from the work that we've done over the years. Um, Ms. Gordon, who should have been here, I think yeah. most right, people sure. within the climate change space is aware of Ms. Gordon. All right, yes. sure, I understand. And you've answered the question. Um, mm -hmm. In a way, here, here's what I'm asking specifically though. Mm -hmm. um, as Orville and Gina will tell you later, most donors have what they call a call for proposals. It mm -hmm. opens at a certain time, it closes at a certain time. If you don't come mm -hmm. within that time frame, your proposal mm -hmm. cannot be considered. And it is done specifically to ensure it's a fair process. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing you saying, it's, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it suggests to me that you don't have a specific period. Is it that you then accept unsolicited proposals? And my question is, how would any person know that they can do it? Because my experience has been in some cases, people don't know that they can do it because they're looking for a call because almost everybody else sends out a call. You understand what I'm saying, Orville? So, so as somebody who used to work at the CCD, you probably can still chime in. What I'm asking is, <laughs> is there a call? Is there a season for proposals? It's a yes or no answer. It's a very simple one. We do have, um, if, if you check the... the um, country program that's on the, the GCF website, it, yes. there, it highlights clearly um, all the things that you would need for, it tells you when there is a call for proposal, when the GCF does, um, well, I'm using GCF because I'm staring at Orville. But, but what it about tells, when it is not GCF funding at all? Let us say you got a pool of funding from the IDB, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would somebody know that you have gotten the IDB money? 
Well, I don't think we just get the IDB money like that because we would have had to have the, the proposal and then we would have sent it off. So it's not that we're getting money within the CC. And Orville, you can, as, I, as you said, you have been there for many years before me. So you can chime in um, if I'm going, of course. But it's not that we just get money and then the CCD pays out money. We have to get the proposals and then we have to send it off to the relevant entities. So, um, for example, in each of our, of our um, uh, projects that we do, we have um, uh, um, proposals that are embedded in there that we would then submit to the different funding agencies. So it's not that we have a pool of funds within the CCD and people coming. There are no money like that within the CCD. We have to go out and solicit the funding. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but Orville, if you want to chime in, uh, you can go ahead. Um, well, I, I, I don't know that I'm in a position that I can speak on behalf <laughs> of the NDA anymore. Um, what I'll say from the GCF perspective is that typically the countries, um, as you look on the GCF website, for instance, we do have a country page for each country. Um, including the Caribbean countries. And you will see the proposals that have been approved for each. What I do know is that most countries tend to have um, what is referred to as um, stakeholder engagements. And from those processes, they will identify the funding um, priorities. And from there, select the, the ones that are priorities, prepare their proposals accordingly, and then submit to the GCF. So in that respect, the, the audience or the stakeholders at large are aware of the pipeline that is coming through. Jamaica does have a country program with the GCF. It's on the, on, on the page and I know Jamaica has um, had a number of engagements, including media engagements that have identified and, and publicized the country program. So from that perspective, national stakeholders should also be aware of what's in that pipeline and be able to track the, the types of proposals that have come to the Green Climate Fund in particular. Okay, uh, thank, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, uh, thanks, thanks to you both. Um, Shamo, I know you're fairly new, so thank you very much for the mm. thing. I, I want mm. to make a suggestion, um, and Gene, I'm coming to you right now, and, and this question is going to be posed to you as well. I want to make a suggestion um, moving forward. And I'm making this suggestion because I've worked for the ministry before. I worked as a donor myself for the Small Grants Program, the UFDG Small Grants Program, and the UNDP. And I've also worked now at UWI as somebody begging money. One of the problems that we have is this. Um, Orville mentioned the whole notion of stakeholder consultation, and there are stakeholder consultation. One of the problems, though, is that people don't know when the consultations are held. That's the first thing. Because we don't have a season to say the consultation is going to be held every first Monday in the third quarter of the, you understand? We don't have something like that. And I, I can say that without fear of successful contradiction, we don't. So that's the first problem. People, if people don't know about the consultation, they cannot attend. That's the first thing. The second thing is what we should do, or what I want to suggest, um, Shama, you can probably talk to your bosses and so on, is probably we come to the table with not necessarily a blank slate or a full slate, if you come with a blank slate, you get too many different funding ideas. And if you come with a full slate, then people believe that you don't want to consult them. You understand what I'm saying, Gina? Now, if you come to me and say, we have four um, areas of funding, but we are open to four more, then people come with an idea that they can propose, and then people can go and develop their proposals. But if it is that you come with a, a list or a menu that is closed, then people really don't have any option. Whilst I understand the CCD does a different kind of resource mobilization than, say, the GCF, for example, I still believe that it is a fantastic institution. It is very, very critical and very important. And, and I think, Shama, you made it clear to us that there, are, there is room to access funding. And let me just give you this quick one before I go to, go to Gina. The Special Climate Change Adaptation Fund was an initiative that came through the CCD. The CCD got the money through the Special Climate Change Adaptation Fund from the national tranche of the PCCR, for example, because everything that, that's about climate change comes through the Climate Change Division. Then they then made that available through the Environmental Foundation of Jamaica. And organizations then applied it to the EFJ for funding. UWE is one of the beneficiaries of that. And I'm proud to say the project that was funded produced the only peer-reviewed article 
that and has spawned as software now that's been used globally. So, so you, you, sometimes you have to sound your trumpet, right? You have to sound the CCD trumpet loud and clear so everybody knows. So, I'll give you some more money, right? Shama, you have to make him know so I'm not doing good work. All right, so, so, so that's not, that's not, that's as that's 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 that. Um, Gina, I want to come to you. You mentioned something about some of the other sources of funding. Can you just elaborate a little bit on your small grants program? Um, you said the limit is 25. Is it that there's no circumstance under which you will give more than 25? Yes? No? That's correct. However, we have had a number of NGOs who have completed a project and then applied for another project, which could be seen as phase two of the first project, and we funded that. You know, so after you successfully complete one project, you're free to, an NGO is free to apply for a second or third or fourth. We have a few NGOs in Haiti, actually, who have been funded for multiple projects, some of which have been on the same, um, you know, the same project, like phase one and two, and uh, others have been different. And to just, I know you didn't ask this, but just to make it clear that CRIF does accept applications for its small grants program throughout the year. And so it's critical, as you said, that people know that that's available because we do not issue a specific call, but we periodically, um, you know, issue, you know, press releases and so on, highlighting the program in order to increase awareness about the program. Oh, that's, that's fantastic news. I'm sure some people in the room are taking note and some of our colleagues online too. On that note, can I ask a follow-up, Gino? Mm -hmm. um, with respect to the small grants, is there a, is there a time, um, is there a time restrictions to say, how soon after you get the first grant and you've successfully completed it, can you apply for a second? Or once you have done it successfully, you can apply? You can apply at any time, yes. Okay. All right. So somebody's asking, Gina, this is at you. Um, if you could give some more information on where to apply. Is it is it that the application form is online? Can you give it's us It's online on the CRIF website. And the the actual website is in the presentation, which I'll share with you, but it's on www.crif.org and you just look under the technical assistance program and you'll see all the information about this small grants program, the scholarships, the internships, all of that will be under the technical assistance program tab on the CRIF website. Okay, great. Oh, well, coming back to you. Um, I noticed you're, you're a very big man now, you're, you're in charge of the Caribbean and Brazil. Um, tell us a little bit, what are you seeing in, 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 the, in the two regions? Are you seeing that, can you give us a sense of the, 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 the pre-call portfolio of the projects? Do you find more um, Amazon type, forestry type projects in Brazil vis-a-vis -vis, uh, more hard structure type projects in the Caribbean. Is there any complementary or similarity between the projects between Brazil and the Caribbean? Um, <clears throat> okay, thanks. Um, well, I, I can see that I'm, I'm no longer covering Brazil as we've made a, a, a structural change internally. So I'm, I'm fully focused on the um, the English and French speaking Caribbean countries on the CARICOM. Um, with respect to the breakdown, um, no, Brazil is no different from what you'd find in the Caribbean region. It still goes to what are the national priorities. So for Brazil, um, their priorities are spread over things like um, renewable energy or energy diversification. Um, they're, they're looking at, for instance, flood flood management and how do they address that coastal um, ecosystem protection, including, um, you know, the degra degraded coastal ecosystems due to storm surge activities. So it, it's not just focused on doing work within the Amazon basin. In the Caribbean, it's also similar. It's going to be a wide ranging. Um, we do have um, countries coming through e-mobility is now coming up as a top priority for several Caribbean countries. We have um, coastal and marine ecosystems that continue to be a priority for Caribbean countries, pretty much because it underpins many of our national economies. So we do have a lot of projects focused in that area. As I just mentioned, for instance, the Global Coral Reef um, Fund project, which is benefiting um, Jamaica, Bahamas, and, and Belize as a global project. 
we do have outside of that um, quite a bit happening in, in the space of renewable energy. So we have geothermal projects um, likely coming through. We have housing resilience as a, as, a, as a support for the impact damage coming from storms and hurricanes. We have um, um, other work being done, for instance, as I mentioned in the agriculture and, and fishery space, um, to a great extent, quite a bit is being done, for instance, by FAO in adaptation planning in agriculture and fisheries. We, we have a few countries that are now preparing adaptation planning proposals that will cover ecosystems and tourism. So it's, it's quite a varied mix and it, it really goes down to what are the priorities that have been identified in countries and how they want to reflect those with respect to climate change financing. All right, just a quick follow-up, Orville. Um, one of the things that, that people are, um, often ask is, okay, we, we have all of these projects that we can apply for. Um, there is a very involved process of proposal development, review, and so on. Um, in the time period of the review, and the delay can be on, and I'm very, I was very excited to hear you say 68 months because the first time the GCF was presented to us and Steve Maximis and I, I'm sure smiling, when we asked the officer if everything goes perfectly from application to disbursement, what time frame are we looking for? And she gave a wry smile and then she said, minimum of two years. Now you know how things go in the Caribbean. You give a proposal, after one year, those quotations don't match again at all. So your budget is out of what? So my question to you um, is, when there is a delay um, on the side of the GCF, what happens for the poor proponent? What do they do? That's the first part. The second thing is a number of the challenges that we have with some of the bigger funding, and you can probably tell us, I think, uh, I think there's a, some, some misperception as well in terms of looking at how much money people need to understand an investment fund. So you can't just come and get grant, grant, grant money. You know, you have to come with something, right? And I, I understand you, you get between 50 to $250 million per grant and all of those things. Um, so you are the elephant in the room, for sure. Though your, though your size on, on the screen does suggest otherwise. But what I want to ask is, Orville, um, the main challenge that we have right now is when somebody has an application and they send it to the GCF and they do everything that they can, do you offer um, help along the way so that they don't become frustrated in the middle of the process? Or is it that you send your proposal and hope and pray that something happens? Can you just give us a quick guide of how it works? And, and let me just say immediately after this, I'm going to Leon Rupa, who was kindly offered to, to give us some perspective um, as well. Go ahead. All right, uh, th thank you, Dale. Um, <laughs> remember, as I said, you know, the, the, the best case scenario is that um, a full funding proposal that has all the, all that's required in the package, you know, it can get through within that time period. Um, but yes, there are delays. And on the GCF side, when there are delays, um, it, it could potentially mean, for instance, um, a repositioning in terms of GCF on, on, on what we're looking for. Um, it, could, it could mean that there have been um, additional requirements that are coming in, for instance, through the independent um, evaluation um, unit that looks at, not, not the evaluation unit, the independent, um, project um, evaluation unit. So that's a technical team that looks at proposals, vet them before they go to the board. They could be, for instance, something that goes there and um, they come back with, um, you know, a pushback and therefore the GCF now has to engage with proponents on trying to um, address these concerns. It could be something that came in, for instance, a concept note that came in that the GCF found to have significant um, challenges takes us a time internally to try and uh, organize our thoughts around it to figure out what would be the best way forward to support that proponent. And it may therefore require us to say, well, um, unfortunately, this proposal is not yet at the stage that we want. However, there are tools or, or resources available to help it to move forward. So we have the project preparation facility that I mentioned before, as well as the readiness and, and preparatory support program. The project preparation facility um, can provide up to $1.5 million in support to help develop things like feasibility studies um, that may be required to then lay the, the, the groundwork or provide the information that's required to get the funding proposal to the level that it can go to the board. 
um, the, that facility can also provide support to address the climate rationale. So it goes back to, for instance, you were talking about research before. This is not, the, this is not going to be full-fledged research for several years, but rather provide some amount of financial support as well as technical support to bring the, the technical details where the climate is concerned for the project up to scratch so that it meets our, our requirements and can then move forward as a funding proposal to go to the board. So there are a number of mechanisms for the GCF. There's also the readiness and preparedness support program wherein a project idea may come to the GCF. We recognize that there are significant challenges to it and we encourage um, discussion with um, the readiness and, so, and, and preparedness support program to look at providing support to that project idea as well as other project ideas to strengthen concept notes that may have been drafted so that they're good enough to then go through the process for review um, and hopefully um, preparation of funding, a full funding proposal to the board. So there are, there are a number of ways in which we can do it, but it will require um, engagement with the GCF and dialogue to understand and move things forward. All right, thanks, thanks for that. Leon, Leon, can somebody unmute Leon for me, please? Leon Rupo, um, she works in the climate change division. Um, I think she's the adaptation focal point, if I'm not mistaken. Um, fantastic individual. Leon, just give us 30 seconds. I'm going to unmute you. Um, it's L-E-A-N-N. Hello, good morning, everyone. Are you hearing me? We are. Okay, great, thanks. And hello again, everyone. I had put in the chat just to add some information to the discussion. The Climate Change Division is not the interface, the direct interface with the donor community. What we are, however, is the focal point for access to some of the climate finance mechanisms. So for example, as Shimoy had said in her presentation, we are the focal point for the Green Climate Fund, the national designated authority. So if there is interest by a government entity, private sector, et cetera, in accessing funds from the GCF, they would require the support and a letter from the Climate Change Division. But outside of that, and perhaps also being the national, the designated authority for the Adaptation Fund, it is the Planning Institute of Jamaica that has that direct interface with the donor community, whether it's a, a country or group of countries such as the European Union or the multilateral development banks such as the IDB or the World Bank, if there are persons or entities rather interested in having resources from these these donors, then the Planning Institute of Jamaica is where that um, first point of contact would be. The Climate Change Division, however, does play a role in that if there is a project that relates to climate change, we give our advice and we do facilitate in a review that might help in building the climate rationale as required. So I just wanted to put that out there because there may be an impression that we have pools of resources from different donors that you can then place a call for proposals to access those resources, which is not the case. But we try to facilitate access um, where possible. I hope that was useful. Thanks. Yeah, that was extremely useful. Thank you, Leon. And, and my apologies if I, if I muddled the waters a bit. All right, so I want to ask another question. I see some more questions coming in. Gina, this question is for you. So thanks having heard just from GCF and from uh, CCG just now. Let me ask Gina. Gina, the question that, that, that I'm seeing here, can you just, just speak a little bit more about how CRIF um, innovated to come up with this COVID-19 relief support for tuition? Um, I mean, I find that to be fantastic, but I will say um, a number of us didn't hear about it. I will say that to be frank. But I have a little challenge in that, and, and you can tell me, it, it, it might be an opportunity as Prof. Taylor says, because 
there are students below the tertiary level that are struggling as well. In fact, what I think what the data actually shows is that we have lost more students at the high school level who have dropped out of the system than out of the tertiary level. Um, in Jamaica, for example, we've lost nearly 300,000 students from the formal education system. Some of them were lost because their parents lost jobs, they just couldn't buy tablets and so on. Is there any consideration at all to expanding the range of support that you provide through your tuition assistance program? Um, it may be through bursaries, it may be through helping the schools to waive the school fee or anything like that. Is there any consideration for that? Okay, thanks, Dale, for that. Um, so the first part, just about the assistance to the University of the West Indies, the TA program of CRIF is funded by its annual profits. In other words, we're, we operate as a not-for-profit organization. So we do make profits, but we use those profits to benefit the members, either through premium discounts or and also through the technical assistance program so each year we evaluate basically what resources we have and then can then determine how much is available for support so in light of covid and the high number of students at the university of the west indies who were at risk of having to drop out because they couldn't afford to pay the fees because the university of the west indies is a long-standing partner of CRIF. Um, we engaged in discussion with them and through their UE giving program, we were able to provide, in addition to our usual scholarships at the university, available to provide tuition assistance for, I think it was up to maybe in the range of 100 students um, who were not able to um, pay their fees that, that, that year, this year. In regards to, so that was, pretty much a one-off thing. While the scholarship program is ongoing, that particular assistance was kind of a one-off thing at the moment anyway. In regards okay. to yeah. below, okay. Can I interject, um, Gina, sorry about that. All right, you, you're giving some excellent information that people are writing previously, so take, take, take time with me. Um, the scholarship program, can you explain how that works? Is it that you have to be enrolled or you can be enrolled and get support after or both. How does that work? Okay, and what kind of GPA average do you need to maintain to get the scholarship? Okay, for the undergraduate scholarships, which are available only at the University of the West Indies, you have to have completed year one. And so the scholarship is for years two and three. And these are in select programs at the university, which are somewhat related or somehow related to disaster risk management, such as geography or natural resource management or um, civil and environmental engineering. There's a number of them and they're specified on the website. So it's only for select programs. For the postgraduate programs, which are available at the UE, other Caribbean universities and in the US, UK and Canada, you have to be admitted into a, to start a program and then apply for the scholarship. And then that will cover the cost of pursuing the, the program. And again, in select areas related to disaster risk management. Okay. Right. So, thanks, Gina. Can I go back now to the, 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 the thing we were asking about? The... About the high schools. No, the tuition. No. You said it was a one-off, um, but COVID is still happening. So right, maybe... so, so as I said, each year the, the board will evaluate um, and determine where we do have resources that are available, which programs can be implemented. For example, even though we're technically the program provides one postgraduate scholarship for study overseas, we have from time to time provided more than one because we have ha we had additional resources available for one reason or another. For example, in 2020, the internship program was canceled due to COVID. And so we had extra resources that we were then able to use to, to provide additional scholarships. So we're very flexible so that whenever we have resources, we can um, make best use of them. And our disaster risk reduction in schools project, which of course is at the, it's focusing on content at the moment, but we take note of your point that there may be 
um, need for some kind of financial assistance below the tertiary level. Again, where purpose is a responsive organization trying to meet the needs of it, of all its members. Sure. I mean, but just just to just to put another plug on that, you don't have to comment on this, but just to put a plug that whilst I understand the, the focus that it has to be disaster related and so on, there are some things that are direct effects of a disaster or a hazard and other things that are indirect. So for example, let's use a, a, a practical example. A hurricane passes through and blows down a school, physically destroys the school. That's a direct damage. Um, an indirect damage now um, could be something like, well, the school is destroyed and the teachers are not able to teach. All the books were destroyed and everything like that. They decided they want to teach now, but they have to teach online. But they have no tablets and so on and so forth. The school has no money because it wasn't able to collect school fees and so on. And so it, a, a need is now created by virtue of something that happened prior. Do you know what I'm saying? So it is quasi-related, so to speak. Um, it's not directly linked to. So you couldn't say, this is damage to your modem, but something was occasioned because of that. Um, and, and so I know that is probably splitting hairs, but it, it is a problem anyway. All right, I want to go back to Shamoy. Shamoy, um, one of the things that Leon mentioned, Leon mentioned in her, in her intervention was the whole notion about being an interface, an important interface between the donors and so on. I wanted to ask you um, in that regard, how, how often do you have like relations between yourself and the KIOG? and other agencies? I mean, is it an annual review? Do you do quarterly review? Um, in that context, does anything from the medium term framework comes up in the discussions for climate change as well? I mean, Leon can also chime in as well. Um, how, how, how does this work? Is it a, a, a bilateral, a biannual review or what? How does this thing work? Okay, so we have a climate change advisory board, which the PIOJ is a part of. Um, we meet um, quarterly, every, yeah, we meet quarterly. Now at the Climate Change Advisory Board, we would discuss um, adaptation and mitigation um, initiatives that are undertaken within the Climate Change Division. And that's one of the main areas where we would flush out all these things. Okay, thank you for that. Leon, you want to add anything? I don't know if I'm, is, is she on the internship? Just to add that I've, in the chat, I've added the Jamaica, the link to the Jamaica country program where I can get more information. Oh, th thanks so much. Um, Leon, do you want to add anything to, to what um, Shamoy has said? Yes, you, you can now unmute, Leon. Okay, thanks. I just want to add that the PIOJ and the Climate Change Division has a pretty good working relationship. So there is always that, I would say, open door policy where we have that exchange of information. And from time to time, the PIOJ also convenes a donor meeting specific to climate change. And certainly the Climate Change Division would partner with the PIOG on that. Um, so I won't say that it's like uh, every year thing, but you know we certainly do try to have it and to have that continued dialogue and engagement so that we are aware of the landscape and what is happening. Right, so thank you very much. Orville, you mentioned that there were some specific um, channel of funding for agriculture. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Um, how, how does that work? Uh, no, not, not specific funding for agriculture. I, I, I was um, identifying that agriculture and food security is considered one of the critical thematic areas that the GCF looks to support. So there's no specific um, window of, of support for it. Um, it. It's all part of the, 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 the broader support package that the GCF offers. But we recognize that food security and agriculture is a significant concern with respect to climate change globally. And therefore, we have given um, guidance to that in our sectoral guide 
This was um, discussed with stakeholders across the globe, including in the region last year. And we now have that, that guide that's available that can help to direct um, proponents of projects in, in the area of agriculture and food security. So we look forward to that sector guide informing the work coming out, the proposals coming out of the region. All right, th thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, I want to ask everybody, all the panelists, a, a question. Um, and I know that Nar Naranda is on the, the line as well. So uh, you, you can decide among yourself who will go first. Two questions. The first one is the easy one. If funding were not a limitation, meaning if you had an unlimited pool of funding, Gino, and you had all but gave you 30 billion US dollars and tell you just pin it and come back again. And and Shamo, you were told that you know the Belinda Gates Foundation gave you every dime in their account. And all will, you know, um, you have more money than, than John Wright about. So money is not the limit. And, and you could choose any thematic era that you want. You could choose any program that you want to fund on the planet. What would, what would you be your top three priorities and why? So let me run that again. If funding is not a limitation, and you could fund any thematic era of your choice, what would you direct funding to and why? That's the first question. The second question is this. One of the challenges that we have right now is that a lot of projects, and I, I can see this having worked as a donor myself, one of my pet peeves has always been whenever we go to donors and you can call your names in alphabetical order, they will tell you, we don't fund the research. Everybody says the same thing. Yet, when you make an application or a grant, they say, what is the scientific basis for your research? What underpins your research? What, who says this is really real? And the case in point was a 1.5 report. Prof. Taylor had to gather a team of global scientists to prove that 1.5 was not an arbitrary figure, but a real figure. And many of those reports were written without funding. We just had to do the work. Why is this a problem? It's because when funds are being doled out across the globe, our colleagues that live in the Amazon region, that live in certain parts and certain oceans, they have been smart enough to fund the research. So they come with their bag of research and research papers and journal articles, and they get the money every time because we have no research and because no donor wants to fund our research, we are at the back of the line all the time. And so we end up getting breadcrumbs when everybody is up a bakery. So my question to you then, sir, mom and moms, how are we going to bridge that divide? How and, and when are we going to start mainstreaming at least some dedicated percentage of our funding for applied research in support of project and program development. I can see all the itching his ears, so he's going to go first. <laughs> um, all right, thanks for that. Um, I'll go to the first question. Um, I mean, if the GCF was able to get unlimited funding from where our, our donors, which are the developed countries, um, then we would be very happy because the, in terms of the ask from developing countries, it, it is a significant. And if you look at the amount of monies that have been identified by the various research to, uh, in terms of what is required for adaptation and mitigation to keep in line with the global goal of, of um, 1.5 degrees, then you know we're looking at trillions and trillions of dollars and uh, we do have the countries with the project pipelines that will trigger that sort of financing so if we had the money we would be happy to to be um, putting it out into the various um, project proposals for implementation in countries um, to give you a good example i think belize if i recall correctly have an adaptation um, component of nearly two billion dollars and if you look at their pipeline, if we were to fund just that component from Belize, we would literally have no, no, no commitment or authority to fund other projects. So we, we do require that significant funding from develop, develop, developed countries to be able to help developing countries. So that would be where our priority would be to get the monies to, to lead these pipeline um, development projects for the betterment of the countries in the region. Um, on the second part about um, research, it is a very difficult um, 
um, position because it, it comes up time and time again, as you mentioned. What we have been trying to encourage our, our countries uh, and stakeholders to look at is how can they um, bring forward proposals, identify the gaps, but try to um, address the immediate concerns. And internally in GCF, this is something that we are, we are, we are aggressively um, looking at is to ensure that our projects can utilize the existing science that is there that underpins the project proposals that come to us, ensure that it has the most um, robust information that's possible, and then look at how that project um, proposal will also go towards addressing any outstanding gaps with the hope that the independent technical panel will see it the same way to allow for it to be uh, moved to the board for approval. So again, you know, that's one of the challenges is that the secretariat on its own may have a, a certain viewpoint, but the technical um, panel that reviews it that on behalf of the board may have a different um, perspective and we are not one and the same. And I think that is what um, a lot of our stakeholders um, misconstrue in, in the continued um, um, discussion is that the, they see the technical panel as part of the, the GCF secretariat, um, but it's actually the independent technical body for the board in reviewing of the proposals. So we do, in, in terms of we clearing the proposal internally, they also have to clear the, the technical body before it can get to the board for approval. And that is where the challenge comes in. So we are hoping that as we go forward, we'll have a much better rapport with that panel and be able to then have a, a much better position on which to agree on the scientific basis for the projects that come to us. I hope that's helpful. Very, very, very well said. I'm glad you made that distinction um, because once you wear a GCF logo, we think you're all the same. So, so thanks for that. Gino, can you, can you take us through your priorities and what you're going to do for research? Sure. Um... I'm not sure about priority thematic areas, but if we had unlimited resources, two of the areas that we'd like to support more are, one is on the support for on the ground initiatives. Um, very often, you know, communities, they have these vulnerability assessments conducted. They come up with these plans, mitigation plans, resilience plans, but then when it comes time to implement those plans, there's a lack of resources to do that. And so we, we currently um, already try and not try, we do support some on the ground initiatives to do that, but there is great need for additional support in that regard. Another area is the internship program. As we know, um, our universities are, you know, churning out qualified young people, but very often they have difficulty finding their way in the work world. Um, you know, finding um, employment. And so this is another area that we would like to expand and support to be able to support additional young persons in the region. In regards to research, the small grants program actually does support some level of research as long as it's tied to um, benefiting communities in the country or, or the region. And in addition to NGOs and CBOs, we do provide funding to, or academic institutions such as the U, we can apply for small grants. And we have done that in, in the case of, um, for two grants uh, where they have conducted research with the idea that the findings of the research are immediately applicable to communities in the region. So we agree that that's important but at the moment, um, you know, that's just you know, a small level of research. We're not talking about millions of dollars available to support research. And the key thing for CRIP is that it would have to be um, linked to how those results could be used. But we definitely recognize the importance of supporting research and our partnerships with regional organizations through those partnerships, we're also able to, su to support a level of research conducted by those organizations, such as 5Cs and CIMH. All right, thank you, well said. Um, my good friend, Shamoy, are you with us? I'm not seeing you well, your camera's gone blurred, but 
not sure where Shamoy is. Um, Leon, can I ask you in the meantime to give us a word in, in, since you're still with the CCD? What, what would your priorities be and why and what, what, what would you advise regarding research? Hello. Okay, you're hearing me. Uh, I think I would say our priority would be guided by our stakeholders. We recently or relatively recently would have worked with our stakeholders to develop a climate change research and technology uh, agenda. I hope I'm saying that correctly. And it would have identified some priorities for research based on the needs in various sectors and also the research that would have been done to support the work as well. So I think, I don't know if you might consider that a cop-out, <laughs> but you know, I don't know that we are in a position to prioritize one over the other, but certainly we would want to listen to what the needs are based on the consultations that would have been done. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thank you very, thank you very, very much. I'm going to end. Got an apology from Shamo. I think her computer just died. Um, I'm going to ask my good friend and partner in crime, Mr. Steve Maxime, to give some concluding remarks, um, as he's want to do, and then we will we will make a final um, expression of gratitude to our panelists, and then we will close this first section. Um, Mr. Maxime, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Dr. Rankin. Dr. Gray, Anginetti. I not only want to thank you on behalf of the organizing committee, but also on my own behalf, because I have had my share of dabblings, to put it mildly, with both GCF and CRIF and with the CCB by, by extension, because I, I consider Yuname a, a very, very close friend. Coming, starting with the GCF, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Gray, because I'm in a fairly unique position. I have written a few successful readiness grants. I've been involved in concept note preparation, and I understand the intricacies um, and, and, and the need for a readiness, a readiness window. Because I mean, very early in the piece, I think somewhere around 2015, end of 2015, I was asked by the five Cs to to, to, to do a proposal. And I mean, thinking that it would be a standard proposal, like, you know, run a mail proposal, I sent something to Dr. Trotz. And I mean, and both, both he and Donnell were, were shocked, you know, that this is clearly not what is required. You know, it, it requires very specific guidelines. And I want to thank the GCF and through you for providing us with the, with the templates, with the, with the proposal preparation mechanisms and the, and the documentation the document trail that, that is required for successful completion of a, a readiness grant. Um, I am really, really thrilled with the, the parametric, parametric uh, approach by the, 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 by the CRIF, CRIF SPC. Uh, as somebody who was involved in development banking for, for more than a decade, I know how difficult it is, how difficult it was for us as agricultural bankers to go after a flood to do assessment, post-event assessments. And with, with parametric uh, insurance models, I mean, once the event has been verified from a source, whether it be NOAA or, or, or local Met Office or so, you know, I, I think both the two of you have really, really shone a light on how far we have come, and, and literally how far we have come in this part of the world in terms of the type of support we get internationally and the type of um, insurance coverage that we are now able to access, even as, as individual, individual, um, individual groups, not necessarily as countries. And I want to thank you, as I said, on behalf of the organizing committee and for my colleagues online would have been edified by you know, your experience and in terms of your explaining what to, to many people, it seems like you know, a, a blockade, you know, a, a rampart that has to be stormed, you know, and something that is extremely difficult. So again, thank you. And I want to thank uh, Dale for giving me the opportunity for, to say a few words, which is not something he is uh, always willing to do. 
So <laughs> thank you for that, Jill. And, and thanks, thanks to, the, to the three of you, uh, and uh, Ms. McLean in her absence. Thank you. Thank you. If you're doing well up to that last point, and I was really hoping you would just end with a nice note. But anyways, no problem. Colleagues, please, live audience, would you join me by giving a hand to the persons for the excellent presentation? Thank you so very much. Um, Gina, I had sent you a note. I don't know if you saw it, a WhatsApp message. We will need to talk off the air, um, and Orville as well. Um, thank you so very much, colleagues. Orville, I know it's way past your bedtime. I will bleach you out enough. But thank you so much for joining us all the way from Seoul, South Korea, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if the weather over there is cold or hot, but if it's cold, you can send some, some, some cool air for us over here. <laughs> We're burning up. Um, but all the best, man. Read the family for me and, and take care. Gina, thanks again for coming online. We really appreciate it. Please say thanks to the boss, um, Liz. Well, the we boss is Isaac, but... <laughs> well, okay, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, we deeply appreciate it. Um, okay. Thanks. And Have a good rest of the day, everyone. No, no problem. Thank you. All right. So we having come to the end of our panel discussion, and we didn't do too badly where time is concerned, um, colleagues who are online, um, our initial uh, schedule had us finishing at 9.15, and we've managed to finish just about 9.30. And considering we had Steve to contend with, that's very good. Um, I think we just had a new live participant. Is that Simone? Is that Simone? Okay, Simone Lloyd. Great to have you, Simone. All right, so we're going to take a break now. I think the break should be here. Um, or could I ask somebody just to check on the break for me? Um, anybody quickly just run upstairs and check on the break for me. Um, if it is it's here, good. So we'll take a very quick break, very, very quick break. In just about 10 minutes. You're going to just grab your stuff and get back here immediately. Um, when we come back, Dr. Jayaka Campbell will be taking us through um, some tools, very, very intriguing tools. Please get your pens, your pencils out, your uh, paparazzi cameras, everything. We're going to go delve deeply now into some really cool tools that are available. And we'll have tools from now all the way down to lunch. Um, after that, we're pretty much closing after that. We had earmarked two hours for some of the tools for one of the tools, but we are going to cut short that time because a number of persons have been requesting more um, time to look at the model that I'm going to be sh sharing with you, the DSAT software. I'll try and go through all the tabs as, or as much as I can so you can understand when you don't know the model, how to use it. I will say that it has a steep learning curve, considerably steeper than um, AcroCrop because it is, it is a composite of several different crop models. Um, and it looks more than just water. It looks at genetics. It looks at um, the whole notion of fertilization. You can have several different fertilization. It has over 500 different soil profiles, most in, in the world, and a whole host of different varieties of different crops. But we'll take our time. We'll go through. So Jay, Jay has graciously given us back quite a bit of the time that was originally scheduled for his tools. So we can go through that, and then we'll after we have given you the full, um, not just executive summary, but the fully piece of how DSAP works, then we're going to show you a much simpler version that we have online that we have put the model in the background on a supercomputer here at UWE. And with a few clicks of your mouse, you can get exactly what we do. Well, at least part of it. The notion though, and I want everybody, because I do know we have a lot of different countries online and different islands. And you're going to be saying, here it goes again. Jamaica has something that we don't have. No, you don't have to worry, right, Jay? It is scalable. If you can give us your shape file for your soil, if you can give us your weather information, just as we've done for Jamaica, we will be able to do it for you too. So Simone, you came at the perfect time. All right, so we'll demonstrate all of that. You can interrogate the information. You can ask us all your questions and we'll answer them. So we'll go for a 10 minute break. By my watch, it's 9.30. We'll get back here at 9.40 and then we'll continue. Thank you very much.
climate change. What is climate change? According to scientists, the Earth's climate has been changing for a while, and the role of humans in the rate of the change has been a cause for concern. Climate change affects every aspect of our lives. A series of disastrous climate-related events have been experienced around the world. This makes climate change an urgent issue for all of us, but especially for young people like you who may have to face its most severe effects in the future. Climate change is caused by various natural and man-made factors. Natural factors include volcanic eruptions. Man-made factors, also called anthropogenic factors, include activities resulting from population and economic growth, such as transportation, electricity, or agricultural production. Most times when we refer to climate change today, we are referring to the changes we have seen due to human factors. These activities release greenhouse gases into the air. These greenhouse gases released from human activities increase the natural greenhouse effect which works to warm the earth and sustain life. The first climatic change that is therefore often observed is a long-term increase in average temperatures. Overall, the world has steadily warmed due to human factors since the pre-industrial period. The warming of the world has led to other changes in climate, including in rainfall patterns, storm events, and sea levels. The Science of Climate Change are weather and climate the same? What is weather? When we receive daily news reports from the radio or television, there is a segment for the weather, and we will find out if it may be sunny, cloudy, warm or rainy in our parish and for other parishes. The term weather refers to the day-to-day -day condition of the atmosphere over a specific place. Atmospheric conditions are affected by a combination of factors, such as air pressure, temperature, and humidity. The scientist who studies these atmospheric factors and makes predictions about the weather is called a meteorologist. These predictions or forecasts are usually educated guesses, based on the factors that the scientists study with the help of technological what instruments. What is climate? Climate refers to the average atmospheric condition for a place or region over a long period of time, usually 20 to 30 years. This is generally reliable because it is based on data gathered and averaged over many years. Climate data includes sunshine, rainfall, air temperature, humidity, and wind. Climates around the world vary because of differences in the amount of solar radiation received in these areas. Places located closer to the equator receive more heat from the sun because the sun is directly overhead. These places are warmer than the areas closer to the North and South Poles where it is extremely cold. Therefore, the Earth is divided into climatic zones based on the amount of sunshine or heat and precipitation received in each area. Countries with similar weather patterns are in the same climatic zone. How does climate affect human activity? The variety of climates that exist influences the variety of life on planet Earth. Climatic conditions help in the formation of various ecosystems on which humans and other organisms depend. Climate influences the development of cultures. This is because our lives are influenced by our geographical climates. People everywhere have adapted in various ways to the climates in which they live. Climate influences our clothing, types of housing, agricultural practices and vacation time. For example, 
Persons in countries with cold weathers may go to countries with tropical climates during winter. Climate change is taking place globally and regionally within the Caribbean. In the region, some of the evidence for climate change includes warmer temperatures, greater variability in rainfall patterns, rising sea levels, and increases in frequency of extreme weather events, such as floods and droughts. Climate change is a very present and a real threat and can cause a range of environmental, economic, and social impacts for the Caribbean region. Examples of these impacts include coastal erosion, loss of coral reefs, mangroves, and other ecosystems, saltwater intrusion into coastal agricultural lands and aquifers, escalation of frequency and intensity of hurricanes or tropical storms, increase in frequency and severity of coastal inundation and flooding, disruptions in precipitation causing droughts and availability of potable water supplies, some islands being rendered inhospitable and expensive relocation and rebuilding exercises in others. Soaring prices, mass shortages. What's next? Hi, I'm Chris Hurt here, and if you're like most people, you may have noticed some strange things popping up in the news lately, because once again, the word crisis is being thrown around. And yet, this is unlike anything we have seen before. Major automakers, from GM to Toyota, are shutting down their factories. Analysts are warning that Christmas, as we know it, may not happen this year. And massive food distributor Cisco says it's going to have trouble stocking grocery store shelves. And this is not because of a recession. It's not because of a virus, not because of a new lockdown or war, but in fact, the very opposite, a new threat which could soon cause empty shelves as far as the eye can see. What exactly is going on? If you're an investor, if you own a home or a business, if you're retired or you plan to retire anytime soon, it's important that you pay close attention because according to our the choices that you make with your money right now will decide which side of this story you end up on and as you'll see the last time this happened investors lost as much as 90 percent of their money while the few who knew what was happening and what to do they had the chance to make 30 times their money in a single year what exactly is going on and how can you protect yourself and profit well, fortunately, we have just the man to help us figure it all out. Jeff Brown, thank you so much for being with us here today. Chris, thanks so much. It is great.
At one point, the city put out a statement saying people were trapped in flooded cars. Can we make it through? The Trans-Canada Highway is closed as floodwaters rise. 75,000 homes under orders to evacuate. Damage is estimated in the billions of dollars. It could be days before power is restored. Devastating floods are a continual threat in Canada. As weather patterns change, communities are struggling to protect property and lives. In British Columbia's lower mainland, there have been two large-scale Fraser River floods in the past 125 years. The region has also seen very high water more recently, reminding us that here too, flooding is a fact of life. Every spring, mountain snowmelt and rain make the Fraser River run high and fast. Sediment carried by the river during these spring freshets is what formed the Fraser River Delta, making it some of the richest land in Canada, both for wildlife and agriculture. Coastal flooding is also a natural event, as winter storms and king tides carry salt water inland. But experts say the lower mainland needs to prepare for larger and more damaging floods in the future. So at present, we have risk on the river from flooding, and this is going to get worse in future for two main reasons. So one is... All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. Um, for the next 20 minutes, um, sorry, next 20 times two minutes, 40 minutes, I will be your presenter. I am hoping that at the end of this session, um, you know, you will, it is going to be an entirely interactive session. I was coming here with a PowerPoint presentation and everything, and I decided, no, we are going to do a hands-on session. I've already posted a link in the chat, um, so you should be able to see that. And we're going to be using that link extensively for the next um, 40 minutes. Um, we may end a little early, depending on how our interface goes. But at the end of this, we'll actually actually look at some about 75% of the tools that have been developed within the Department of Physics and um, by extension with Steve Maxime. So here we go. So I'm about to share my screen. Um, can you confirm that you're seeing that link in the chat? Can you confirm that you're able to access it? Um, any one person, yes, no, maybe so. All right, thank you, Stacy. All right, so here we go. All right, so I won't be able to see the chat because I'll be sharing my screen. So I'm from time to time, I'll be looking up and persons will be waving at me. Um, <clears throat> Give me 30 seconds. And I've reposted the link in the chat again. So if you're just coming back and logging on, you should see that link. Can you confirm that you're seeing my screen, please? You should be seeing about five images on the screen. All right, good. So this will be where all tools are accessed from. So any other climate tools that are developed within the physics department or by extension, you know, other points on campus, this will be the space for it. If you notice the link you typed in was C-A-T-E-R. It stands for Caribbean Tools Engendering Resilience. So um, the first one we're going to look at is SMASH. We're going to skip AgriAccept because AgriAccept is going to be dealt with at the tail end of Dale's walkthrough with the model. And I'll come back and give you AgriAccept 
I'll go through real TMS. And then as promised from yesterday, I will actually go back through CSAC. And so we, we should be on the same page. All right. So give me one second. All right. So here we go. When you click visit for Smash, you will be taken to this wonderful page. Now what Smash stands for is a simple model for that affection of storms and, and hurricanes. So we have a, a simple thing about what, what happens, right? So within the Caribbean context, there are some storms of note. And you know, ignoring, let's say we ignore the 2017 hurricane season and you go back. And I'm gonna ask somebody outside of the 2017 hurricane season, if you were asked to name one memorable storm, uh, and please, and nobody from Jamaica, um, name a storm. One memorable storm, which means in the chat. In the chat. You, can, you, can, you can see those. <laughs> so I'm gonna rely on those in the room to scream at me to tell me what you're seeing. So in the chat, just name any memorable hurricane. I hear Ivan. I hear Sandy. And I hear Gilbert, which I, I'm, I'm assuming those are all Jamaicans. Mario. <laughs> Mario. And I hear Dorian. No. And Gustav. So there are for different reasons, different persons, and we will actually have a storm of note, be that it came with a lot of rain, a lot of wind, or devastation, right? And, and for different reasons, these things last a long time. So, you know, you talk to your grandparents and they'll tell you about Charlie in 51 or Charlie in 50, if I remember the year 50s, if, you, if I remember the year correctly. And for some of us, you know, it would be Gilbert. And for others, it would be Ivan. So it is your note of a storm. And I'm, as I said before, we've gone from the point where we used to get one note of a storm every 10 to 15 years to a point where we are worrying every season that we are going to get that every season, multiple storms at a maximum category. So as we go through, what with that in mind, what we're doing is, if you could take, let's say, for example, the storms of the 2017 hurricane season. So a storm may not have been impacted you, but it may have done devastation to another country within the region. And if that storm did devastation to another country, in the region, smash is a what if scenario. So what if I could take Gilbert? What if I could take Ivan? What if I could take all the storms of the 2017 hurricane season and simulate them over my country? So you'd actually now get to a point of taking a snapshot. So we actually do not degrade the storm as it moves. We take a snapshot of the storm. We hold that consistent and then we move that over your country. And so rainfall and wind data is then gathered from that. What we did to SMASH to actually validate SMASH was we took Hurricane Ivan. We simulated a track of um, Hurricane, a normal track of Hurricane Ivan as it passed over the island and the model produced some results. We then took a simulated path. What if it moved further northward? What if instead of moving further northward, it moved at a slower speed or a faster speed? What would be the difference? We had river data that was no discharge data, flow data from a river that was recorded during the passage of the storm. And so we had no a response to the storm passing. And from that response, we're able to simulate now, if we put that result in a hydrological model now to say, if the storm shifted north, if the storm was moving slow, what the impact would be. And that is a paper that was published and, and validated. The lead author for that was Dr. Arpita Manda, right? Now, again, none of these tools and what you're seeing now, I must, I must stop and plug, I must stop and, and say this. None of the tools you're seeing now was designed by any one individual. It was a team of persons. I may be the person you're seeing now, but at some point in time, you may see somebody else talking about the tools. And none of what you're seeing now would have been possible without the help of MITS. I know sometimes they get a bad name, but it would not have been possible without the Mona Information Technology Services. Um, hosting has been possible due to the assistance of MITS. All right, so when you click Get Started, so there's a brief description and we have links to the other tools. 
All right. So there's a brief description of Smash. And when you click Get Started, you'll be taken to this page. Um, if you like <laughs> Lords of the Rings or, uh, or anything else like that, it will say one ring to rule them all. Um, and so one <laughs> account shall do the trick. Once you establish any one account here, any future tools that we develop and we host here, you will have access using that single account to all the tools we have here. So I'm just going to click continue with Auth0, and hopefully everything works. Murphy's Law will not grab me today. All right. So for those of you who, who have a Google account, you can actually click sign in with Google, and it will actually push you to your Google account, and Google will handle your credentials, which means you, will, you don't have a new account to remember. You simply remember your old passwords and you already have access to your email and Google handles that security, which means this website never ever sees your password. Google handles logging you in and simply says, I validate this person and then we let you in. So if it's easier for you to use that, go ahead. For some of us, we like having separation in things. So if you want to use your email and specify a completely separate password, that's up to you. So Watch us go through the process now. I'm going to put the mind down and I'm walking along with you. If you have any issues, raise your hand. There are persons watching the chat, persons looking on. And if you're with me so far, just, just, just stay with me, please. Should I do this? I figure I'm going to end up with a lot of emails in some way, but it's fine. It is fine. You know what? I'll do it. <laughs> this is what happens when you don't use your own computer. No, that. Don't worry. It's an easy solution. So if you realize I'm attempting to log in, I can't do that. I have to go to the sign up page. When you start typing your password for your enhanced security, we ask you to actually ensure that you have, you have some lowercase, you have some uppercase, you have some numbers, you have at least one special character. And that's just to ensure that your password is complex enough that I can't just, or anybody can't just use a dictionary or regular passwords to get in. All right, so you realize I'm in. Everybody should be at the same point I'm at. If you use Google, you should be in as well. If you use your regular password, you should be in. So we have a nice setup. And what we've done is try to keep much of the tools we've designed the same setup. So you have a home, you have my simulations, you have great simulations. Within, when you get to accept, you'll see a similar thing. You'll see home, my simulations, create simulations. And when you get to real TMS, you, will, you can actually, it's not home, my simulation, it will be my devices and stuff like that. So here we go. So we're now, about to, this is a fresh account, so there's no simulations to view. All right, so we're gonna create a simulation. When I can create a simulation, there's a map that pops up of the Caribbean. And that map now asks me, there are five simple things you need to do to actually get um, a simulation running. One, you need to select a country. So even if you choose to run the storm across the entire Caribbean, currently we only are interested in a single country. After that country, you select a country, we're asking you to select a storm. 
And then we're asking you to select a category of the storm. So we've selected within the category list, if I click select a storm, you'll realize that you have a lot of storms listed. Now there's one caveat we must add. We are trying to expand the data set. So we pulled all the notable storms that went to category fives. And so we pulled everything that was there. However, satellite data didn't start until after the 19, for monitoring storms in a, in, a, in a robust way until after the 1980s. So any storm you see listed in the 1980s presents a challenge. And that data didn't become available for the Caribbean until early 2000s. And then we were using the TRIM satellite data set, which is TRMM, the TRIM satellite data set. And that satellite was decommissioned, basically burnt up in space between 2015 and 2016, which is why I started out by excluding the 2017 hurricane season. We are working to expand that data set to the 2020s, and we found, recently found a data set that could possibly work, and we're testing in the back end before we push that out. So we're asking if you're selecting a storm, select a storm somewhere between 2000 and 2010, please. All right? So for me, I'm going to select Cuba. I'm sorry. All right, you realize I've selected the country. My map has been zoomed in a little bit. When I click on the map, you realize a blue marker has been put there. If I click again, a red marker is there. So the blue is the start, the red is the end. So we're trying to get to a point of now making this marker movable. And if it's not where you want to pay, place it, you can click again, and that will be the start. And if I click again here, that will be my end. So if you look now, I'm, I may want to run it more of a cubo. You look now, I may have a storm going that path over Cuba. All right, so my interest is Cuba. So the storm I'm going to select, and I'm hoping I select the right one, I'm going to select Dean. All right, and the category I'm going to select is a category five. All right, after selecting the category, I am then to select a forward moving speed. We evaluated storms and came up with an average. So the average slope speed is about 17 kilometers per hour. And this is not the winds in the storm, but the forward moving speed of the storm. All right? Um, I have a question in the room. Hold on. Sure. All right. So, so Dr. J, this is what you do every day. So let me <laughs> slow you down a little bit and do some of your own ways. All right. So please make a distinction between the forward moving speed of the storm and the actual wind speeds in the storm, one. And two, emphasize why the forward speed is important. Yes. All right, so I'll take the last one and then work my way back. So the forward moving speed is important. Imagine, and the easiest way to explain this is to, to, to hearken you back to things you can remember. Dorian and the Bahamas. The Bahamas had been impacted by storms before, but imagine you have somebody pouring a drop of water on your head and they're gonna move their hand in a, in a second. And that drop comes out one every second versus somebody pouring a drop of water on your head for an hour. And that one second now, even though it's one second, one drop per second, you are gonna be soaking wet by the end of the hour. Now imagine that you can't absorb all that water and it's a land space, and it's now slowly moving over you versus quickly. It's one, so it's water damage now becomes a massive problem. In a slow moving storm as well, where high wind speeds are, 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 are there, whereas your building could actually manage a category four intensity for a particular period or a category three for a particular period, it may not be able to handle that sustained pressure for a very long time, a sustained wind speed for a very long time. So you're now looking at massively severe damage. So the forward moving speed is very, very critical. Go ahead, um, Dr. Rankin. I'm glad for the clarification, Dr. J, because um, you'll remember when we did a visit to the Bahamas, yes. they had indicated that the renewable energy installation that they had was actually buttress down into a rock. Yes. And when we asked them what category could we stand, it's a category five. Yes. What the guy was not aware of is the period for which the category five would last. Yes. And so when Dorian came um, and the wind speed just, just crawled and literally stopped over them, then there was a total devastation. So I'm, I'm glad you made that clarification. Right. So if you can now make the distinction between the forward moving 
on the wind speed in the storm itself. All right, sure. So the forward moving part of it, remember now, you can, you can literally quadrant a storm. By quadranting, you simply draw a line down the center of the storm vertically and draw a line going across. And you could literally do that. And even though they talk about wind speeds going around this way, and you think it's an even wind speed, Storms don't actually have winds evenly distributed across it, all right? And, you know, as my mother would say, you know, there are persons who, when Gilbert impacted in that first part before the eye came, and the eye is a quiet part, you know, their roofs were okay. When it came to the, the, the latter part of it, you know, with stronger winds, persons who survived the first half of it could not survive the second half because even though, even though it may be a percent, a slight percentage difference, a percentage difference means a lot, a difference between experiencing category four winds and wind gusts that probably exceed category five winds or are within the, the, the maximum of category five winds, all right? So the forward moving speed is how quickly the storm moves from point A to point B, while the wind speeds are the, 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 the concentrated circulation pattern around that storm. So that's what literally talk about a, a storm being a category one versus a category two. We talk about the that's what we're talking about, that wind speed, that category, that, that makes the wind speed that makes it a category one versus a category two versus a category three or four or five. All right, so I'm gonna select the slowest moving speed. I'm hoping everybody is still with me. All right, so I'm gonna click save my simulation. When I save my simulation, you realize the simulation said simulation created successfully and it's been queued. All right, we're in the process of actually um, writing a, a, a watch script to actually populate this um, quickly. But I'm just going to ask you when you get to the screen, just click my simulation and you'll see that your simulation has been completed. All right, your simulation is now completed. You realize now you have some data on, you know, the date of the simulation, when the simulation is completed, you have the country was done over, you have the storm name, you have the category, and you have the forward moving speed. I can now view my results, all right? And when I click view my results, it will, it, it's gonna take a little while to populate. I chose the largest territory within the Caribbean. And you realize it took a while to populate. Now ignore the fact that rainfall data is, is saying zero. But you realize again, I have all the data here for you, right? And you realize there's a, there's a, a box in the lower left-hand corner that's been highlighted. We default ourselves to that lower left-hand box. So the values you're seeing here are suggesting that over time, the rainfall that got to that point was none. So what happens if I click a box, let's say directly in the path of the storm? Why am I not clicking? All right, so I click a box. I click another box. You realize you're getting some wind data and it's suggesting that and guys, let me show you. I can go full screen on my thing. I can actually take a picture of this. Don't download this as a PNG. I can zoom in, right? I can pan. I can click and just move to, to, to see. I can do a box select, which means I'm just interested in this little area here, right? And I go click. Come on, come on, come on. No, it not work with me. All right, let's do it again. Auto scale first. Come on, work with me now. I said Murphy wouldn't catch me. Murphy has caught me today. Oh, all right, let me use the Zoom feature. All right, here we go. So multiple ways of doing it. So you realize, no, I'm only focused on the instance. So leading up, you realize you are getting some bit of, you can evaluate the length of time that an area would be under a particular wind strength, right? And so you, you can get that. I think we may need to check our units on this side. Just forgive me, I'm realizing I'm saying 400 meters. We may need to check that a little bit, all right? So outside of that, no, I can also download the data that's associated with this plot, right? And with the rainfall, I can do the same thing. I can make that rainfall plot large. And you realize what happened. You had a, a peak going up in one direction and then the rainfall data came all the way back down only to just peak right back up again. 
right? And I can do the same thing where I can now click and, and I can now examine how much rainfall fell over what period of time. And you can see the time on, on that axis, all right? So that's where we're going. And we're hoping that at some point in time, this, this imagine you're doing a what if scenario. So what if, in, what if this river basin or this road or that, you can take, now take that rainfall data, you can put that in an engineering model to say, you know, the roads were designed this way and the accommodating drains were designed to handle this capacity of water. But what if I have a storm that's so slow moving and comes at a maximum category? Will we be able to accommodate that? So you can use this as a what if kind of scenario. All right. Any questions so far? I pause for questions. That's one tool. All right. Um, Dr. J, can you just go back over? Can you just bring back up a blank map? I want you this time to go over Jamaica. And I want to go to the process of selecting the start point and the end point. Sure. What I want to also ask you, if you selected the wrong end point, how do you undo? Just demonstrate that. All right, sure. So I'm going to go just click from this page, create a simulation. I'm going to select, I've been asked to select Jamaica as a country. Forgive me, I, I, I chose Cuba, not, 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 not anywhere in English speaking. All right. No, I am going to select a storm and I'm going to go back to my trusty dean. And just if I click anywhere on the map, I get a starting point. And if I click anywhere else on the map, I get an ending point. As I said, we are working on getting to a point where you can click and drag the points to anywhere you want to. But if it doesn't work for you and it's not where you want it to be, just click again and you get a new start and you can click and get an end. All right? Now that's dean. Selecting a category five now. And I'm going to select a fast moving theme. All right. And then I'm going to say save my simulation. As I said, the refresh doesn't work the way we want it to just click my simulations again. And you see that it's completed. And again, you have all the details there. And from my simulation number, I can tell that 20 other persons have completed their simulation successfully. So of the 90 people online, only 20 have actually attempted to complete a simulation. I feel bad. I expect it like 50. All right. I am now going to click view my results and immediately realize that given the, given the area of Jamaica, so we only do deal with boxes that have land spaces. So it's a rectangular area. So we get some data there. Go ahead, Dr. Rankin. I see the map. I see the graph. Sorry. Can you, can you direct me to where? Or let me ask you a question. Does it give you the total accumulative rainfall that would have occurred over the, the passage of the past? Yes or no? We can include that. It can do that. However, what we wanted to do was actually give you the incremental, tot not, not incremental, but point by point, point, by point okay. 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 in time. But we can actually have a map that gives you, you know, say, it in an hour interval versus a day interval. So okay. let's say the storm took three days to pass. You, you could then adjust your time scales because... We have the finest scale data that's there. Right. Um, I, can I make a suggestion at, sure. the, at the risk of being preposterous? I think that would be a, a, a very useful inclusion because you know the issue that we're now looking at is the whole notion of return period. Yes. How often do you have a, 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 a hazard of a particular magnitude? And so when you get, let's say, 200 millimeters in, say, two days, somebody could quickly make a reference to say, well, that's what we get in, in 300 in you know, 30 year mean, blah, blah, blah. And immediately, you know, for a policymaker, for anybody who wants to get a quick and dirty evaluation of the kind of um, rainfall that they would have had in a period of time, this would be some very, very useful. All right, noted, noted, noted. All right, so again, guys, this is a what if scenario. I know somebody's going to ask, so if a storm is coming now, can I take it and use it? Um, we're not there yet, and, and I'll say no for this tool. What we're doing is, I know what my past is like. I know what, are, what is of note. If I take what is of note, that something that may not have impacted me, how will it look for me? So take, for example, an Ivan, or you take a Dean or a Dorian. They are now becoming a new normal. Jamaica has not, even though we caught the, the edges of Ivan, it was not a direct landfall. So imagine if that becomes your new normal and you're now saying, what if it runs straight across the country, the longest path in the shortest, in the longest possible time, what would happen? 
So you could know. And what if instead of going from south to north, it went from north to south? You could do a whole lot of what if scenarios. Yes, you, you could have that. If a high pressure system pushes it, you could have that. It depends on the atmospheric conditions. Uh, yeah, you can have, even have storms curving back because something is pushing it this way. All right, so we're here. Um, I, I, see, I see something coming off in the chat and I don't want to just change my screen, so. Okay. All right, cool. So can I, can, I, can I move off from this tool or do you want another two or three minutes? All right, so they're setting up a poll. Yeah, so we're going to set a poll um, question. How useful is this tool for you on your work? Uh, one being least useful, 10 being most useful. Can you just start populating your chat um, with your score? This is your score, no, you know. One is not useful at all, 10 is very useful. And we need to start. We're going to, as the score is coming, we'll start announcing them so we can hear what's on the chat. Um, so anybody see, Dion, you can help with the scores that you see. If you see the scores coming through, you can let me know. Um, so one is not useful, 10 is, is very useful. Let's see what they're saying online, Dr. G. All right, all right. Um, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask Peter to open his mic. Um, Peter said one. <laughs> Peter, can we have a conversation? <laughs> no, Peter, no, 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 no. Um, not every tool is useful for everything. So I would, I would like to know. <laughs> Peter, I hope you don't feel like I was pressuring you. I really was interested in, in the sector or why the tool wasn't, 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 wasn't useful. Impact forecasting is actually done by CIMH. All right, so the next tool we're going to look at, and again, I'm going to give you a, a brief um, overview of the tool before we go. Um, this started out first as a final year project, um, um, and we believe within the department that we make, um, we, our mantra is that we make problem solve. If you take a physicist in your organization, you're taking a problem solver. And, and as such, we, we took it from the point of view that, you know, there was an issue. And at a point in time, there was a, a series of, of spills and other things. And water within an island context is very, very important. Now imagine having a large underground aquifer that is poly, polluted and you can't in any way, shape or form, you enter a drought and that aquifer is possible, a potential area to tap, but you cannot tap into it because it's polluted. So we decided that, you know, there are, are methods that, you know, is not when you want it, it you, 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 you're then going to test it. There are methods that you could use and employ. One second, please. Dr. J, can you just confirm whether the login only works with Gmail accounts? Because I'm now hearing that somebody is trying to log on with Yahoo and it's not working. No, so if the person register, did they click? So the first tab starts with login and then the second tab is sign up. Um, so did they click the sign up and specify all the things and then go, went through? I, I don't know. Uh, well, just tell us the steps. If so you, can if, you sign in with another account apart yes, from Google? Because I use Hotmail just now. Hotmail, okay. Yeah, so you could use... Doesn't matter. So you must create an account first. Create an account first. Okay. All right. All right. So, so to that person that's signing up online, you first of all have to create an account, and that account can use any any email 
Hotmail, Gmail, Ymail. Excite, Bing, whatever you want Excite, to Excite, whatever. And then when you go back, you use that information to get in on the site. Thanks, Dr. J. Sorry All right, about Sure, no problem. All right. So there are a few things I, 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 I'm, I'm putting here. So I'm first giving you why the intent, the intent was there. And um, because of an NDA, I cannot tell you the entity that we installed this in. But what I can tell you is this. All right. And Dr. Leonardo Clark is in the room, who is integral in this overall endeavor. Um, and I'm just going to ask him to walk to the mic for a second. Please forgive me, Dr. Clark. <laughs> All right. Um, and he's just going to lay out um, in, 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 in like two minutes, <laughs> in like two minutes, um, how he sees this tool being impactful to water and water quality monitoring. All right. Yes. So the water monitoring tool at J is um, Dr. J. Yeah. 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 Come forward. To the mic. Oh. <laughs> Morning again, um, all. Um, thanks, Dr. J. So um, the, the water monitoring tool that's been mentioned here is a tool that we, we, we developed to monitor water um, quality in a real-time or pseudo real-time scenario. Um, so the tool basically use sensors uh, with different water quality um, parameters, uh, for instance, pH and conductivity, um, total dissolved solid, and any other sensor that, that are available. And what we did was develop a system that connect that sensor to a communication module, processing and communication module that transmit information to a website um, that we can use now to monitor the location on a real-time basis to also allow for uh, real-time um, alert. So we can set threshold, for instance, on the, on the system. And if the thresholds are breached, then emails, for instance, are sent out to personnel. Um, so th that's basically what the, the tool is, is about. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, um, Dr. Clark. Um, he's key to the development of, of, of this overall process. And I, it would be remiss of me not to, 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 to let him have a word in. Um, so what we, and, and to give you a scenario, as I said, because of an NDA, I cannot tell you about the organization, but I, however, can tell you about an instance. So after installing the tool um, and the device um, in a large, very large company, who, who, right, who are near water bodies, and we're doing chemical processing, right? They, they decided that the CEO, the manager, um, the, the, the CEO, the CTO, um, the manager, and two other senior men, members required access, as well as the, the person immediately doing any bit of discharge of their, their, their waste because your waste must be processed to a particular level before they let it out. Um, we actually designed a public facing website, but because of fears, they decided to take it private. Now, the very minute the worker opened the valve to let out water, or not water, but the chemical waste, there is an immediate email and text message alert sent to everybody in the group. So the, the CEO could call the manager, could call the CTO, and the CTO could call down. And immediately before it got to the point of tens of tons of waste being pumped into a river, somebody was told, stop what you're doing, turn it off, no. So that's the kind of response. I know we said pseudo real time because it comes, it takes a while for the response to get to the web server and it takes a while for that message alert to be sent. But in an essence, when you're thinking about water bodies within the region, these are where we get our drinking water from. These is where some people's entire livelihoods are, are on the, the riverine systems. Fish, you're talking about people using this for bathing and washing. So this isn't an instance to actually try to account for that. Without data, we can't make certain decisions without actually saying, well, and we could actually use this as well to 
actually monitor the quality, the overall quality of our overall riverine systems from start to finish. At what point in my river system do I get our water system? Do I encounter challenges? Um, so I'm, 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 I'm taking it from there. All right, I see at least one question there. What are some of the main parameters being monitored currently? So pH, dissolved oxygen, temperature, um, we had turbidity, and there is one other one I may be missing because um, we started out with five basic things that everybody could actually use. And there's one other I, I may be missing. Conductivity. Right, and the, 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 the design of all our tools is a modular fashion, which means we can account as, accommodate as many sensors as possible, as many sensors as the solar system can power and manage, we can maintain all, all of those um, um, as well. All right, so this data is then pushed to a website and stuff. And again, because of an NDA, we can't show you the real valid data, but we can actually show you a, a pseudo setting. So I'm about to share my screen again, and we're gonna go through. Um, what about bacteria, um, Michael Ennis? So here's what we do. If there's bacteria, there's gonna be a change in pH. There's gonna be a pH change in dissolved oxygen. So there, we may not be able to monitor bacteria on, in a real-time basis, but if there's a change in, in, in any, in, if there's an increase in bacterial content, that will change other constituents in the, in the water. And the system will be designed and added, added to the system after testing it out um, and, and implementing it so far, we will actually add a sampler. So if at any point in time a threshold is reached, there's a little valve that will open that will collect a sample of water at that point and at that time. So you now be able to then go back and take that in a lab to do further analysis to see what that cause was, what was detected at that point in time. Hopefully it's not something that just disappears in a closed little, little thing over time. So Michael, I hope I've answered your question. All right, going back to sharing my screen now. All right, so, so we've looked at a, a little bit at SMASH and um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to ensure that we, we, we spend some time and, and, and actually look at the, the rest of them. So we started out with SMASH and I'm just gonna work my way back and work my way through. Um, forgive me for doing this like this, but I'm working my way through back to where I need to be. So I could have just clicked anything. So again, this is my starting point. This is my landing page. This is where I start. All right, and I remember for now we're clicking, we're skipping accept agree. We're gonna spend loads of time on agri accept. As much time as we spent on Smash, we'll be spent on agri accept as well. So we're now gonna visit Real TMS. And for me, because we've logged in already, this should work. I'm hoping it works. When I click connect, I should automatically be taken in because I've already created an account already. I didn't log out, so I should be automatically taken in. All right, we're gonna stylize this page. For us, we are more interested in functionality rather than looks. So at some point in time, somebody said to me, but after I get in, it just dropped me dead. So, so <laughs> we're gonna actually try to stylize this page, All right? So we're viewing sensors. The sensor we have right now is on the UMONO campus. And um, if I click view sensor right now, um, there should be some live data coming in. So let's give it a second. There should be some live data coming in, so give it a second. I am hoping, I'm hoping, I'm hoping, because the battery is on, but I am. So there you have your pH, your conductivity, your temperature, your turbidity, and your dissolved oxygen. I am hoping that this works. Murphy, don't please don't play with me today. Let's see if I can get some stats. Historical data. All right. 
That means Murphy is playing with me now. So let me go view sensors again and go back. All right. Even though you're not seeing any data now, for whatever reason, what typically happens is that, oh yes, there's some data. There is some data. So the data comes in every minute. Um, and let me make this one large, move this first, make this one full screen. Come on, go full screen. Okay, not going with me. So data is coming in every minute. And if you realize, you can look here and you realize that it's saying your electrical conductivity is giving you a value and you have a temperature and your temperature right now of the water, not of the atmosphere, is 25 degrees. Um, we're hoping to install this in UE's cogen plant um, because the water going in has to meet certain criteria and the water coming out has to meet certain criteria as well. So there'll be one on the intake and one on the outlet valve of the, the cogen plant. Um, the cogen plant uses liquid um, LNG to actually power, um, provide UA with electrical power. Um, so, and then the chilled water or heated water is then used to actually cool some buildings. So um, it's, it's a way of making use of the entire process um, and, and not having that much waste. But within the process itself, you must have, uh, have, have some, 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 some stuff. All right. So I'm really hoping, uh, forgive us for, <laughs> for, for, for Murphy being a part of this. But it comes in every minute. So if you realize every minute you get a, a little another tick, every minute to every minute to 30 seconds to every minute. So you'll realize you get another tick or so in another 30 seconds or a minute. All right. And in essence, we could actually set it to sample every two seconds. Um, but in, in some instance, when you sample every two seconds, what happens is that you get a vast volume of data and then you have a vast volume of data to transmit. And these are sometimes put in remote locations with no internet. And having no internet means that you now have to depend on GSM or, or mobile network connections. And sometimes those fail as well. All right. I promised you guys that yesterday I would have actually paused myself and actually go back to CSAC. And I'm, I'm really hoping that I get a chance to do so now. Um, but you've gotten the overall utility of the tool. Um, I, I don't think there's much else for me to say about that. So if you view sensors, Imagine within your country, you have all these sensors. The sensor has a green marker because everything is okay for the sensor, meaning the battery is good, no alerts have been detected, no thresholds have been met. And so on this one screen, you can now look at and you'll see that green marker that suggests all your, all your water locations that you're monitoring are in a good state. If you saw a red marker, it would simply mean that there was an alert from the last time you logged in. Something got to a point of hitting a threshold. All right. So any questions so far? I'm, I'm going to pause myself here and ask for any questions. Yeah, I'm looking. <laughs> Where else in the world do we have these or similar tools, both Smash and Real TMS? Well, Smash doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Um, Real TMS, it, in a sense, you, you, you have universities and other organizations that monitor water quality. But what we're looking to do is not just monitor your drinking water. We want to monitor your companies as well. We want to monitor any, anybody that has any waste to give off where water is concerned. Be that you think you're nowhere near anything. Um, imagine mounting sensors in gullies so you can actually detect when a restaurant has decided to let go of all their oils. Um, there is a, and cooking oil should never, ever, 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 ever be put down the drains. Um, it should never, ever happen. It's in salt, it should never happen. So there was an instance where, I, I won't name, there's a particular, the health inspectors go around and the guys always have said, well, you know, somebody comes and collects. But the health inspector was, inside the restaurant, not being an health inspector, when he heard a waiter say something. And he decided, I must go check. <laughs> and when he realized they had an unseen pipe and hole in the wall that's leading straight into the gully where 
they stored oil to say they get collected. And all they'll do is take the label off and put a new date on it. But it was the same bottles of oil that he saw every single time. Any new oils that were abused were just poured down that secret exit out into the, 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 the gully. And that, in, in an instance for me, means you, you're thinking about it's a large restaurant, by the way. You're thinking about tons of oil just going and it's cooking oil. Um, it, it's not good. So are we able to determine the time span for reporting graphs? Um, you are able to determine. So you can set, so in, a, in essence, we can collect all the data and the data could be at a two second interval. If you have a two second or one second interval data, you can do anything you want. That's data at the finest temporal, sorry, time scale. So know if you want data at a minute, data at an hour, data at the day, data at any time scale, you can specify that. And so, although I didn't show you the feature, you, you will be able to say, I only want to see data every hour, not data at the minute level. So you could do that. Christopher, I hope I've answered your question. Yes. All right. Now I'm hoping that I made the correct changes and that Theodore Winter, who should be online, um, he may be on YouTube, um, but I'm hoping he may, we, we made the correct changes. So the promised showcase of your tool, um, CSAC, CSAC tool will be, will be seen. So, all right, currently CSAC doesn't require any login, but CSAC is gonna be put behind a login. Reason we're doing that is we want to know when people use the tool. We want to know. And in some instances, you heard um, Steve mentioned it, and he said that you know, it's a self-assessment tool, but in the long run, for auditing purposes, after you've done your self-assessment, you then have somebody else to come and validate that your self-assessment is right. So within that tool, you will now have a button that says, I'm requesting official validation of my results. So if you're going through and you know you, you, you can request and invariably, after some training, you'll have possible auditors lining the region that will now come and validate that, you know, whatever you specified within, within that form, it, 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 is, it, is, it, is, it is what it is. So we've managed to get a few more in. So remember yesterday we said something about CSAC and this is a self-assessment tool. All right, so we've managed to just activate a few more. And remember, there are 20 questions. Um, and you can look at it from a point of view. Let's say, you know, you're going through and you say your land use is excellent. You have less than 29%. You select, you get a score. You go next, you have your water usage. And you can say excellent again. All right. And you can keep going and you can say three for this one. And each one you select, you get a score. Now, remember I said to you, if you think you made a mistake, you can go, you can always go back and it shows you what you selected and you can go, oh no, I, I selected the wrong one. So let, let me, let me, let me go that route. And then I go and it walks me back through, right? They should not have changed. And it takes me back to where I last selected. So this one, some nutrients was not selected. All right. So again, let me show you, I'm going to go next. So I have three things selected. If I go back, all the way to the first one. And let's say I select three now. When I click next, no, why would I click start over? Next, sorry. So select three, then next. So you mean all I've been doing, you've not been seeing. So why somebody never says so? I feel <laughs> I feeling so loved. Are you seeing my screen now? All right, so let me take you back to home. This is how many things I did. Hmm. Interesting. All right. So you heard all I said about CSAC, so I won't cover that again. So um, now we're going to actually just visit the CSAC tool, and you realize we have actually gotten five other steps, activated five other steps. Um, 
as I indicated yesterday, we had some challenges with images that were loading. Um, so we actually just kind of deactivated those images. Um, in future iterations, this bold numbers that you see here will be gone. And all you're left with is this, um, this, this number to select, all right? And so I'm gonna select three. When you select a score, any card you select, the number pops up here. You can't click and type a number here. The reason we're doing that is that we've, we discovered that sometimes when persons are typing numbers, um, they may add a zero, they may add an extra number. And we didn't want to actually have a, a, a limit set because the tool itself could be expanded. So let's say in CSAC version three, we decide that if it's, this is too much of a wide gap because everything else or these two are too wide, right? And so instead of 50 to 69, it's 50 to 59, 30 to 39 and 40 to 40. So therefore, you know, you can always push that out a little bit more. And so we want to be able to e effectively capture that. So but there you go, next. You have the water usage and again, image issues and this, 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 this change where the numbers are concerned but keeping consistent with the Excel document you saw, we're ensuring that you, you kind of get the, the similarity feel, all right? And again, remember for those who are here yesterday, this tool is a self-assessment tool. You know, people talk about climate smart projects or climate smart agriculture or climate smart endeavors. This is an evaluation of whether or not your project is indeed climate smart. Because if you say you're gonna be climate smart, but yet you clear an entire area, and you only manage to farm 10% of it, um, are you indeed being climate smart? Or if you clear an entire area um, <laughs> and the area you cleared, you then actually are no, you, you make no use of organic fertilizers. You're entirely on, on, on petrochemicals or fertilizer based in petrochemicals. Um, that in an, in, in an essence presents some challenges because you're still promoting the use of of fossil fuels. Um, there are other things there that, that we can talk about. All right. And so we are going to go through and make some other selections. Um, remember the end of that Excel document, you saw that what level of certification you, you achieved. All right. So I'm selecting fives. All right. And remember that once you are below 40%, you get no level of, of climate smart compliance attained. Um, at this end, you'd have actually, you can go back home, you can redo the assessment, and we're going to add a third button that says requesting official um, certification. And so at that point in time, a certified um, climate smart agriculture compliance officer will actually come and evaluate and then um, give you the official certification. Um, what with that? that, go ahead, right ahead, Steve. I think that's Steve. Yeah, I said uh, an official CSAC auditor. All right, an official CSAC auditor. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing now um, and take all questions now for the next four minutes before I hand over um, to Dr. Rankin. Um, I think, Dr. Rankin, I'm good on time. And so you have, you have more than enough time now to play with DSAT. Um, and you'll see me again at the end of it where we're now going to go through AgriAccept. And then you'll ask Dr. Rankin, why did you take us through all of that with DSAT when all I had to do was click three buttons and I'll get the same result? So <laughs> I am, I am, I am, I'm saying that. So just looking to the questions now. What type of sensors are being used at UE? For the, it's not Hobo. Um, we went for commercial grade sensors. We actually had, we, we first started out with some sensors that, remember sensors require routine maintenance. And if you go for cheap sensors, they may not last you a year. And in some instances, your pH sensors may need to be changed out probably every two, three years or something like that. And they have to be recalibrated um, and and it's, it, it's why more people don't do it, because it can become prohibitive. 
you have sensors that you need to change and then you have to now maintain the overall system itself. And we had, I think we had a, a hobo set up to start with, but that was expensive. Any other questions? All right. If there are no other questions, I first would like to thank you guys for your time. Um, I hope you will make full use of these tools um, as improvements come out because you actually, our new tools come out because you've actually registered for the platform. We'll send you any updates we make to the team. So we include the 2017 hurricane season storms. When we actually digitize that early warning system for THI and put it on the same platform, you will actually get an email. And all we're going to ask you for is give us your email address, give us your location. And once you give us your, your, your email address and you type in where you have your farm or wherever, you will get an email alert um, saying, what the THI readings, what the level of stress the animal will be under, um, and, and as such, um, thank you for your time. Dr. Ranke, next session is yours, the eagerly anticipated DSAT interactive session. Yeah, man. Please note, you need a stretching session because after the many Please note, Dale is going to talk about the genetics of the crop. Dale is going to talk about fertilization. <laughs> How long did it take? So SMASH is years in development. It was an idea birthed by Professor Michael Taylor and then taken by myself and one other student and we ran with it. And as such, it brought us to the point of actually completing um, and developing SMASH. There's another tool that we have that's called record. And what record does, it you now merges your historical data and your future data. So it actually gives you what the climatological changes for each grid location over every country within the Caribbean is going to be. And that is also going to be placed here. Um, but then that's an entirely climate-based tool with no <laughs> applications within agriculture. We showed you real TMS because it has applications to agriculture. We showed you SMASH because the applications to agriculture but we are going to add record to the same space. And each tool takes an average about, I'd say six months to a year to develop. Um, and Dr. Clark can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's a, an average time about six months to a year. Sometimes it'll be longer, but an average six months to a year. Oh yes, um, we spoke about it yesterday. We spoke about ACE. Um, and when we talk about ACE, we're not talking about accumulated cyclone energy or anything else like that. We are talking about automated canopy estimator. Um, Dr. Rankin mentioned it, where we are getting to the point where, let's say you plant, and you want an estimation of what the yield is. Um, from the canopy cover, you can give an estimation of what your yield is based on your foliage cover. So you take pictures of your, over, overhead pictures of your, your thing, and it will then give you very accurately what the overall yields. Eh? Let's have a sweet potato. Yes, <laughs> you take picture. Uh, it can be scaled. So each crop has a different one. Before ACE, people used to have to take pictures and manually click around the leaf and then measure. And so this is done in, no matter how amount of pictures you pass at it, it's done in five seconds. It's actually calculates in five seconds, it estimates what percentage of that area is green. And from the percentage that's green, yet you then take it from there. Um, how many persons contributed to each tool? Well, the Climate Studies group has a, a base of about, including postgraduate students and undergraduate students, a base of about 15, 15 to 16. And not every person works on every single project. But in some instances, the core team on any project is about three. Um, with probably two advisors, two or three advisors. So every single tool you see here would have been, would have been developed by about, say, somewhere between three to six persons. Ma undergraduate, masters, and PhD candidates. So the young man sitting behind you 
is an undergraduate student and we are now working to complete another two. Um, and what happens is you, students must leave here thinking that they have the, 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 the requisite skills to go tackle problems. One second, can you say this? Can you use a system to quantify the damage? All right, so remember I said about the $10 payment and the $100 payment. And then when we talk, spoke about ACE earlier, we said that ACE, there's a part of ACE we may actually have to take preparatory. Um, what we're talking about, we're looking to actually get to a point of covering citrus um, kind of diseases that get into crops. And imagine that you could take a picture of the entire citrus crop and this tool could quickly, within five seconds, say to you, I detect the presence of, 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 of that, I think it's called rust. There's coffee rust and then citrus root rot disease. Um, you can actually detect that. And the treatment for that is at the earliest stage, you must spray before evening, because if it gets noticeable, then it's too late. So that's where we're going. Um, so insect damage, it will, once you get that and it's eaten out, and you can actually quantify the insect damage. You can actually look at it. Um, the tool can actually do that. If you say, it, this is supposed to be a full leaf and you give the age of the plant and we measure and there's a percentage part of it missing, we can say to you, or looking at leaves, we can say to you, yes, you have the presence of insects. So that, uh, can you John, understand why I got excited by the tuna, the tuna tool yesterday? Because it's somewhat similar to Ace. It's you're taking pictures using machines to actually quantify what value is there and then moving on. Dr. J. Yes. Yeah, I see. I, it will also be useful for determining the economic thresholds for insect pest management. Yes. I see two hands in the room. What about spore-related diseases? Yes. 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 Ground true thing, here's what I'm gonna do. I am gonna let the man who did his PhD on this, who spent months in the field, lifting bags, taking pictures, climbing on up on things, falling off. <laughs> <laughs> tell you exactly how much growth truthing was done. And it's a tool that once it was developed, immediately the Chinese said, can we have access to it? Because it made every process so much easier. So I'm gonna pause now, hand over the mic, because this session comes up next and it's really why you're here. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. J. Give Dr. J a hand, please, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so the question has been asked about um, how do we develop the tool? How do you ensure that you're getting results that are, first of all, foolproof? And secondly, that makes sense. So to answer your question, Simone, first thing that we had to do was, and how this thing actually came into being was that the crop models that we use use one of two mechanisms to track development. You can go outside when you have a mango tree, look at the blossoms and have a rough idea of what you're going to have. If you have a maga season or you're going to have a good season. When you plant something that grows underground though, the only way of knowing what is happening is digging up the plants. And of course, once you dig up the roots, you're going to affect your yield because they intertwine all over the place. So you might find a vine out there. So and the root is really down there. So, so when you dig right here, you have to dig all the way down and going down, you, you affect your yield. So one of the problems I, I had was that I needed to find a way of measuring canopy cover. There was no easy way of doing it. The, the best on the market was something called a green crop tracker. We said GCT, not general consumption tax. We found out that whenever it worked well, if it, if it didn't have a lot of shadow, it worked well if, it, if the canopy was not totally closed or totally open. But when you go in the field, because you have to do measurements from your plant all the way till your harvest, 
When the ground was bare, it, it didn't do a good job. When the canopy was almost closed, it didn't do a good job. So what you're trying to do, and you can do canopy both upward and downward. So, may, so for example, you can use the software in a forested area by turning the camera up and looking at the gaps in the canopy. So you can also get whether there's deforestation too. In the case of sweet potato, you're looking down. Are you with me so far? Okay. So what we, so what we had to do was, our problem was that the, the, the one thing that we had to do was something called a septometer, that they were saying that we could use leaf error index um, but this was a three thousand four hundred US dollar equipment. I was at near the end of my PhD, and there was going to be I had already used up my research grant. So right in this very room, when I was doing my upgrade seminar, um, Dr. Coy was sitting right where you were, and he said, "Can I get a sample of two hundred pictures, and let me go home and see what I can do?" He came back the next day, and had very good values. And what we did was to do a, a actual ground truth using Photoshop and looking at each pixel, and you know this better than me, so you can actually get an actual percentage cover. We also did also got a whole host of data with four different crops: rice and rye and wheat from overseas, um, with a university several thousands, several thousands of pictures, and somebody had gone to for their masters and actually done the pixelation, so we knew exactly what the canopy kind of cover was. Then we were able to compare what our value was given with the model, with the Gaussian model. And I can show you the, the gore details. Go you can you see, please? Um, with what was actually done online. Yes? When we were finished with that, we got to the point where we are able to actually do the digitization in seconds. You could batch the photos, it doesn't. But what also happens is that it actually gives you a picture of how well the actual delineation is done. Most of the other softwares, you, you use a slide rule, you make an objective judgment of when you think you have reached the correct thing, and then it, it, it digitizes everything in that batch based on that one image. ACE doesn't do that. ACE does an individual digitization of every single image in your folder. And this is the only tool that works, that doesn't break down when leaves are partly green and partly yellow. Because most softwares, can't distinguish between green and yellow at certain points. So when like sweet potato, you know that the sweet potato crop is maturing when the leaves begin to get yellow or sinus, as we call it. But when part is partly green and partly yellow, what do you do? When you have a split in the leaf, what do you do? Also, when you have the leaves overshading and the, the sunshine is very bright, the ground looks green when it's actually a soil, it's not, it's, not, it's not greenery. So we had to compare it with nine other software on the market to prove that we were not just good, but the best. Because some of the persons that we had sent the paper to review, they were authors of those papers, so they were rejecting it. So we had to go through a whole hell of a thing until eventually they accepted that, yes, this is the best, all right? So now what we can do is develop relationships between canopy cover and leaf area index that is used for other models, because like the model that I'm going to show you now cannot use canopy cover. But, but we have an instrument, Thankfully, we were able to buy the septometer, so we don't have that in my office. You can do simultaneous measurement of canopy cover and leaf area index, make a, a, a regression relationship, an easy relationship. And there, because leaf area index is so hard to measure because you have to go harvest the leaves, hope and pray that whoever is harvesting leaves gets a representative sample. When one sweet potato plant has 6,000 leaves, how many makes a representative sample? It's very hard, right? Um, so we, if we can find a way to make a relationship between canopy cover and leaf ear index, and it is a solid relationship. After that, all they need to do is to take pictures. Um, the last thing I want to say is, if you take a camera, if, if you have a, a 5G phone, and I have a 3G or I have a bangers phone, and both of us take a photograph, your picture is going to look better than mine, right? The way it is represented is different. If you have a Fujifilm camera, and I have a Nikon camera, we take the same, we take a picture of Dr. J standing, the way it is represented in the red, blue, green space differs, okay? What we did in, this, this does not use the RGB space, it uses something called lab space, which separates the color image from the brightness. So it doesn't matter which capture device you use, you could use your cell phone in the field, you could use a drone, 
You could use Jay's fancy phone that in my in pocket, it doesn't matter. You'll get the same quality and the same segmentation. And that's the only thing that allows you to do that. So one of the things that we were experimenting yesterday, Jay, with um, Stefan and Dr. Coy, is do we go with the trellising system where you put a, a camera and you say, okay, every time you see this vegetation, this is carrots. So it will go through the field and take all the carrot pictures one time, and then it comes back to a starting point and it go and take all the sweet potato and all the sweet pepper and so on. The problem with that is if it is raining and your camera is not in a waterproof thing, you're going to be in trouble. In most of the fields that I work in, it's poor communities. I don't want to carry this fancy trellising system in the field. So one of the things that we have found that will work better is a drone. You can fly a drone in, in 10 minutes and take pictures in X, Y, Z, T, right, real time. You can get a timestamp on the image. You can get the pictures quick, quick, quick. Drones are dime a dozen now. You can get a decent drone for 6,000 US dollars and donors will give you that with no problems at all. And we have partners that are willing. One of our graduate students, Chris Burgess, is willing to, he's a PhD, he's, he's willing to lend us drones as well. So you can go in the field and what would have taken you ordinarily an entire day, I had to go to three locations, four locations, five locations to take pictures of 50 plots of sweet potato. And in each plot of 50 plots, I had like 212 trees. So you could imagine when I, go, when I come home, I have no use for myself. Now, if I had known that, I could have used a drone and steer and use my cell phone as the, as the, as the, as the face of the drone, fly it over it, and in five minutes, I don't know what I'm going to be at, right? But not in nothing before the time. Jay hide the facts from me. But now we get it. All right, so, so just to let you know that, yes, we have grown truth. It, it, is, it, is, it is foolproof. It works very well. There is an online version of it that we had to take down because you could imagine that people can upload tons of images to it. Um, what we're trying to do now, and thankfully I heard just now, Jane, that, Jane, that the procurement that we're making for the additional space and the new supercomputer is on its way. Yes. So when that space does come, you know, you can be anywhere. You can upload all the images in no time. Somebody, somebody challenged us and sent us a plate that had chicken, banana, and some callaloo. And said, take out the callaloo, let me see. And they were convinced when everything was taken out except the callaloo. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Can you use a mic? Can you use a mic for the purpose? Great. Simone, can you use a mic for the purpose of those that are online, please? No, 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 come, 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 come. It's an important discussion. No, 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 come, 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 come. You already piqued their interest, so you may as well just come. Take off your mask, please. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so based on what you're describing, it is sounding as if classification is what is used, supervised classification, the basis of that where remote entity is concerned to do what you do in terms of identifying the crops, essentially developing a training set as we would do in remote sensing to then use it to then identify the crops and do what you're doing in terms of the, whether it's a kind of, kind of a cover or whether you're looking at the number of um, leaves. Right. For the, um, for the various crops. It's mm. sounding that way in terms of making a cross-reference between what you're describing and what we do well, that, well, that's where we're going. The first part of it was purely manual. The first part of it was just used strictly for in the field where we had five different varieties of sweet potato. And for each variety, the rate of canopy cover growth was different. So I had to go in the field every month for the six months and take pictures, come back, digitize it, get the canopy cover values, and then say at X date in the crop season, this variety was at this percentage cover, which is why I'm saying the entire work was ground truth because oh. there was no remote sensing at all. We're just experimenting that we know. Yes, yes. You understand? So we will surely be in touch with D. All right? All right, good. Okay, good. So let us go to my beloved DSAT. Um, and what I'm going to do to make sure that everybody that's online, all the 90, how many people are online, Sister Rodico? All the 91 people that are online. How many people on YouTube? 
and the 12 people that are on YouTube um, and anybody else that will join in the future. Um, everybody can follow. Um, Dr. Jane Cohen is online and has been on me to say, I must make sure um, everybody knows where we are, everybody can follow. Let me just say this, that everything that we're going to do now under normal circumstances is a one week course minimum. So don't get flustered if you don't get every single thing. Don't worry if you don't understand. You can watch back over the thing over and over and over. My telephone number is not a secret. 5 902 That's 5 902 You can call. Or my email address is Rankin. And I am a real Rankin because the Rankin has a E at the end. That's make it genuine. That's why Shabba Rankin do have a E on his, his name. So it's Rankin, D-R, at gmail.com. All right, so now that I've done that, I'm going to go now and share my screen. Um, and why I'm, why I'm doing it this way is because I want everybody to see from scratch how this thing works and where you can find it. All right, so let me, let me go online here. All right, and not, not, um, lady, lady, can you tell me when you're my screen, right, please? All right, so I'm going to go to Google, our good friend Google. Um, are you seeing my, my screen now? Good. So this is basic for anybody. You're going to go on Google and you're going to type dsat.net. So D S S A T dot N E T. J, I need a, I need a marker. You can get a marker for me and I'll an erase of these. So when you type in dsat.net, right, the number one search that comes up immediately is dsat.net, the official home of dsat cropping systems model. For those of you, don't say I told you that it means desat or somebody said they didn't know what it means. dsat is an acronym. As you know, the smash means a simple model for the advection of storms and hurricanes. We tend to use a lot of acronyms in physics. DSAT stands for Decision Support System for Agrotechnology Transfer. All right, you're going to see it again, you know, in Final Jeopardy. So, so don't, don't say I never tell you. Decision Support System for Agrotechnology Transfer. The big difference between DSAT and AcroCrop is this. DSAT, DSAT is an application software Whereas AcroCrop is a model, all right? AcroCrop is a model. DSAT is an application software that has several different crop models in it. All right? Okay, so if you click on this first link here, it will take you to the official website of DSAT. It tells you what DSAT is, and all of those things, all right? And they have gotten a little more fancy now by having the thing run across. They are promoting their 2022 training, and if you do have the money, I don't know if it is offered virtually, I've been there twice. They will take you through the whole um, shebang from Monday, I think you have to arrive on Sunday. The training goes from Monday all the way until Saturday. Um, so if you, if you have anybody that can sponsor you to go, you can go. But if you just want to request a model, um, you go here simply, you type your email address, you confirm your email address, and you click submit. That's all you do. And in a, usually in a few days, between 24 to 48 hours or so, they will send you a download link with a license. Keep that license. Because that license number you will use for all future versions. Let me just say to you that this version of DSAT is almost going through the window now. DSAT 48 is available. Um, I, let me not say anything more, but it is available and will be available to the public in short order. All right? But it's just that it's going to be more sophisticated. It has 
some new applications and some new capabilities. All right, so we're not going to spend any time on this. I'm just telling you where to go get it. Remember, you go on Google, you type in dsat.net or just dsat, and we'll take you here and you can request a download. All right, everybody good? Can I get some amen or some yes or something? All right, good. All right, so let me go to dsat now itself and show you when you download what you're going to get. Okay, so if you download the model properly, all right, I get some yeses online. Thank you very much. One, sec one second, Dr. Rankin. Remember to just ask them. There are persons who would not have downloaded DSA yet. Just grab a pen and a paper and just jot down the instructions. Um, these software sometimes are not as simple as direct click install. So there are sometimes there are some little intricacies that you need to know. So just grab a pen and paper. If you're not a pen and paper person, you're a one mode kind of person, just, just, just start. Um, made a note of the, the, the link to go to. You're making a note that this version may be at its end. So at the end of next month, if you've downloaded this version, just double check for the new version. I think your license may still work, but just double check, all right? All right, excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. G. All right, so the new version of DSAT will be DSAT 48.5. This one is DSAT 47. All right, now, Every time I try to teach this course, and I've taught it more time than I can remember, and in more countries than I can care to admit, I, I, am, I get a little wiser in terms of where to start, Moya. So I'm going to start where I think most people are going to ask, where do I find the user manual? So this is the only model that I am aware of that has, or software application that has inbuilt in it okay where you can find documentation so at the top you see something marked file data model documentation everybody following me so far and then help all right so you can look on my screen if you look on my screen you will see file data all right model um Somebody, Ronald Moody saying this at 47.0. Yes, yes, Ronald, you can upgrade if you want. But I would suggest you just wait until 48. All right. So you're going to click documentation. When you click documentation, you see something says documentation 4.5. So this documentation now is the, the manual that came out with the upgrades of 4.5. But I would tell you, if you want the basic reference manual, Look at 3.5, because what 3.5 does, it showed you everything in the model. And then as they make tweaks to the model, they don't rewrite the entire manual. They just rewrite what is different about the new one. So if you click on 3.5, for example, this at 3.5 documentation, this comes up, um, this decision tree come up. And when it come up, when you click here, it shows you the version, and it gives you version three. It goes through the whole thing. It tells you from start to finish what to click, when to click, how to install, everything is there. All right, so if you ever get lost and you don't know what to do, all right, let's go back again and show you where I went. All right, I went to, I went to this shot. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just share my whole screen. So anywhere I go, you all can see it. What did that again, Rodrigo? Share my whole screen, everything. Here? Yeah. So anywhere I go, it will show? You show? Well, yeah, that's what you have to do. All right, so you see my screen? Yeah. What are you seeing? Okay, what are you seeing now? All right, great, all right, great. So I'm saying, remember now, where you got to get this? You got a documentation, remember? Documentation. On the documentation, what are you going to click? Live audience? These are 3.5, all right, good. All right, I'm going to take my time now, all right. So here's where, here's where now things get a little interesting. So if you look on, I don't want this to show. If you look on the, in the middle right here, you'll see that there are 
some called crops, applications, and under applications, you have seasonal, sequence, and spatial. Then you have data. Under data, you have soil, weather, genetics, economics, pests, and so on. So you can simulate pest damage as well. All right, we're going to take it step by step. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to click crops. All right. Under crops, you will see that there are several types of crops. Now, nobody don't cheat now, right? Online audience and live audience. You see cereal. If I tell you that you have a cereal crop, tell me one crop that would be in this folder without clicking. Anybody? What is a cereal crop? Just give me an example. Corn. Give me another one. Oats. By the way, I'm told that I am told that there's no such thing as oats, like you know, say sheep. So we wrote a paper and we write oats, and them say no, it's oat. So tell Fosca oats is not Fosca oats, it's Fosca oat. Anyway, that's another thing. Barley, very good, very good. All right, well, rice. Okay, so let's click on cereals. So in cereals, these are the cereals that are in this side: barley, maize, pearl millet, rice. Grain, sorghum, and wheat. Here's a poll question. Um, Dion, you have to help me. Rodik, you have to help me. Of these wheat crops, which do you think is the most studied in the world? Barley, maize, pearl millet, rice, grain, sorghum, and wheat. You have to vote, right? Tell us quickly what you, which one you think is the most studied in the world. <coughs> All right, so we have barley, we have corn, we have wheat, we have rice. Vermix. Um, wheat. Mm. Soy gum. You choose as wheat. Um, boy, we're in trouble. All right, so the answer is corn. All right, corn is a crop that is most studied in the world. All right, which of these crops will grow in Jamaica? Uh, better yet, which of these crops is grown in the Caribbean since the Caribbean conference? Simone? Simone? Miss? Where's the mic? Rice. Which country grows rice in the Caribbean? Big time. Guyana. Guyana. Okay, very good. So, rice and, 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 and maize are the ones that we grow most. All right. Let's think now, legumes. Which crops would you expect to see on the legumes without clicking? Beans, yes. Different types of peas. Gungo peas. peas. Give me another one now that Jamaicans love. It's one of the crops that a former American president used to grow. Peanut. Peanut. Which president was a peanut farmer? Jimmy Carter. All right. Rev, you might want to put that in the thing there. Anyway. All right, so here's legumes. On the legumes, we have cow peas, chickpeas, dry bean, fabia bean, peanut, pigeon peas, soybean, velvet. So right away, we, we grow soybean in Jamaica. We definitely grow peanut. Um, and, and so we have all of those there already. On the root crops, give me some root crops that you think. Irish potato, potato yam. yam, sweet potato. Sweet potato. Yeah. Which other one? Give me a famous yeah. one. Yeah. Cassava, yes. Give me another name for. Give me another name for. For dashin. Oh. Another name for dashin. Start with T. But you don't know. It's taro. taro, taro. All right. So look. Here are the root crops that are in the model. Cassava, potato, sugar beet, terrier, and taro. So don't say you go in the model and you never see dashin. Dashin is there. All right? Dashin is there. Okay. On the oil crops, I think it's only one. Well, three. Granola, um, sunflower, and safflower. Don't ask me what safflower is. Ask me no questions. I'll tell you no lie. Vegetables, we have pepper. Cabbage, tomato, sweet corn, and green bean, right? So that's quite cool. Under fiber, we have cotton. Under forages, which is grass that you feed with animals, we have alfalfa, bahia grass, Bermuda grass, and 
barakaya. And under sugar, we have sugar cane. Under fruits, we have pineapple, I think. Yes, pineapple. Um, and then there is something called various, which is other crops. Now, this is when now you don't plant anything more. You just leave your field, just to rest. It's called fallow. All right? All right. So the quickest way to show you how this thing works now, since everybody remember from Tuesday that you do simulation, I'm going to show you the big difference between aqua crop and thing. So the first thing now, when we were doing the aqua crop, you went and selected a climate. Anybody remember what else? After the climate, what did you select? This is in the test, you know. The crop. And then after the crop, what you select? Don't let me know, now, Tiffy. The soil type. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Now, look at what is happening now with this one. So we're going to go into cereals and we're going to select maize because we'll grow maize in the Caribbean. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. All right. So let me, just, let me just write something on the board. Um, so here you have to see if you can zoom in on this, right? So we have U, F, G, A, 82, zero one dot m z x all right so that is the last that is the last name of the file when i click on corn let me explain what it is do you have another color marker or is it just a black alone it's a black alone all right so the uf and i'm going to show you to change this later stands for the Institute, which is University of Florida. The GA is a campus, in this case is Griffin, no, sorry, Gainesville, sorry. Anybody can tell me what the 82 stands for? Make a wild guess. A year, what year? I'm glad nobody never said 2082, right? So 1982. 1982. What zero one stand for? Want make a guess? Zero one. Uh, not quite. It's the first experiment done in that year. What is the MZ for? MZ? Maze, of course. Maze. All right. And the X is telling you that it is a experimental research because you have something called, you can do a seasonal one where you are looking at growing the crop for over 30 years to see what happens. So instead of MZX, it was M MZS, all right? But we'll take it one step at a time. So how you run this model? First thing, you would have had to create a climate file. We're not going into that because it's a whole different ball game. You incorporate a climate file into the model and it would ask you to name the file. I'm going to show you how to do all of this, but just bear with me. So let me show you what this file look like first of all, so that everybody understand what goes into the file. So if you, when you don't know the model, you can click on it, you can right click, so you select it, right click and then click edit, edit file. All right, so we'll do that again. You come into, or right, let's say you never had anything open, you go into maze. When maze come up, you say all the maze experiments that are in the model. You click on it and then you right click and you say edit file. When you click edit file, it take a little time to come up. If you have a fast computer, faster than mine, then it shouldn't take this long. All right. So say at the topic, I say what type of file? You see that, Michael? And it's experimental. If you click the drop down arrow, Right, that's before you started, it will tell you. You can name your experiment. You can name your experiment whatever you want to name it. And then see the institute code here now, UF. You see the UF, right? So let us say we were saying this was University of the West Indies. 
You can only use two letters for the institute. So I want you to watch up here where we have um, the MZX. I'm going to change this from UF to UW for university. And look how this little thing up here we magically change from UF to UW, all right? So if I go back and I change it and I put UW, you see change now from UFGA up at the top to UW, everybody see that? Yes or no? Yes? Yes? Yes, yes. people, I'm a teacher now, you have to, you have to, you have to, don't say yes like Jesus said if you don't see it, you know? all right? All right, so I'm going to put back the people them thing because I don't want trouble it. See the GA there, which is the site code, the 1982, which is that, the experiment number, and the coin and everything. All right, now, what you can do from here, there are several things you can do. If I went into management, I click on management, it tells you what cultivar they planted. Now, there are several million. If you, let me show you something. If you click over, the, the crop is maize. If you click over here, you see all the different type of maize that you have. Right, Michael, if you look, you see, you have one bag of different, you see how many cultivars of maize you have? Whole leap, that's why I tell you, right? This is our entire database of, of different cultivars. If you go at planting, so you can click the tabs and go through individually. When you're creating your experiment, Simone, it allows you to do it sequentially. So I'm just going through the tabs that are there already. So when you go under management, management is anything that the farmer determines. So the farmer determines what crop he's going to plant, right? Right, Tiffy? The farmer determines when he plants, right, Michael? So now, on the left-hand side, when you're coming under, under here, and you see sowing, all of these years, 1958, 1959, 1960, if you scroll all the way down, you see it go to 2007. This corresponds to all the years for which you have weather data. So you can put as much weather data as you want in your file. All right? All right. So just, you can take, you know, you can take time and go to, in irrigation, you can set up the irrigation file and everything like that. And then of course, when you come down to fertilizer, you can tell the model which fertilizer you want. You can click inside here and change the fertilizer. You have ammonium nitrate, ammonium nitrate sulfate, ammonium photosulfate, ammonium, Sulfate, ammonia, what that, Andreas, ammonia. You have urea inside of it. Um, I don't think you have any feces though, but you understand what I'm saying. All right. We well, don't know all of that. All right. We don't know all of that. We can now come out of this. All right. Let me just close this thing right here. Um, good. So I don't want to make any changes. I said no. So. Here's how you run this model now. So everybody so far has gotten to the point where, um, all right, wonderful. Everybody is, is really talking online. So here's how you run this model. After you'd have selected your experiments, if you notice under the experiment, you have different, what we call treatments. The first treatment in the bottom thing is saying that you have rain fed, low nitrogen. That means you did not irrigate and you use very little fertilizer. You with me? The other one says rain-fed high nitrogen. That means you're relying on rainfall alone and you have fertilizer. The third one says no, you have irrigation and what? Low nitrogen. Low nitrogen. What that mean? You are irrigating, but you're not using a lot of what? Fertilizer. Come to people, I know lunch is on us. All right. All right, go check it lunch. All right, then the next one is irrigation, high nitrogen, vegetable stress, low nitrogen, vegetable, vegetable stress of, yes, high nitrogen, of vegetation, sorry. Before we run the simulation, of all of these, and I'm going to ask Moya this question, because Moya is not the technical person, so we're going to just see if Moya can guess. So Moya, think about utopia, right? You are the journalist in the room, so you have to help us. What do you think, which of these treatments you think would give you the best yield? You have unlimited water, unlimited fertilizer. You have a little bit of water, a little bit of fertilizer. Which treatment you think would give you? You have to tell me what name, what name? Irrigated. Irrigated, all right. So you see, Maya, Maya not deal with this, none at all. I should get the answer right. All right? 
So everybody, people are saying the answers. Excellent, excellent. All right. So even without, that's why I remember I tell you that modeling is not a replacement of common sense, right? It is to help critical thinking. All right. So we're going to see how right Maya is. So what you're going to do now, you're going to go up to the top and write under help. Under help, you see something mark run. Right under help. Anybody can say yes. Yes, you click run. When you click run, it comes up with another screen. And this time, you now you have to click run model. All right, now don't ask me why. When you click run, it not just run. Maybe it need to walk first, but click run model. When you click run model, it is going to run all of that simulation and it's done in no time. This is where it gets tricky now. You have to click OK. So Dr. J, we're taking the time so people write down the steps, right? So first you click run. Then what? Run model. Then what? OK. Now, when you reach OK, don't say to me, boy, deal me do that, I'm going to see nothing. You're not going to see nothing because you're not, you're not reach a state yet. You have to now move from where you are now because now you're in the tab called model and you have to go to the right of model and click analysis. When you click analysis, you see a total new set of options come up. Everybody see that? Right? If I click back, you see model, but you have to go to the right to click analysis. All right. When you click analysis now, you have to write this down, please. You are looking for plant gro dot o u t plant grow dot out all right everybody with me everybody with me yes dion tell me if anybody online say yes online people can you tell me if you are with me okay so now we're going to click on plant grow dot out when you click on plan grow that out, you're going to click plot. Let's go back again. You click run, run model, okay. Then you click analysis, yes? After you click analysis, right? Now, some of you will find more fancy things because later on, you, will go, you, you might not want to just look at Plant grow. You might want to look at how much nitrogen is leached. You might want to look at how much water is in your soil profile and all of those fancy things. So all of those things I'll show you. I'll show you another little trick later on, but as Jay said, we have to show you the hard way first. All right, so you click plot. And when you click plot, it come up with all your options now. Anything on, write this down. Anything that you see in bold under variables, it means that there is measured data in the field for it. That means you can compare what the model simulates with what you measure. Are you with me? Yes or no? Yes? Anybody on, on think they say yes? All right, let us give them a minute. Yes. George says yes. Um, okay, wonderful. Paulette says yes. All right. Now, if you select all of the options on the left hand side and all of the options on the right hand side, it is going to attempt to graph everything at once. Are you going to be confused? So, my suggestion is choose one variable on the left and determine what you want to look at on the right. Right, Dr. Leo? All right. So, Maya, the brilliant Maya, told us that the one that is going to do the best is irrigation high nitrogen. All right, Simone, which one do you think going to do the worst? Rain fed low nitrogen. All right, so let us select those two options. So on the right hand side under runs, we select rain fed low nitrogen, and we're going to select irrigated high nitrogen. All right. Sarah Buckland is asked, what about vegetable stress, low nitrogen? All right, Sarah, let us do that. Sarah, Dr. Sarah Buckland, my apologies. Dr. Sarah, no problem. Let us look and see which one. Now, on the right-hand side, 
If you want to talk about yield, what option would you select? Yield. All right, let us just cut to the chase. You have to look at grain weight, right? Because it's the weight of the grain that you're really looking at. You with me, Simone? Yeah. It's the grain of the corn that is really the thing. You don't really business with the husk of the corn, right? Unless, unless you're going to make, you're going to lick somebody in them head. All right. <laughs> you could do one or two things. You could look at something called tops weight, or you could look at grain weight. All right, let's go with grain weight. So now, if you want to see a plot, you just click next. All right, so that's simple. Select your variables, select your runs, and click next, and voila, here comes the data. If you look at the bottom of the graph, it shows you what, what did you plot. So, Sister Moya, irrigated high nitrogen is in purple, so you can see that is above everybody else. Uh, that, that reminds me when the Lord said, you shall be above and not beneath, all right? And the one that did the worst, which one did the worst, Simone? The rain-fed, low nitrogen. It did better than the, in fact, the vegetation, the vegetation stress did very well, actually. Did very well. Now, how do you know if your model is doing well? Let me see if anybody's thinking now. You see these dots and these lines. If somebody came in from you, a UFO came from the Mars and asked you, what are these dots and lines telling you? Which of these graphs are, what is the measure data? The line or the dots? The dots is the what? Measured every time. The dot is the measure data. And the sun, because you can't measure every day, right? The model gives you an output every day. That's why you have a line. But the measured data, you have to go in the field every now and then. You're with me, Moya? Everybody with me? All right. So if you look at this, how would you know if the model is doing well? What would you want to see, ideally? Anybody? Anybody online? How would you know if the model is doing well or if it is doing poorly? Very good. Very good. The dots and the lines are close. Very good. But guess what? This stat is better than that. Because if I click statistic on the right hand side, boom. Nobody hearing me? Not hearing. Mike, did you touch something? Can you hear me now? All right. <laughs> so you must look at three things. Your R square, the closer the value is to one, the better the simulation. So if you get a simulation of one R square, the points on the line are indistinguishable. You will not get that. Okay? Because we're not perfect. Your root mean square error, you want it to be as close to zero as possible. And your D statistic, you want it to be as close to one as possible. All right? Now, for the first run, Moya, which was, which was, which was um, the rain-fed low nitrogen, we got a R square of 0.889. We got a root mean square of 318. And we got a D statistics of 0.95. That's good. Look at the other one, which was the irrigated now, run four. Now, run four, if you notice, has 6,000. You see that, Simone and Tiffany? The other one had 1,000. This has a mean of 6,000, all right? The other thing you want to look at as well, for the irrigated one, it has a much higher standard deviation, which means that you can get significantly wider, a greater yield. 
you know, your, 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 your mean is 6,100 plus or minus 3,000. That, that's a big, big difference, right? Your R squared is almost perfect, 0 0.987. If you round up that, that is 0 0.99, right? All right, and your D statistics is 0 0.988, which is 0 0.99 if you round it up. So you're not going to get it better than that, all right? That is, that is not perfect. Now, let me just warn you that when you're using the model, remember I said that you first of all, after entry, you're getting reasonable results before you apply. This data is perfect because they use this data to train the model in the first place, right? We have to do some, some tweaking of the parameters and everything like that to get it perfect. But when they now apply this to other stuff, it worked well, right? But so you have to get the best value. The last one we had there was vegetable stress or vegetation stress by Sarah, all right? Thank you very much for the, the, the concerns and the um, comments. Here we have a R square of 0.972. That's still good, I think, all right? You had a standard deviation of 2,400, which was even less variable than the um, irrigated. And you had a root mean square of 859, um, which was the highest, but if you look at the D statistics, it is 0.97. You with me? Yes? All right. Now, so somebody say, all right, Dean, this look good, but how do I get this graph in Excel? Well, go down below, you see something say export to Excel. You see that on the right hand side, right? So you have statistics, then you have print, then you have export data to text file, and then you have export to Excel. Everybody with me so far? Nobody don't fall asleep yet? All right. If you click export to Excel, right? If you click it one time like I just did, then if you look down the bottom of your screen, you see the graph come up, boom. And it comes up, not just with the chart. Here's the chart that you see before, and you can go through now and go into, um, as they call it, chart design, and you can put in your, your chart element, like your chart axis and all of them kind of things. You see that? Right? You can do all of that inside here. So if you look on statistics, this is the statistics that we had before, right? That is there. And if you look at data, it shows you all the data that was used, both the measured data and the simulated data, all right? So it is, it is, it is in my opinion, very comprehensive, all right? All right. So, so far, so good. Everybody understand what we're doing so far? Yes? yes. Useful so far? Yes? All right. Now, one mistake that people make is to leave this graph up minimize it and go try to run the model again and plot. If you do that, you're going to get an error because it can't run two versions of the graphic tool at the same time. So you have to close it. Everybody with me? All right, now let me show you a little trick now. Now, thank you, George. I appreciate the compliment. Now, if I, if I had gone ahead, Tiffany, Simone, remind me your name again, friend of mine, geez. Yes, Delia, Delia. Delia, and Dion, and Maya, and, 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 and Leo. If I had gone ahead, and everybody else online, if I had gone ahead and click plant grow that out, click plot and click, let me just do that for you. Let me just show you. So if I, if I went here, click plot, because remember we do the runs already, and I just say, select all runs, right? And then, then I come over here and I select everything, right? Plant grow, they say I was a madman, I never know what was going on. Look how the graph going to get busy now, right? In three, two, one, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.001, and we go now. This is what the graph looks like. Can't make sense of the out of it, right? Too crazy, too busy, right? If I went back and say, all right, you know what? That's too busy for me. Let me do one thing and let me select grain weight alone, or, or let's say top sweet, and let me do all runs. It's not as busy this time, but it's still hard for you to see some because sometimes you might have a graph measured data below another graph and they look tricky. You can still do your statistics. If you click statistics, you can still see everything. Are you with me? Yeah. Yes? All right. Now, this works, but here's why it's not perfect. Because you want to see what was not the measured mean. You want to see what was the actual value. You with me, Simone? 
I don't just want to see what is the mean value of the measured and the mean value of the simulated. I want to see what is the, what is the actual value. So here's how you do that now. You come out here and you close this. Don't go plant row this time. Go overview that out. Remember, we're telling you can go plant row that out and all of those things, right? This time you're going to go overview dot out. And it's not a plottable. I'm, 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 Maya, don't, don't take me to task for this one. It's not a plottable variable. It's a viewable one. So this time you're going to go view. And when you click view, it is going to bring up now a text file. Are you with me? Yes? Um, Simon, Tiffany, and Bailey, you remember when, a while ago when I clicked run, um, the, um, Maya, if you remember, it just said run one, but it didn't tell you what run one name. You remember that? In this case now, it is telling you what run one name. You see it? Rain fed, low nitrogen. You all see that? Yeah. Okay. When you go down now, when you take your time and scroll down, you take your time, take your time with the cherry on the top, right? I go down, it is going to give you a summary of what the run is. So it does tell you all the things that went in, everything. And uh, here it is now. It tell you what was simulated, right? The anthesis date is the date of flowering. Um, so what they simulated was 76, what they measured was 75. That is perfection, right? The physiological maturity, how many days the crop took to mature? 127 days. Um, remember 30 days in a year, right? In a month, sorry. So four trees, 12, right? So this is a four month crop. It tells you what was the yield at maturity? 2020, 29, 29. Are you seeing what I'm saying, guys? Yes. yes. So it shows you everything and it does that for every single run. After you finish run one, it come down and it give you a summary again and it go to run two. You see run two now? Run two. Run two was rain fed high nitrogen. You remember that? Yes? Yes. And if you run down the bottom now, you're going to see the same thing. Uh, when you reach way down the bottom, right? You see the same summary again. Now, why is this important? It's important because if you want to know exactly how close your values are to the real value, this is where you come. Um, if I want to do a quick evaluation of where I'm at, I use a graph. But if I want to know the actual values, where I come. All right. So I'm putting some people to sleep. So let me do something real quick. All right. And then we're going to come back after lunch. All right. So here's why this model is cool now. So Stephanie, who is in the back of the room, is a very smart investor. Stephanie goes to, uh, 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 she, she goes to a lot of fears and, and, and she's an entrepreneur. And Simone, she gets some, some, some what they call, um, they have this new variety called Beauregard. It's a, it's the, the, according to them, it's the best sweet potato to go in Jamaica. I disagree, but that is what it is said. So Stephanie doesn't know anything about farming. The man said, this is the best variety to plant. If you can find the right soil, plant it. Now, Stephanie don't have a clue. Stephanie don't know you, so she don't know where to go to get the soil information. But she know that there are different soil types in our community. Where is she going to get the crop from? Say again? What's the soil from that type of No, no, so it, you can't get it anywhere. Aika, everybody have it. You, you can't just go to any farmer. The, the, the beauty about root crops is that it's the refuse of the crop that grows the crop. So for cassava, is a stick that is no more than 8 to 10 inches. Right? When you, when you don't harvest the crop or you limb up the crop, you know, you, you chop off the head of the crop, you use your hand and shake out the, 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 the thing and the tubers are at the bottom. All of that limb is what them chop off and grow back, you know. Right? For sweet potato, it is the stems. And the most energetic part of the stem is the first 12 inches. All right? So you chop that and people just, because it is, it is so viney, 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 them just throw it away. So if you pass a man, uh, I'll give you a joke. I wanted some slips of my, my thing there. I needed like, my... 6,000 slips. And I couldn't find anybody that had that. So I pass a guy say, go around them, them harvesting some slips around there, so, some, some sweet potato. You can take as much as you want. So I went around there, saw the guys harvesting, and I said, sir, 
do you have ganja sweet potato? And him say, yes, yes, man, over there. So, so I looked at it. Boy, I wanted to make sure it was the slip for the sweet potato, you know. So I had my little flashlight and everything. I get my garbage bag and cut it up because I want to make sure that this is all ganja sweet potato. This is all uplifter sweet potato. This is all fire land. I label the bags. So I, 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 I got all the slips that I wanted. Remember, it's a little joke, you know. So they must laugh, right? All right. So, so I get all the slips that I want. So I'm happy now, right? I went, left Clarendon, go all the way to Devon in Manchester to do my, my, my picture measurements and come back now. And the man gone. So I call him and say, all right, look behind the barn, behind, 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 you will see the bugs. So I gone behind, behind, with me look a flashlight phone. I take up my bag, the man, I put one to one in the van. I say, Lord, please don't make nobody come and think, say, uh, any nefarious activity I'm doing. So I now put all the bugs inside. If I was in church, I would have said hallelujah. Inside of the van and drive out. As me drive out, who me see? Police. I say, Lord of mercy, if the man them go. So you see me a fever, she look for my ID now, you know, because me say, if he go stop me, me have to go show him, say, it's a research me, I do. Anyway, they never stop me. So when I reach home, I call the guy, I said, boss, you almost get me in a trouble. He said, why? I said, because as I drive out with the slip, so some policeman, I said, he said, my youth, you must be a Christian or a town man. I said, why? He said, when man a transport weed, then I ride on it. Where you come from? Anyway, nobody not get the joke. All right. All right, so here is what, here is what we're going to part with lunch on, right? And I'm going to make you think about it. So come down on that tools. Follow me now. You have something named crop management, graphical display, soil data, experimental data, weather data, all right? Seasonal analysis, which we'll get to, rotational analysis. Then there's something called accessories, all right? On the accessories now, you have something called introductory simulation, glue, which is an acronym. I won't tell you what it is. We'll come back after lunch. Then there's something called sensitivity analysis. Everybody see that? Sensitivity analysis. Anybody say yes in the chat? Yeah. Good. Click sensitivity analysis. When you click sensitivity analysis, something comes up. Watch me now. If you follow me carefully now. So first thing you have to select is the crop. What crop were we going a while ago? Maize? Nobody don't remember that? Why well, everybody really want to go to lunch? Michael, lunch is here? Yes. All right. Which experiment that we were doing? Anybody remember? We're doing the, if you look on the board, you will see UFGA 82. Zero one. Everybody remember that? Yes, say yes, no people, please. Okay, good. So we go here and we select it. You with me so far? Good. Now, don't select all the runs, just select one run alone. We knew, Maya told us, even before seeing anything, that the best run was irrigated high nitrogen. All right. So we have selected our, our crop. We have selected our, our experiment and we have selected a treatment. Now, Stephanie is trying to find which soil is the best soil to grow this particular corn on. Right, Steffi? Good. So what you're going to do, she's going to click on soil profiles. Soil profiles is on the fields. Everybody see fields? Are you saw a soil profile there? Everybody saw a soil profile? On the left hand side, anybody say yes in the chat, D? So first we selected experiment. We look at what we wanted and then you went under fields. You look at soil profile. Everybody say yes, anybody say yes, great. Now, let me just show you how crazy this thing is, right? As far as the eyes can see, the soils are seen. So that's why I was saying to you, Simone. There is no soil that Jamaica can have that is not here. All right? No. So here the, names are the names are different, but you can see the characteristics of the soil proof. And I'll show you that otherwise. You're more technical, so let me show you that otherwise, right? Anyways, so you can go through and select several soils. So let us select a deep 
um, loamy sand. Let us select a sandy soil. Let us select, um, give me another soil, um, Simon. You are the soil person right here, Simon. Delia, give me another soil to select. Loamy silt. Loamy silt. Silty loam. All right, well, give me another one. Um, here's some other one now. So, all right, we're just, just for experimental purposes. Is, there's another soil called Ashley. I'm going to see if there's one called Tiffany. Um, no, we're not seeing no Tiffany. All right, so I've, I've been selected different soils. You're going to click go. Somebody said vertisol in the chat. Vertisol? Where is that? I don't see vertisol. At the top? Which of them? There's two of them. Typic. All right, we'll try this one. All right, so we click go now, right? So now you have selected one, two, three, four, five different soil types. Remember, people, you can select all 500 if you want to know, right? Stephanie wants to tell the minister. Stephanie is the secretary of the minister. And she wants to tell the minister which soil she must use to grow this variety. And before she could make the investment, right? So she comes to Delia and Delia tell her, try these soils. Under normal circumstances, she'd have to go, Maya, go in at St. Elizabeth, go plant it and see which one fail. You don't have to do that anymore. All right, so you click create experiment. Yes. Well, on the money, well, the lunch is upon us, man. Behave yourself. All right. So you click create experiment and then you click save, right? Very quickly. Once you click save, right, you're going to run the model, right? Remember we did that before? Run the model. All right. We'll go back over the steps to the comma. It says simulations are complete. Once the simulations are complete, now you go to analysis. Remember we did that before. When you go to analysis, now you get a little table, but it's the same thing. We're going to look at plant grow dot out. All right? Because the same thing, the same steps we've taken before. I will click plot. Now, on the right hand side now, what you're seeing is the soils now, right? Because remember, you kept the, the, you kept the same cultivar, right? You with me? All you're looking at is what effect does soil have? So if you did say 50 soils on the right hand side, you just say 50 soils. You with me so far? Remember, no, you know, you can change the plant spacing and, and let this plant spacing be the thing, you know. You can change the genetics. You can change several. You can change your weather file. So if you weren't sure, you could say, I don't know if this, 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 this crop will do well in the St. Elizabeth weather and try to change the weather file too. Right? I'm just showing you one when soil is your variable. You with me? All right, so let's go this last thing now. We're going to select grain weight and we're going to select all runs. Right? And we want to see if they have misled us or if the person say, who said vertical, if they're going to go vertical. Let us see what is going on here in this place. Boom! Which one is that one, given the red one? That is a C O R D 80. Where's vertical? Vertical is the black one. Vertical is the worst one. So we have to charge that person a fine. Okay? All right, the green one did very well. That's low missile. So thanks for that recommendation. Soil specialist, you have earned your keep yeah. and an extra lunch. Um, the blue one is Ashley. Tiffany, we're going to call you Ashley for the time being. You didn't do so bad. All right? All right. So you all see what we're doing, right? Everybody see what you're doing? Makes sense, right? So far, makes sense? Yes? Yes? All right. So, so now... Remember now we know what we just do. Would that take you two days on a normal training? All right? So this is a really quick illustration of the capabilities of the model. When we come back, we're going to do a little review. And then now we're going to go into some other aspects of sensitivity analysis to show you how you can use the model. Yes, you can use it as a tool to predict what will happen before you go invest the money and waste money. You with me? Then we're going to show you now how you can decide how much money you're going to make. Because there are pricing mechanisms in the model 
So after you get your yield, let me turn to the camera. After you get your yield, you can then turn around and say, okay, if my fertilizer costs X, my irrigation costs Y, my labor costs Z, how much money will I make with this crop? Yes? And when does it not make sense for me to continue farming this variety? Or even this crop for that matter. Yes? And then the last thing we will do is something called env G, you can, Michael, you can just write that for me. So we're going to finish on the board, just to I remember. So we're going to do sensitivity analysis, right? Uh, we're going to finish that one. Then we're going to do seasonal analysis. Just write sensitivity, that's good. We're going to do seasonal, and then we're going to do environmental modification. Environmental modification now is what happens under climate change. Yes? So what happens if my temperature increases by one degree Celsius? Like what Michael Taylor was saying and my rainfall decreases by 20%, what am I going to do? What is my yield? Yes? So you can use, that's why it is a decision support system. You can now begin to see what will happen down the road. Yes? In 2025, in 2050, in 2100, should we be planting sugarcane any at all? Okay? Now, for those of you that are morbidly curious, there is something else that we can do, which I don't think we'll have time, which is called crop rotation. Because except for the big farmers, they don't just farm one crop at all. They might start out with some sweet pepper. And when they get the money from that, they plant some carrot and then they plant cabbage. Now, what the model can help you to decide is which crop should you plant first? Because if you farm the cabbage first, you might deplete the nutrients that the sweet pepper want. The model can tell you that too. And it can tell you would, if, if you're better off farming just cabbage, sweet pepper, and then go fallow, which means plant nothing. All right? And the time of year, yes. for the various crops, will be factored into that? Yes, you can, you can change your cropping season altogether. The number of what? Yes. So the model is not a black box. You can incorporate new um, crops in the model. Um, it is incredibly easier to incorporate a new crop into aqua crop than in DSAT. Aqua crop is a water yield response to water model that we did is on the FAO website. So if you go on the FAO and just type in aqua crop, I incorporated sweet potato for the first time in the world in aqua crop and it worked perfectly to the point that FAO has now published it in their journal. Because this model, this software package deals with genetic coding and it is written in Fortran, which is a very old language, right? It is way more difficult for you to incorporate a brand new crop. However, you can incorporate new varieties of the same crop. For example, a group of us just incorporated local, the first authors to incorporate Caribbean varieties of cassava in the model. And it was published big time too. In fact, the picture from the research is the cover picture for the journal. An agronomy journal in America, I don't do that just so, all right? But if you're going to incorporate a totally new crop, you will have to now collaborate with the authors overseas because now you have to get the correct genetic se sequencing. You have to know which parameters. And I'll show you why. It's a very simple exercise. I'll show you why. Because there are some parameters that they name that you have to know what caused this crop to grow, what caused it to mature when, right? And those are standard procedures in the model. If you don't know it, you're going to mess it up. You understand? But it is not impossible. It's not impossible. Right now, we have a good collaboration. The paper that we wrote, we wrote it with the University of Florida, who are the makers of the model. So we have a collaboration. We, they were willing to incorporate banana, for example, um, sweet potato, but nobody wanted to fund it. Because to incorporate a totally new crop into the model is a minimum of 200,000 US dollars. Nobody don't want to fund that. You get me? Oh, the ministry asked me here 
to do some modding for them, I was charging a fraction of a fraction of the cost and they wouldn't do it neither. So we need to start to put our money where our mouth is. If you want the model to work, you have to invest the money. It's as simple as that. Because once you do the investment one time, you're good for life. You're going to save money. You get me? So that is why our develop. That is why, in fact, every time I go to a training, you know who dominate the training? The last training I went to in Griffin, in Georgia, we had 50 people. I was the only one from the Western Hemisphere. Everybody is from Europe, from Europe and Southeast Asia, China. They're investing in them people and then putting the money. Because why? When they come back, they get optimize everything. And we are getting left behind and we're quarreling. We have to put the investment in. You with me? Yeah. We have to do it. We have to do it. And we have now gotten it to a point where up to 2001, there was nobody in Caribbean doing this. At least now, at the Mona campus, there are a group of us doing it. Myself, Jay, Theo. We now can put it online that you can get it. When you see what Jay has done, you realize that we are making it even simple. That you just go on the map and click something and click something and see what the yield going to do. And we are making it such that you don't have to know anything technical about the model at all, right? But the extent to which we can put things in the model is dependent on who is willing to fund the research in the first place that you can get accurate data, garbage in, garbage out, and then you can use it, right? I, I, I was interrupted by a call um, while I was presenting, and it was urgent. I had to ignore it. It came back a second time, a third time, a fourth time. I eventually answered the call. I am now told that an investor that's coming down on the sometime very shortly wants to meet with, with me to discuss modeling for Jamaica. We hope, we hope for once it will be something useful. All right, so you might want to give them a hand. Thank you very much. Um, I want to give the flowers to Mr. Robert Reed, who was online and has brokered this deal. Um, and Robert has before engaged me with RADA. So RADA is trying, pushing really hard to see if this can come. So that's a good place to go to lunch on, right? Yeah. So let's hope it bears fruit. All right, thank you very much. We'll have a break now for 20 minutes. Um, we don't want to keep our onlineers too long. We'll come back, we'll do some more mod, and then Jay will take us out. We'll do the evaluation. You get your certificate in your email, and then we're done. All right, so let's go.
change is all year round. We can't stop it, but we can slow it down. Small islands will feel it the most, especially the people them with the on the coast. We're losing the reefs and the beaches, flooded in the coastal communities. Changing climate, some lifestyle changes we got to make. Emission of gases we have to reduce. Turn off the lights when they're not in you. So much of the warming changes we see are caused by human activity. Chemicals, poisoning in the air. Poisoning in the air. Greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Oh, yeah. This is a warning. Climate change is happening. Really? We've got to do something. I tell you, act now. Oh, yeah. It's not so bad. Yeah, yeah. But when or how? When or how? Climate change is happening right is now. now. Worldwide. See the signs. They all repeat. They all repeat. The global climate change is real. It's not so bad.
stop it, but we can slow it down. Small islands will feel it the most, especially the people them with the on the coast. We're losing the reefs and the beaches, flooded in the coastal communities. Changing climate, some lifestyle changes we got to make. Emission of gas in you. So much of the warming changes we see mm-hmm. are caused by human activity. Chemical poisoning in the air. Poison in the air. Greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Oh, yeah. This is a warning. warning, 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 warning. Climate change is happening. Really? We've got to do something. I tell you. Act now. Oh, yeah. It's not so bad. Yeah, yeah. Or how. Or how. Climate change is happening right now. Hi, my name is Michelle Curling London. I'm a United Nations Volunteer Specialist and I'm speaking of the community of Glenbough. Come with me and let's take a tour of this community and what the volunteers here have been doing to sustain their environment against the impacts of climate change. Welcome to the community of Glenbough, a rural community nestled in the hills of northeast St. Catherine in Jamaica, a community consisting of some 5,000 persons who rely heavily on farming activities for their livelihood. Glengough is known as a community with a strong spirit of self-reliance and volunteerism and have won numerous national community competitions. Like many poor vulnerable communities in the Caribbean, the community of Glengough faces severe threat to their ecosystem and the livelihood of persons due to climate change. Heavy its biodiversity. These are the vulnerable hillsides that pose a threat to life and property in the community of Glengough. Tell us about the work you're doing here, you and your community here in Glengough. We are a very vulnerable community where it rain falls. When the rain falls, it falls heavily. And when there's drought, and longer period, and when there's drought, there's longer period, which cause farmers to suffer a lot and lose a lot of their products. 
Uh, we have a number of projects that we work on, but one of the most important projects that we are now engaged in is the Climate Change Mitigation Project funded by the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program. And we are doing a number of different plans for our development of our community. One of the soil conservation techniques that is being employed on this project is the use of log barriers to help to prevent the soil from slipping. In addition to the log barrier being constructed, the use of growth stakes are also employed. These are used because they will grow very quickly into trees and that will help to hold the soil and stabilize the soil during periods of heavy rain. How did the community become involved in a project of this nature? What motivated the community to become involved in this project? We went and do a survey and we went to a research and we found it on we found this program on the internet and it was a project for global environmental facility program. One component of the project involved training activities, training farmers and the community in climate change, training them in leadership. Tell us briefly how has this project helped in coping with climate change? To do better agricultural practices in this What are you doing? I'm thinking about to plant a fruit tree, like a jute plum. Okay. And what the fruit tree is going to do? Prevent the land from breaking out. Okay. It is hoped that cotton industries will emerge from the cool tree planting, which will provide additional income to the community. A number of participants in this project and what we do we work together as a team today there are over 22 of us in this farm today as we speak doing volunteer work and we go maybe every Tuesday as long as there is sunshine we go into other areas and help a different participant so we learn that volunteer work together we can achieve the goal that we wish to achieve what do you enjoy most about being a volunteer well, the achievements, your achievements, when you do your volunteer work and you 
you see it materialized, you feel happy and you feel proud. And one of the good things about our team here in our community is that on the farms when we go, all of us have this joyful togetherness and work together as a team. And at the end of the day, you feel happy. Don't eat an avocado toast in the morning before watching this video. Avocado may be one of the Let's make a change. A Caribbean primer for teaching climate change. What is climate change? According to scientists, the Earth's climate has been changing for a while, and the role of humans in the rate of the change has been a cause for concern. Climate change affects every aspect of our lives. A series of disastrous climate-related events have been experienced around the world. This makes climate change an urgent issue for all of us, but especially for young people like you who may have to face its most severe effects in the future. Climate change is caused by various natural and man-made factors. Natural factors include volcanic eruptions, Man-made factors, also called anthropogenic factors, include activities resulting from population and economic growth, such as transportation, electricity, or agricultural production. Most times when we refer to climate change today, we are referring to the changes we have seen due to human factors. These activities release greenhouse gases into the air. These greenhouse gases released from human activities increase the natural greenhouse effect which works to warm the earth and sustain life. The first climatic change that is therefore often observed is a long-term increase in average temperatures. Overall, the world has steadily warmed due to human factors since the pre-industrial period. The warming of the world has led to other changes in climate, including in rainfall patterns, storm events, and sea levels. The Science of Climate Change are weather and climate the same? What is weather? When we receive daily news reports from the radio or television, there is a segment for the weather, and we will find out if it may be sunny, cloudy, warm or rainy in our parish and for other parishes. The term weather refers to the day-to-day -day condition of the atmosphere over a specific place. Atmospheric conditions are affected by a combination of factors, such as air pressure, temperature, and humidity. The scientist who studies these atmospheric factors and makes predictions about the weather is called a meteorologist. These predictions or forecasts are usually educated guesses, based on the factors that the scientists study with the help of technological what instruments. What is climate? Climate refers to the average atmospheric condition for a place or region over a long period of time, usually 20 to 30 years. This is generally reliable 
because it is based on data gathered and averaged over many years. Climate data includes sunshine, rainfall, air temperature, humidity, and wind. Climates around the world vary because of differences in the amount of solar radiation received in these areas. Places located closer to the equator receive more heat from the sun because the sun is directly overhead. These places are warmer than the areas closer to the north and south poles where it is extremely cold. Therefore, the Earth is divided into climatic zones based on the amount of sunshine or heat and precipitation received in each area. Countries with similar weather patterns are in the same climatic zone. How does climate affect human activity? The variety of climates that exist influences the variety of life on planet Earth. Climatic conditions help in the formation of various ecosystems on which humans and other organisms depend. Climate influences the development of cultures. This is because our lives are influenced by our geographical climates. People everywhere have adapted in various ways to the climates in which they live. Climate influences our clothing, types of housing, agricultural practices, and vacation time. For example, persons in countries with cold weathers may go to countries with tropical climates during winter. Climate change is taking place globally and regionally within the Caribbean. In the region, some of the evidence for climate change includes warmer temperatures, greater variability in rainfall patterns, rising sea levels, and increases in frequency of extreme weather events such as floods and droughts. Climate change is a very present and real threat and can cause a range of environmental, economic and social impacts for the Caribbean region. Examples of these impacts include coastal erosion, loss of coral reefs, mangroves and other ecosystems, saltwater intrusion into coastal agricultural lands and aquifers, escalation of frequency and intensity of hurricanes or tropical storms, increase in frequency and severity of coastal inundation and flooding, disruptions in precipitation causing droughts and availability of potable water supplies, some islands being rendered inhospitable and expensive relocation and rebuilding exercises in others. If you wear glasses or contacts, you must see this. An award-winning doctor reveals an astonishing, natural way to reclaim the 2020 vision you were born with in record time. Did you know? Vision problems have absolutely nothing to do with your eyes. A shocking link between the eyes and the brain was discovered by researchers in Washington. These studies show that your eyes will deteriorate with each passing year. Even if you wear glasses or lenses. And that's because, they don't do a single thing to actually improve the way your eyes the city put out a statement saying people were trapped in flooded cars. Can we make it through? The Trans-Canada Highway is closed as floodwaters rise. 75,000 homes under orders to evacuate. Damage is estimated in the billions of dollars. It could be days before power is restored. Devastating floods are a continual threat in Canada. As weather patterns change, 
communities are struggling to protect property and lives. In British Columbia's Lower Mainland, there have been two large-scale Fraser River floods in the past 125 years. The region has also seen very high water more recently, reminding us that here too, flooding is a fact of life. Every spring, mountain snowmelt and rain make the Fraser River run high and fast. Sediment carried by the river during these spring freshets is what formed the Fraser River Delta, making it some of the richest land in Canada, both for wildlife and agriculture. Coastal flooding is also a natural event, as winter storms and king tides carry salt water inland. But experts say the lower mainland needs to prepare for larger and more damaging floods in the future. So at present, we have risk on the river from flooding, and this is going to get worse in future for two main reasons. So one is we have climate change, which is changing the flood hazard, the magnitude, the frequency of floods that are coming down the river because of climate change. In the upper watershed, more precipitation, increasing projected flows. This is coupled with changes in the downstream and where we have sea level rise, driving water levels ever higher. On top of this, we are also changing how we use the floodplain. We have more things that we care about in the floodplain today than we did during the last major flood in 1948. And we will have even more things in the floodplain that we care about into the future. All of these things tied together are increasing our flood risk in the region. And so really, this is our time to act. What would a major flood look like in BC's lower mainland? we can get an idea by looking back in time. The Fraser River flood of 1894 was the biggest in written record. At its peak, the river flow was nearly 17,000 cubic meters per second. That's like emptying 400 Olympic swimming pools every minute. In the 1890s, there were several thousand people living in the Fraser Valley, a small fraction of those in the valley today. There were a number of dikes in place. Uh, however, All right, everybody, we're back. Thank you very much for... Can't help it. Thank you very much for joining us back. Uh, we are at the afternoon segment, the final, final, final stretch. I want to thank those of you that have stayed with us. We have 80 persons. I know some people, some persons will join us again, um, even as I speak. How many people do we have on YouTube? One, two? Um, so we're going to go back to where we stopped at, all right? And the last place where we were at was we were doing some sensitivity analysis. And we had made a scenario where Stephanie had bought some corn seeds and was trying to find out what, what soil was the best. Right, Simone, remember that? All right, so I'm going to show you another thing that you can do with the sensitivity analysis, all right? All right, there are several things. You now, so many of you might be questioning, Oh, well, it looks so casual. The truth is that when I go in the field, I cannot dress in three piece suit, right? I feel like a farmer, otherwise they will not accept me. Nine people on YouTube, okay, good. All right, so we're going to go back to, let me see if anybody remembers. It's a quick quiz, right? All right. So if I want to go sensitivity analysis, where do I find the tool? Anybody remember where? On the left-hand side, where? Under what? Let's see if anybody's smart now. It's not, it's not listed there now because we're under tools. So which tab would you find it under? Tools, accessories, utilities, reference, or my shortcuts? Which one? Make a guess. Anybody online can guess? Um, somebody said accessories. Yes, yes, Sarah, excellent. Accessories, okay, great. So under accessories, you go sensitivity analysis. Everybody remember that? Yes? Accessories, okay. Remember now, the first thing you have to do, 
When you go sensitivity analysis, you have to select what? A crop. Remember that? Everybody? Give me some nod head now, please. We'll just come back from lunch. We're supposed to still have some energy. All right, yes. So you can select your crop. After you've selected your crop, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to select an experiment. So let's select the crop. This time, um, Delia, give me a crop you want to plant that we're growing in Jamaica. So we have barley, they're in alphabetical order. Barley, cabbage. Remember, you're going to have to tell me what is going on here, so now we know. So don't select a crop that you don't know anything about. All right, cabbage. Simone, you agree? Cabbage, okay. So let us select cabbage. We have two experiments with cabbage. Experiment one have no stress and this other one have, whoa, one bag of salt. Okay, so with this experiment now, let me explain the second experiment. This experiment is experimenting with planting cabbage at different spaces in different months. You see that? So January, they plant the cabbage at 46 centimeters. January, they plant it at 53 centimeters. January, they plant it at 61 centimeters. You all see that? Then they change and they say, okay, February 46, 53, 61, March, all of that. So you can set up the experiment. However, this is real experiment they do now, you know, because they wanted to find out what is the best plant spacing for planting cabbage. Do you understand what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. Now, one other way you could do this experiment is you could do this one time. You could plant the crop in, let's say you planted it in January. And you did 46 or 46, 53, 61. And then you could go in, you could leave that site, right, Dahlia? Uh, let's say you planted that in, in um, Devon, Manchester, Tiffany. You could go down in St. Elizabeth and do the same thing. And then you could leave St. Elizabeth and you could go in a Clarendon. So you have one site in St. Catherine, one town in Clarendon, one cart in St. Elizabeth, yes? You run the experiment for two crop seasons. When you finish and you get good results, how you know if your experiment is doing well? If the dots are far from the line or close to the line? Close to the line. Can you name me one statistic that you would look at to know if it is doing well? When you click statistic after you run the model. R square, give me another one. Your D statistic. Your D statistic, yes. What, you, you, what, what should your D statistic be close to? One. Excellent. Everybody getting it. Fantastic. Great job, George. Okay. So what you could do, and follow me, cameraman. So what you could do, right, Simone? When you run the experiment for two, a minimum of two locations and a minimum of two crop seasons, you could then... Once you get good results, and this is why it is dynamic, Moya, you could then say, okay, I have a known margin of error. Yes? You can then run the model now virtually and say, I don't want to plant here. I want to plant in Blue Mountains. All you'd have to do is to ask the med service, can you give me the data for Blue Mountains? You call ALMD and tell me, what soil there are Blue Mountain? You with me? Yes? You create the experiment. You run it and see if crop will grow. You get me? And so you don't have to go up a blue mountain, go go to the cabbage and say, fresh, I'll go bite it out. You can't do it before. Are you with me so far? So you need, you need, okay, let me tell you what parameters you need. You, are, you weren't here. So you need, for the, this model, you need four weather parameters. Maximum temperature, minimum temperature, solar radiation, and rainfall. You can have more, but you cannot have less. And you must have solar radiation. If you don't have solar radiation and you have sunshine hours and make service can give you that, you can use that. Because there is an internal calculator in the model that converts solar sunshine hours to solar radiation. You remember the four? What are the four? Solar radiation, rainfall, maximum temperature, and minimum temperature. Now, if you have only the mean temperature, you can use that too. 
Because the mean is the average between your max and your mean. Right? But they prefer max and mean. Okay? Now, so to run a crop model, you need your climate, any crop model. You need your climate, your soil, and your crop management information. Crop management is anything that the farmer determines. The farmer cannot determine the soil. The farmer cannot determine the climate. But the farmer can determine when he plants, whether he's going to irrigate or not irrigate. Are you with me? The farmer obviously determines how close he plants the crop. Are you with me? So this common sense thing, anything that the farmer determined by himself, that is called what? Farm management data. Are you with me? Yes? Okay, so what are the three things where we need to run a crop model again? Your climate. What's the next one? Crop management and the critical one, soil. All right, everybody with me so far? The people online say yes, Dion? Perfect. All right. So no. So let us go back to the top one because this one has too much experiment. So we're just going to take this one that say no stress. Having selected your, your experiment, we are going to do, we are going to repeat what we did before just to emphasize and just to ensure everybody understand. Then I'm going to show you the several different kinds of sensitivity analyses that you can do just to make sure everybody understand what the tool is doing. So LMD, is LMD your work, right? So you're going to help us again, right? Because you have to tell us which, which is the right soil for the cabbage. All right, so we're going to go. If I want to find the soil types on the left-hand side, where do I go to find the soils? Under what? It's right steering in the face. Under fields. And then when I click, what I click on the fields? Soil profiles. Excellent, excellent. Boy, my people online are firing up. I feel, I feel the spirit. Okay, so we're going to click soil profiles. When you click soil profiles, now, lady, tell me which, we're going to select 10 soils now, 10. So you have to tell me now, from top to bottom, which one we must select. Anybody online, you can select a soil. Um, Sarah, tell us what is going on here, please. Um, Steve Maxime, please tell us what is going on. Somebody said loam. Loam and clay loam. All right, so let us look for loam. So we have clay loam and we have loam. Remember, you have all kind of different clay loam and loam, you know, so don't just stick at the top. Let me go down a little bit and you tell me some more. Um, Savannah is a good one. Delia? Savannah, she says no. Savannah is, and this is Savannah and Adamar. All right, let's go down a little further. Sandy loam. All right, let us see. Nikisha says sandy loam. Okay, Nikisha, let us find the sandy loam. Where is the sandy loam? I don't see any sandy loam right here. Sand. Sand is going to give us trouble, but we will select sand anyway. Um, I don't see any sandy loam, though, D. I see loamy sand. Oh, we see Lucy. Lucy sand must be good because Lucy is, 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 is not really an over still. All right, let us go down a little further. Um, Rodika will be keeping track of how much soil I select already. Lucy Loam. All right, let's go down to the bottom down here, so. Vertisol failed us the last time, so we're not going back to no Vertisol again. Um, let us see, let us see. All of these. So you can name the soils that you name, you know. So if you wanted to, you see what I'm saying? Um, the, um, Simone, you can, Simone, you can create your own soil profiles and name them, you know. All right, so that is a. I created one called Chudley Clay Loam to represent the red soils in in um in Manchester. Say it. Yeah, I created that one for the profile in the Accra Crop for Devon Manchester. Yes, man. Me know what going on. Me not too bad. All right. So silty loam. Let's try silty loam, not filthy loam. Not to be this. I'm um, confused with filthy loam. Um. What other one we're going to try? Mill hopper fine sand. No, mill hopper fine sand is, is very good for Irish potato, apparently. Lady, you're not helping me, no. Give me another soil. We need two more. 
upland soil. I don't know what upland soil is or maybe it's downland soil. Oh, let's just try a clay soil. Silty clay. Silty clay, you know. Dion, anybody has given us any other options online? No more options online. My online people have gone. Sandy Clay. Okay, where is that? Um, up, down. From where I'm now? Yes. Sandy Clay. All right. Third from bottom is Sandy Clay Loom. All right, we need one more. One more. Going once, going twice. All right, them have got one called black soil. Black people are always good. I will check black. We don't know what it means, but we detain black. All right, after you do that, what you must click? Modeling is about three things. What to click, when to click, how to interpret. So what we're going to click now? Go. All right, you click go. And then what? Nobody remember? Look at your notes. Remember Dr. J say so you have to take notes in you know? the Dr. J, they're not taking any notes in you know? the Dr. J. Tiffany, you're supposed to tell us because you were writing like the scribe. Ask the rapporteur if you're not sure what to click after that. Create experiment. If you never write it down, write it down now. After you click go, you must click create experiment. All right. How do you know how many soils you have selected? Right now, looking on this table, how do you know? Where are the soils? Selected soils on the left hand, very good. So you click create experiment, and then you click what? Save, very good. Click create experiment and you click save. After you do that, then you click what? Please don't let me down now, people. What you want to do now? Run the model. Yeah. You want to run the model. Not run it away, no. You want to run the model. Okay, and then what? Okay. okay, very good. Now, how are you going to see your results? Analysis, very good. Dion, you see, see as if you could come and teach this course right here, so no. Analysis, and what we're going to look for on the analysis? Anybody remember? Look at your notes or ask Maya. Plant grow dot out. Plant grow dot out. We click plant grow dot out and then what? And then plot. Good. We click plant grow, click plot. Oh, it's a, my bad, see? I'm a, a teacher and I make, I make a mistake. So what I did was I should have closed this other version of G bill that is running. Um, let me see what it is now. Um, do, 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 do. Trying to get this to close. Close window. All right, good. Let's go back here. Plot. <coughs> All right, where are our soils now? Let me see if anybody's smart. Where are the soils now? On the left hand side or the right hand side? Right hand side. All right, if you want to see what all the soils are doing at the same time, how, what's the quickest way to do that? Select all runs. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. George Emanuel, George Emanuel is on fire. And Paulette too. All right. Now we're going to look at grain weight. Now this is what? This is... um. This is cabbage, right? So if you look at top sweet, because it's the top of the, of the thing, there's the real thing, right? All right, so, so don't look at green number and go, and go click green number, you know, you're not going to get any green number for cabbage, right? You have to click top sweet. So we'll click top sweet. We have already selected all runs, I will click next. Now look and tell me which of those soils gave you the best yield. Sandy Clay, what is the highest yield you get? Approximately? 
How many, how many kilograms per hectare? 6,000. So that's roughly about six tons per hectare. All right, so here's the, here's the experiment that everybody going to know. Quick, quick, quick. Go back, repeat the experiment, choose some different soils and see who can get at least eight tons, right? So if you're online, go back, you close the thing, close the window. All right, so let me show you how to do that. You're going to close the window. When you close the window, you're going to go back. You don't need to. So you close the window. So you come up here, right? right? And you're going to go. You can just go back. Just click back. Click back, right? And click close the window. When you click close the window, make sure you close G bill and you're back here, all right? Close this part. Remember what you want to do? You want to select soil. So you've already selected the experiment. So just click on the soil profiles again. You see that? And select a different set of soils now. Be smart about this. You want to select all kinds of different soils because a while ago we selected soils that were similar. You with me, Simone? Yeah. So don't select two sand and two this. Select as many soils as diverse as you can. Select about 15 different soils. And let's see the first person that can get eight tons per hectare, all right? Or 8,000 kilograms per, he per hectare, all right? That is your optimization exercise, all right? So, and when you get it, tell me which sun, which soil gave you the best yield, all right? This is the real life experiment now. That is how you would do it in real life. All right, and you have, you have five minutes. Let's set a timer. Which page? The one to select the soil. You need to go back to the page. Tell me again, Hugh. All right, so somebody's asking how you get the page. All right, remember now. Let me just, let me show, so, so show you something quick, Kaylee. If I'd selected the soil already and I run here and I run the experiment, I'll go create the experiment. And I just click save and I say, okay. And I run the model. I'm showing you where you were before. You run the model and you do analysis. I go plant grow that out, right? That's where we were before. And you plot. When you finish plotting and you get the experiment and you select all your runs and you go here, that's where we were before, right? These are all the soils that we had before. I click next. You get this, right? All right. When you want to go back to the to select the soil, watch me carefully. First of all, click back, then click close. Make sure you write that down, close. And then you go up here and close G bill because if you try to run it again, you cannot run two versions of the... Which link? No, you, you wouldn't have a link to this model because you'd have to download the model. And you need at least 500 megabytes of space to do that. I think I said that at the start. All right, so there's no, you're not going to see this model in the chat because you have to get a unique license from the DSAT Foundation for yourself. All right? That's the question they were asking, D. Anyway, let us just finish this. So you close G Bill, right? And what you're going to do is you close this other window. And since you're here now, and at this point, you have the experiment on the right, the soils on the left, you want a new set of soils. So you're going to kick soil profile and then select a new set of soils. But 
make sure you deselect the soils that you had selected before. Otherwise, if you select 14 plus the ones that were there before, you're going to end up with 22 soils. You with me? So you have to go back and uncheck this, uncheck this, uncheck that, go down, uncheck, go down manually, right? And uncheck. Another way you could do it is just say clear data before and it will go back. But you can do that as well. All right, I trust that answers the question, Dion. All right, good, thanks. So Elroy, Elroy, are you saying that you got 24 tons per hectare? Really? Or are you just saying 24 soils? Tell us what you're saying, Elroy, please. Um, where do you go? You have the um, thing that queued up. All right, so we're back here. Um, anybody got it? Nobody got it? Tiffy, Tiffy, what you get? What's the best value you get? You want to look at the yield, yes. On the graph. Remember you have to plot the graph after you run the experiment. If you're not sure, you can go back and instead of plotting the graph, you can go to overview. You remember I show you that? So you can go overview and see the exact value instead of plotting the graph. So for those that are looking, let me just show you what I mean. So I'm just going to select some random soils here just for the, just for the sake of thing, just to show you what I'm talking about. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine. Let me run down here so and select some just some random ones just to give myself some options. Ten. So I would then go to go. I have twenty one soils. I say create experiment. I click save. Everybody knows to do that already. And I said, okay, I want to overwrite the soil. Um, then I say, run the model. Because it has 21 soils, it takes a little while to run. So you have to note that the simulations are complete. Now, because I don't want to estimate from the graph, right, Leo? 
I want to see what the actual value is. What I do is click analysis, but instead of plotting on this occasion, I'm going to click overview dot out. Yes. When I click overview dot out, I can't click plot. What should I click? View. Very good. When I click view, coming up with 250 meters to go to the finishing line are the values. And I slip down to the bottom and I see what my actual yield is. Yield at maturity, right? It says 20. This one said 20. All right. Um, so that's good. And this is kilograms. All right, that is very small. Remember the, the, the value that we got was 6,000. So I can go all the way through and I look at, can look at each of them individually, all right? Individually, my yield at harvest. Go all the way down. I, I selected some really horrible soils for cabbage because I'm getting like six tons per hectare and we had 6,000 before, so that doesn't make anything. But I'm just showing you how you would actually do it, all right? All right, so we, in the interest of time, we're going to move on to something else. All right? Anybody have any questions, any comment on that? Yes, Dahlia, you have to use a mic though, please, for the purpose of the person who are online. So I was just wondering, um, can you populate um, this particular um, software with other data, so I'm thinking of um, soil types that are specific to like Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Can all you all right, don't move, don't move. Stay right there. Because we get these questions all the time. All right, so let me show you something. Um, where's Simone? Simone, you have to stand, stand beside her, Simone. Sim? No. Oh, you're on the call. All right, so here's, here's, here's where you go. So look at what I'm doing, right? Look on the screen. Oh, you have to go back. All right, go back. Go back. Let me show you. So everybody asking me, can you put in your own soil? And the answer is yes. How you do that? When you look under here where we had crops and all of these kind of things, there's something called data. Is it data? Under data, you see soil. Is it soil? Okay, so click soil. Under soil, you see a bag of files open up on the right hand side now. If you click any one of them and scroll down to the bottom, you see the characteristics. I can, I can go here, for example, and I can I click and I can say view file. And it shows you all the characteristics that made up that soil. Now, this that has 990,000, almost a million codes. All right, but all of these codes are in a file called DSAT codes that you can find in documentation. So to find out what the SALB mean, you can find it. Okay, so you could go in and create your file. On the left most column, 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, 90, 105. All of those are soil horizon, 15 centimeters, 30 centimeters. We know that is where most of your soil roots, roots are concentrated, yes? So ideally when you're creating a profile, right? you need at least five soil horizons. So most of the time, we just have two horizons. Um, but when you're doing this kind of detail work, you need information at, at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight horizons, eight different levels in the soil to ensure, are you with me, Simone? To ensure that you understand what's happening both at the, soil, at the surface and below. You with me, Delia? Good. All right, so this is how you would do it. And you could go in, you could select any soil right here, right, yeah. Delia? Yeah. And you could just save your information over this and call it whatever you want it, Jamaica, blah, 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 and boom, it's inside. All right, it's that simple. All right, all right, cool. Um, just to show you also something else, since you raised that point, let me show you, you were asking, I know um, Simone is busy, but let me show you, for those of you that, that have time. All right, so here is, here's what would happen if you wanted to put a totally new crop into the model now, right? So let me show you this one now. 
So let us say that I, 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 had, I, I, I wanted to put sweet potato in the model. Sweet potato is in Accra crop, but not in DSAT, right? Thanks to the UA work. What I would have to do is to go into root crop. It's a root crop here, right? Everybody's a root crop? Everybody on, 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 online say root crop, Dion? Nobody don't say it. We have to wait until somebody online say yes. Good. What you're going to do now is you're going to click on cassava. And then you're going to see a number of different files come up. Let me explain these. There's a file called CUL. There's a file called ECO. And there's a file called SPE. Let me explain. When you're going to bring in a new cultivar, which means a different variety of the same crop. That is when you touch your CUL file. You with me? So if, for example, I was going to bring in, I was bringing in um, the bra 383. And usually for cassava, the first three letters gives you where the variety is planted or comes from. So BRE was for Brazil, for example. And then the three A trees as a descriptive number. I had to go inside here in the CUL file. Now, if you are going to bring in not just merely now a different variety, but a different crop, a different crop now, which means now it is a root crop, but it is not cassava. Then you go to your eco file. Yes, Dion? You? Okay, they weren't hearing me. All right, so let me go again. If you were putting in a cultivar of a crop that exists already, you touch your which file? Your CUL. If you're bringing in a new variety, a new crop that belongs to a particular category, you go to your eco file yes so those are the two files that you play with you do not touch the species file at all because that is genetic coding that me and you don't know nothing about right so don't mess with the people then bring the file none at all as we say in jamaica so let me show you what is in the cul file now for example this is just for those who are morbidly curious all right so you click view file and the best thing to view this in, to not get mistake, is Notepad++ and not Notepad, all right? Um, way better. I was using Notepad, and it was crashing my model night after night until I called somebody and they explained to me, do not use Notepad, use Notepad++. And here comes Dr. J, which is coding information. All right, so if you use Notepad, or any other standard um, DOS based systems. What typically happens is that those systems actually put a return correct at the end of the, the file. So when you make your modifications or you build the file, it puts a different carriage return. When you come back now to DSAT, who is actually trying to use the Unix based system, it tosses an error because it can't handle it. So for all intents and purposes, Notepad, there's something called TextPad. But do not try your best not to use a native Notepad that's on, on, on in Windows. You could even try WordPad sometimes, but Notepad plus plus or TextPad or some other um, system that gives you enables you to save um, in a Unix-based um, system. And if you use Notepad, ensure that when you're saving, you select the Unix option, not the MS DOS option at right. the bottom. All right, perfect. All right, so this is where you're going now. Now, if you look at this, is now talking about cassava. Now, let me just show you, talk to you very, 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 very quickly. This is what I had to do for the four varieties of cassava. All right? You notice there are 21, I think. 21. Simone, this, Simone you can talk now? Oh, she's still on. There are 21 different parameters. Okay? Plus, in the eco file, there is another series of, 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 of arm. There's another series of, of, of cultivar coefficients. So you imagine now, you have to be adjusting these. Maya, and when you adjust one and it fits something, something else out of work. So this is what, this is what you call torture. 
You have to go through one, through one, through one, through. But they have something called GLUE, G-L-U-E, which stands for Generalized Likelihood Uncertainty Estimator, which is something that allows you to get a rough estimate of what the parameter should be without you having to do one by one by one. Anyways, this is what the, the Gore thing looked like, all right? So this is how challenging it is, but that's why you have UE, right? So you don't have to do that. You tell us what you want to do. You give us the money and we do it. All right. One last thing with sensitivity analysis, and then I'll leave that. And according to Michael, we go to seasonal and then environmental. And those are really, really quick. All right. Um, so beyond 15 more minutes and then I'm done. All right. Give me a time, time signal, time check, please. All right. So let us do, we're going to do a different crop now. All right. Let us go and let us do potato. Um, for some reason, Jamaica is importing potato. I don't know why, because we have the best weather all year round. But so it is. Um, so let us do potato, and we are going to look at the Atlantic potato. All right, remember, when you're doing mock optimization, because, Tiffany, you want to see the effect that the different things have, you cannot optimize three things at the same time. Yes? So if I want to see data, which gas gives me best mileage, I have to drive the same car. I can't drive a BMW and a Benz and a Toyota because that is then putting different, um, in, inducing different levels of variability in the study. I have to buy from the same gas station, I have to put the gas in the same car and drive and see. You with me? So therefore, choose one cultivar or one experiment. On the left-hand side now, this time I'm not going to choose, um, I'm not going to choose planting soil profiles. <laughs> what I'm going to do on this occasion, I'm going to look at weather. Yes? And now, here we go now. You have several different weather files, way over 500, right? So let us say now, Delia, you weren't sure, Tiffany, which weather is the best weather to grow this plant. You could create your weather files in DSAT, you with me? And then go and, and choose any number of weather files and see which one gives you the best yield. You with me? All right? If I had the time, I would let you take a shot at it, but I'm just going to do it really quickly. All right? So we have one, two, three. Let me go on again. GR, G -A -G -R is Griffin, Georgia. All right? So we select two Griffin, Georgia. Let us see if we can get another file. Um, um, yeah, I'm trying to find something near Jamaica. All right, I see something from Ottawa. Ottawa is in Canada, which is renowned for good potatoes. I was looking for Lima in Peru, which is the sweet potato capital of the world. I have not seen Lima. Um, all right, so. Remember, the steps are the same, right? After you select your, your treatment, what you select after that? Come to people quick. Go. Then what? Create experiment. Then what? Save. Then what? Well, a duplicate's not allowed. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What did I do? More than one? I don't know. Let me let me go back. I'm not sure what I did. Let me go back to sensitivity. Let's do that again. We were looking at potato, I think. Potato, potato. Um, let's look at any experiment here. Uh, I don't want that one. Let's choose this one. Uh, no, not that one. Or this one, this experiment. We chose Atlantic, and we want to look at weather files. We choose this one. Let's go down far and choose another one. Let's go down far again. What happens is that for each year of your experiment, so if you put um, University of the West Indies, and has data, University of the West Indies 1990, all the way down to 2025. It is going to create a weather file for each year 
for called University of the West Indies. So you have to be careful. All right. So just to show you quickly, um, Cadu is a place in the United States. All right. Let's see if this works now. We click go. We click create experiment. Let's hope Murphy's law don't catch us again, Dr. J. We click run model. Does it work? Yes. Simulations are complete. What we're going to know after simulations are complete, anybody? Analysis. We'll go analysis. We're going to go plant go that out and plot, right? Might remember that? Yes? Yes. Good. So here are the how the quickest way to select all the runs. Select all runs. All right. So remember now it's Irish potato. So if it's Irish potato, what would you select on the left hand side? Let me see if anybody thinking. What would you select, people? Yes. All right. So you select all the root weight. If you don't see root weight, it's a tuber weight is the same thing. All right. So let us see it. root weight. All right. And then you click next. Everybody with me? Yes, Simone. Very simple. When you go into the field, when you go into the supermarket, and you take up an Irish potato, you are getting the Irish potato that is not oven dried. That's a fresh weight. So that's the weight you get when you take it straight from the field. When we are doing experiments like this, we have to dry the potato. Why? Because different variety retain different amounts of water. So if I want to have a true um, assessment of the starch that is in it, I have to dry, bring all of them to constant weight. So that you, if so, so for example, Simone, if I take you right now and weigh you versus she, because your body have, have more water than she, you might weigh heavier, but not necessarily because you have more meat. So it's the same thing with the fruits, right? So we always encourage dry weights because you dry out all the water so you know that what is there now is real starch. All right? All right. Very good question. Um, in some cases, there are some crops Okay, so the question is, why do we select root weight instead of tuber weight? There really isn't any difference. It depends on the crop. It depends on the crop. If you plant Irish potato, Irish potato is not a root. Irish potato is a tuber. Sweet potato, on the other hand, is a root crop. Um, carrot is not a root crop. Carrot is a tuber, all right? So when you're looking for what to plot, make sure you plot the right thing, all right? So sweet potato is not a potato, which is why in 1979, Americans don't call it sweet potato. They call it sweet potato, it's one word. If you look in any American journal, sweet potato is not two words, it's one word. In Jamaica, we have sweet potato. It's not a sweet version of a potato, it is sweet potato. You with me? Because it is a root as opposed to Irish potato, which is not a root, it is a tuber. You with me? So you have to know that a little bit of agronomy before you go select the sum. So thank you for the correction. We must really select tuber with, because it's not that root, it's a tuber. Everybody with me so far? Yes, good. So we select tuber with, deselect root with, and we click next. Everybody with me so far? Boom. All right, so tell me which of these climate is the best one. Uh, clearly, it's the blue one. What the blue one name? Cado. All right. Cado is somewhere in the United States. No, is it? No, I actually think it's in India, if I'm not mistaken. Anyways, you get the drift, right? Yeah, but remember, no, we know. Remember, we can only optimize on one thing at a time. Remember that? You can't change the soil and change the weather at the same time because you don't know which one. So you first of all have to do it step by step. If your first instance you want to find which soil is best, select the soil, run all your soil, get the best soil, and then change the weather after that. Because you can't, if you change two things at the same time, you won't know which one is really causing the change. Remember that? So you have to change one variable at a time. You all remember that? Remember we spoke about that? All right? It's just like, it's just like you go to the gas station and your car, your, your car is acting sluggish. And you change the oil, I you change the gasoline, I you change the spark plug, you won't know which one did cause the, the, the difference. 
It's better you change the spark plug and leave the gas on the thing there and see which one. And then you change it, change it. You get me? It's the same thing. All right? All right, good. So we've done that part. All right? And just to show you um, again that you can change other things. So, for example, if you click on planting, you could go inside here and change when you plant. And say, I don't want to plant on the 1st of August. All right? I want to plant on another day. And I want to increment it every two days. And I want to do 10 iterations. And what the model will do for you, Dahlia, it would change your planting day by two days, 10 different times. You're with me? So you're saying, don't plant on the 1st. Start planting on the 8th. It will do that. Then it is saying, okay, how many incremental days do you want me to change it by? So I could say seven days. So it would go the first, the eighth, the 15th, you with me? Like that. And then I, and it say, how much time do you want me to run this experiment to show you the best day to plant? And I say, run it five times. You with me? So that is how you do that, right? You could do the same thing for plant population. The farmers can tell you this, Simone. You want to know how many seeds can you put in a particular area, square area, right? That is important. You can also do planting depth, right? Planting depth is important. For example, for, for um, little camera, for crops like Irish, for sweet potato, when you plant in a sweet potato slip, if you plant it down in the ground vertically like this, you get the least yield. You have to plant it slant way, 45 degrees, so at least two nodes go into the ground. Preferably three, because the node is where the, the, the root and ultimately the tuber is going to grow from. All right? So you have to plant it plant. When you plant in cassava, you plant it the same way, 45 degrees. Right? Now, sometimes the more you put down in the soil is the more cassava you're going to get at the more sweet potato. So planting depth is important. So you can alter the planting depth and see which one gives you the most yield. Or you can plant, alter the row spacing, which is now the distance between one and the other. That is important because the vines run all over the place. So if they are too close together, they get entangled. They compete with each other for light and water, and you end up reducing your yield. All right? All of these things you can test in the model. Useful or not useful? Very useful. Excellent. All right. So we're done with the sensitivity analysis now, right? Um, so let's go to something else. Um, Dion, any comments online? Ariel has a question. What is Ariel's question? All right, let's see. Um, I have not seen it. Say again? What time is it? 1 4 to 4 p.m. Okay, let me see. Um, my chat is not working very well. All right, hold on. All right, 1 4 to 4 p.m. I'm not seeing a 1 4 to 4. After you optimize each component, can you do a run with the optimized level of each to determine if there could be any impact on the outcome based on this component? For example, if the optimum time to apply fertilizer is after six weeks and you are doing a solid fertilizer that depends on the rainfall to dissolve, but the optimum rainfall is needed, is needed in the establishment period. Can you run the model then with both levels of optimization, see the interaction, or can you determine the level of interaction? The answer is yes. You can also, you can do multiple criteria eventually, but that's another level, all right? So what I'm showing you is how to do it individually. But there is a way that you can go through. You could select um, fertilizer. You could then go back through and you could select something. And I'm going to show you one. Um, but you don't do it in sensitive. There's another way to do it. Okay, so for example, one of the things that I did, I wasn't sure, raise the camera again. I wasn't sure, Simone, what level of fertilization would give me the best yield. So I went five, um, five um, what was it, kilogram per hectare, 15, 30, 35, or whatever pounds, whatever it was, to see at what point saturation would be reached, at what point I'm wasting the fertilizer. You with me? And I did that and I ran the experiment. And then I could do the same thing for so, so the answer to your question, Ariel, and Ariel will call her leader.
because she's always asking the best questions. Yes, you can do that. You can run the experiment and you can, you can have several different interactions. Um, the question is, can you go on YouTube and watch the webinars over and over? I'm not sure why you'd want to see me, my ugly face again, but yes, you can. And you would get all the experiments as well, all the presentations as well. So the answer is yes. All right, let me just show you, somebody mentioned something. So let me just show you one other thing. Um, the question was asked about, about um, things. So let me show you something now called seasonal analysis. So remember I told you that you had experiments, you had seasonal, you had sequence. All right, you have something, yes, Dean? Another question? You want to ask a question? Time, one minute. All right. Um, Simone, you could also do spatial analysis in this thing as well, right? But we don't have time to go through that. Let's go seasonal analysis. Seasonal analysis, we're going to go to the same experiment that we had a while ago. UNFGA8201. When you click it, you see the same thing come up. Rain-fed high nitrogen, rain-fed low nitrogen, blah, 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 all of those things. Just keep looking at your screen. All right, you're going to see a different set of things come up now. Seasonal analysis now is when you have a lot of data, like 30 years worth of data. And you want to see how the crop yield vary over time to have the likelihood of failure and all of that, right? So you could ask the service, give me the longest time series. I want to see what really happened. So watch me now. I'm going fast now, you know, so you have to follow me. Same steps, right? You click run. When you click run, you click run model. When it finished running, you're going to see a different, different table come up. But just watch it. It's not difficult. You click OK. So far, everything looks alike until you click analysis. When you click analysis now, <coughs> a different thing come up. Watch this now. So now, <coughs> you see all the things telling you, reps, 30 minutes, 30 years. Everybody see that? Yeah. All right, so you click OK. When you click OK, you click Save. When you click Save now, this fancy table come up. Watch me now. I'm interested now in my yield, all right? Because I want to see what really happened. So I'm going to go down to some mark harvested yield on the left hand side. Just follow me, people, because my time is up. Harvested yield. And I go plot. Watch me now. When I go plot, it shows me that the Maya, you remember you were saying run number four would give you the best? Remember we said that? Because if you look at it on the left hand side, it is saying harvested yield is run number four. Everybody follow me so far? You can see that also, but because the red dot tells you the average. So you can see the red dot for, 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 for run four, you see that Simone, is higher than everybody else. You could have seen that, right? If you also notice, right, for Sarah and everybody else that's online, that the, the run number four has a fairly small, comparatively speaking to run number one and two, variability. So the top of the blue bar is the maximum that you can get. The bottom of the green bar is the minimum that you can get. If you notice the rain-fed one, it has a lot of variability. Sometimes you can get as high as 7,690, and another time you can get almost 600 and something. You see that? Everybody see me? Depending on the rainfall, all right? All right, now watch this now. If I go back and I say, you know what? I'm not interested so much in the yield. I want to see how much money I can make from this thing. Move from biophysical and now click economic. When you click economic now, right, you're going to go over on the right hand side and you click plot. And automatically now what you're getting on the left hand side of the graph is how much money you make per hectare. Everybody see that? Yes or no? Yes, anybody online say yes, D? We have to wait until somebody online say yes. Anybody online? Perfect. All right, so watch me now. Remember, you just look and see which variety, Maya, which treatment gave you the most money and which treatment gave you the most yield. All right, watch me now. But we we'll just get a new minister of agriculture. And the minister wake up overnight and say, all of a sudden, farmers have to pay more money for water. Watch me carefully now, you know. watch me now. So you go into economic, and here's a thing called edit the price file. So you have one year, so to view the price file, follow me carefully, people, please. You click this one, watch me now. It is now telling you what you have for each. P1, P2 are those different prices. So it's telling you what your harvest is, so you could have changed your harvest price, you could have changed your base production cost, 
which would be like a labor cost, you could change your fertilizer cost. Because this was about water. Remember, Maya, it was either rain fed, irrigation, or vegetable, vegeta vegetable stress, or vegeta vegetation stress. Lord. All right, so the minister decided that I'm going to change the cost of water now. So instead of 50 cents per millimeter of water, the minister decided that it's $50 per millimeter. Watch what is going to happen now. Remember, Maya had rightly selected that irrigated high nitrogen gave us the most money and the most yield. So I'm going to put in $50 now. Watch me now, $50. And I'm going to go on the bottom left-hand corner and I'm going to say, apply to all runs. Everybody see that? Apply to all treatments. Everybody see that? I need somebody online to say yes. Tell me, give me the thumbs up when somebody online say yes. Apply to all treatments, great. Apply to all treatments and say yes. Click OK and come out and save, right? Save. Now you're going to plot now. Remember the last time we plot, treatment number four gave us the best return. Remember that? Look at what happened now. When you plot now, which one? What, what treatment number four give you now? The worst. Which one give you the best return now? The rain fed. Why? Because you don't have to pay no money. You get what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying, people? Yes? Now, if you went back and decided to look at yield, for example, because what we were looking at a while ago was money. Let's look at the yield, harvested yield, and do a box plot. Plot. Um, again, you can actually see we need to do the, the change here, so, right? But that is showing you that you can, you can actually make this change. Now, <laughs> she wants us to edit that? Okay, okay. All right, I'm going to show you one other thing, something called strategic analysis. Now, what strategic analysis does? Because sometimes, if you, let me just show you this. Just look back at this again. Economic, a we plot. Look at this. The rain-fed high nitrogen and the rain-fed low nitrogen treatments one and two. Can you look at that and tell me which one you would advise the minister to do? You cannot tell with the naked eye. You realize that? Because they're very close. Anybody following me? Anybody online say yes, D? I'm waiting until somebody online say yes. All right, perfect. So what the model does, it gives you an opportunity to see how you can really know. So go back, and instead of pressing economic, press strategic. When you press strategic, it comes up with a table. All the treatments that is not optimal says no, and the one that is optimal says yes. Are you seeing that? Yes or no? Yes. So it takes the guesswork out of your work. You don't have to try and guess which one is the best because sometimes looking at a graph does not tell the full story. And, and, and not all of us like graphs anyway. All right, so that's the J coming to run me off the stage. All right? Literally, in 30 seconds now, 30 seconds, literally. Let me show you something now. So in 30 seconds now, right, Dion, start counting the seconds. Let's go back to the very first experiment that we did. Very first experiment that we did. And we talk about UFGA8201. You remember that one? Yeah. All right. I'm going to select that one, the same one with the high nitrogen, low nitrogen, medium nitrogen, the same one that our brilliant Maya was able to guess. All right? Without even thinking. All right, we're going to right click on it and we're going to click edit file. I'm just showing you, I'm not going to do anything. All right, so when you click edit file, right? When you go under environment, there's something called environment. Under environment, you have fields, which is where you would select your weather station, you have initial conditions, you have soil analysis, and then you have something called environmental modifications. Everybody see that? Say yes. Do you tell me when somebody online say yes, please? Anybody say environmental modification? Nobody online say yes, perfect. Click. Here's where you would go in and make your changes now, right? So now, Simone, this is where now, if you realize that your weather is changing daily, you could go in and say your temperature is going up by one degree, you'd have to put a plus 1.0. Or if it go down, you put a minus 1.0. If your rainfall is going up by a certain percentage, you put the percentage. You with me? But you can remember now, weather don't just change linearly. 
So you could have an increase in your temperature and a de decrease in your rainfall. You can do several different combinations. You can change your solar radiation and all of that. And just to see what effect it will have. Right? The, the one weakness of this, which is what AquaCup overcomes, is that it does not tell you how the daily increase in CO2 will go. All right? It says, tell me which year you want to look at. And you say, I want to see what will happen in 2050. But the crop don't just move from CO2 now and then boom to 2050. It has a daily continuum, right? But there's a way that Jay is figuring out with through some magic that you can actually find a way to get the output from aqua crop into DSA. But we are the first person that went to that. And then you can get the daily values. But that's it. Um, folks, thank you so much for bearing with me and the long suffering and the suffering and all of those things. My time is up. Take care. You can clap me off, you know, not that I did a good job, but clap me off. Something illegal. You hear me now? Let me see.
Hey, uh, are you hearing me? No. Yeah. All right. Good. So, They left me with Murphy and Murphy was going to create havoc. So I'm about to share my screen. So if you bear with me just a second, I'm sharing my screen. Um, here we go. Can you see my screen? I still intend to end this at 2.15. Yeah, man, I get some yeses, man. All right. So we've gone through Smash, we've gone through Real TMS and we've gone through CSAC. Um, just in case, just in case, all right, just in case you haven't seen it. All right. Remember we said, you know, we could view sensors last time and it, it wasn't really running the way we wanted it to run. And it comes in every minute. It is going to come in every minute. All right. The challenge we were having, and you'll see change, just changed a while ago. The challenge we were having earlier was not this overall setting, but the setting from the service provider. So the service provider was down, so it sent data on batch once the service provider came back. So within a region, we have you know, English speaking region. We generally have two providers um, that use a single backbone. So if one fails catastrophically, we have no redundancies. All right, so that is, it for real TMS, you can see the values coming in and, and, and think, all right? Now, for the rest of this time that we're here, we'll be talking about um, 
AgriAccept. And when we're talking about AgriAccept, again, you should still be having logged in. So um, again, it's a simple, similar setup. And again, we could have made this any other way. We could have done this layout any other way, but we found that when persons are familiar with the layout, it's easier for them to, to, to gain familiarity to the tool. All right, so let's say we click get started again, then I click connect. And once we click connect, because the user is already there, you should have been logged in. If some of you have logged out this morning, you can simply get back to the point of just re-logging in. So I'm hoping everybody's at the same point. Now, you'd have seen view simulations. This one, there's no simulations there to view, all right? There are no simulations there to view, all right? So we're gonna go back home and we can always go back to work and we're getting back to work, all right? So when you're now talking about your creation of your, simula of your simulation, and that's where we're gonna go. You have two points you can do it. You can do it here or you can do it here, all right? When we're creating our simulation, as you can see, the steps are simply there. Step one is you selecting your location. Step two is you selecting your crop. Currently we have cassava and dasheen. And step three is simply you confirming, right? As we've gone through this process, we've attempted to do this in a way that is dynamic. So Dale used to do this for a particular site. And so he'd select the particular climate data. We've attempted to do this for the entire country. And in some instances, some of the data is missing. So anywhere both Tmax and Tmin are missing, the model will fail. So if you select a point in the country where Tmin and Tmax are the same, the model will fail. We've tested, Kingston works well. Man Manchester or Mandeville works well. So how we select a location? You said I find the icon, all right? Let's say I start typing a little known maroon village called Hayfield. All right, Hayfield is there. So there you go. The name will pop up for some of you. It didn't pop up here, but the name will come up and complete it and tell you exactly where it is. And you see, it, it, I like where Hayfield is. You see, ladies feel watch ill. Um, there's Kuna Kuna Pass somewhere close to here as well. So I've selected a location. That is my location. If I scroll down, you realize it tells me St. Thomas is the parish, community Hayfield. It gives me the longitude and the latitude. Everybody's still with me. We're not going through the long process that Dale did, even though that was very good and needed in a setting where you know, Dale can't be everywhere on the country. How do we get some data quickly? All right. So I'm simply going to click next. After clicking next, you're now coming to the point of selecting your crop details. Your crop details come from you selecting a crop. Now, as I said, there's cassava and dasheen in built. All right. And I'm going to select cassava. All right. You have your cultivar. And there you have some cultivars listed. Just for the, for, for the record, let me, let me make sure I change it. Dasheen, you realize you have two varieties of Dasheen and four or five varieties, four varieties of cassava. You can select whichever one you choose. I'm gonna select the Brazil one. The soil types, you can see the list of soil types there. All right, and this was something, you know, we got caught a little bit with this because we, could, we can dynamically pull the soil type based on location. But let's say you're a farmer in a sandy area and you decide you're gonna dig down six, how many meters? Let's say a meter, two meters, three meters down and you're gonna get yourself some clay or some other type of soil. It simply means dynamically pulling that soil would present a problem. Or if you want to know, should I be farming in Manchester, farming in this type of soil versus that type of soil? We've given you the option of selecting whichever soil type you want. So 
For me, I'm going to select silty, silty clay. All right. Next step, I'm simply going to click next. It lists for me all the options I've selected. So if something never gets selected correctly, I can go back. All right, you're almost there as it says. You just need to review. Everything is fine. All right, and all you do is click next. And pray that Murphy doesn't grab you. All right, and again, as I said, the simulation feature is there. Success. I can view some results. And again, it shows you where the location is on the map when the map comes up and it shows you your, your, your TWAD, Dale. Total dry weight, H W A D. That's your harvest weight. Harvest weight. All right. You, you, you realize it said to me, I mean, now I get nothing from this. I know some people, with, depending on their soil type, probably get some. All right. I can go back and I'll create a new simulation. I'm going to select Kingston. All right. All right. Next. Cassava. Leaving it at clay loam to change it clay loam. Next. Confirm. My simulations are F5 or refresh. My simulations complete. There you go. All right. So you can now view. That's the overall yield. Sure. Can I just say something? This is still working, right? No, no, no. Stand close to Come. All right. So. So, 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 just to put, just to show that this is really working, right? Can can you go back to the the yield and and spotlight it for me? So here with the yield, you, you're recognizing that you're actually getting three tons per hectare, three point five tons per hectare, which is just talking about your your roots alone. Because this was cassava, right? Yes. Okay, so this is talking your roots alone. Um, what's important is that this is based on dry weight. Remember, this is not fresh weight, right? So you, you'd have to multiply this by about two and a half to get what you, you would actually get in the supermarket, right? Um, what people aim at, just to give you, just for ballpark figure. So if you multiply this by two, two and a half, let's say three even, um, three times three is what? Nine, that's what? 11 and a half tons per hectare as fresh weight. What farmers aim for as fresh weight is roughly, especially for commercial values, right, the, for the Bami people, and it's between 25 tons to 40 tons per hectare. Um, the people that make um, beverage and use it, you know, as, as a replacement for high, high um, sugar content, content um, high sucrose content, would want about 40 tons per hectare. But the farmer is happy with about 25 tons per hectare. Go back to the other one now. Go back to total weight. Let me show you something. So total weight now. Um, and let me just say that this looks nice and fancy and everybody's saying, this was a hell of a lot of work. Please give Jay a hand, right? And Phil, they did an excellent job, right? When we got this grant um, in 2019 and I came and told them, they're like, okay, Dale, but how are we going to do this? We had no clue. I just call it accept because I was frustrated with people not accepting agriculture. And I call it accept and then try to find something to match accept. That's how we work back with, right? And we'll manage to get it to the point where we now have this. Now, the point we want to make is this is not a replacement for the modeling because we have to do the modeling in the background, load it up to the supercomputer so that when you come in, you don't have to worry with what I was doing before. You just do your clicks and it works. All right? 
but every capability that you saw in the model before we can put it potentially we can put it inside here yes so for example we could we could give you rather than you choosing one soil we could give you the option of choosing multiple soils yes yes rather than choosing one model we could give you the option of choosing more than one model or you could go in the model for example you remember when we were doing aqua crop and choose a j yes there was irish potato in aqua crop and there was also irish potato in dsat so therefore when you go on the tool you could choose the option of maya whether i want to simulate with dsat or with aqua crop and somebody asked me how do i know what to do what to choose with I would say if you have a little bit of data, meaning you don't know, you don't have the five different soil horizon that you need for DSAT, and you don't know everything about your fertilizer and your this and your that, and you just have your rainfall information, go for the simple model. Go for aqua crop. You with me? If you know your information and you want to get more accurate data, then you go for DSAT. Are you with me? Now, one issue though, Jay, as we have, we have showed them, is that there are times when you would select the models and your crop is not there at all, right? Because not everything can be modeled, right? It's just, just look, right now, I know there's an interest in modeling onions. Onion just was incorporated into Africa, crop, but it is not in DSA. There's an interest now, very strong interest in Jamaica, in investing in turmeric and ginger for obvious reasons. I, I was now, I, I learned in 2015 that there is less dispute globally that Jamaica's ginger is best than there is about coffee. We do have the absolute best ginger in the world. All right. And so, and because of all its properties and health properties and health benefits, the government wants to now ramp up production of ginger. Um, one gentleman did an experiment. You could get eight ginger rhizome from one plant and the farmer is happy. Well, he went to Riverton City, got some old tires, planted it in the old tires, recycled the water inside the greenhouse. And instead of getting eight plants to one, he was getting 80 to one. I personally went and saw it. He actually cut up the plastic, shred plastic bottles, put it inside of the soil and it creates New pore spaces because you know plastic is not biodegradable. And so the soil was cooler. So the nematodes that would eat out the ginger was not eating it out. Somebody heard of his success and decided that when he go back, he must pay for the old tires. That was a nuisance at Riverton and causing fire. Bad mind kill me all the time. So that experiment now crash. And so we have to start all over again. Boy, that's how we are as people. But anyways, let's see what will happen. I mean, the potential is there for us to do much better than we're doing now. But I really want to say, um, as we wrap this session with Jay, is that what we are trying to do is to say, not everybody will want to get all into the, the gory details of modeling. I get goosebumps when I have to model a new crop. Many of you is a nuisance. When you just want to know what happened, well, here is the opportunity. Um, most of the islands across the Caribbean now, and the world by extension, if you go online to FAO stat, right? You check any crop on FAO stat for any country. You are not going to see sweet potato differentiated by variety. Right, Moya? And as I told you before, in Jamaica alone, there are over 30 different varieties of sweet potato. Okay? So this is a major step that not only you're getting yields, but you're getting varietal specific yields, which is what was in the objective of the workshop. So rather than just go farm, Tiffany, some sweet potato, just the same way if I ask you, you want a mango, you're going to ask me, what kind of mango? You can now say, if it's not this sweet potato, me not want it. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? You can now say to the person, I want to farm this kind of carrot. Why? Because on this soil, Jay said it does best. You get what I'm saying? If I was in church, I would have said amen. All right. So the point I'm making is, ladies and gentlemen, we have come full circle. We have reached our point now where we can actually give much better granular information right, information that was not possible before. When I started in 2010, this was not even a pipe dream, right? Fast forward 12 years down the road and we are way better than we were before, right? So as much as, yes, the modeling work and the hard miles is done by some gory 
deal in some crazy room. To see a physicist now taking this to the next level. Again, let's give Jay and his team another hand. Jay and Theo work night and day. Um, I want to also want to say a special shout out to Jay's wife, Shauna, because Jay sacrificed his fifth year anniversary to work on this tool so that it would be ready for today. So Jay, please tell wifey thanks again. All right, really appreciate it. All right, so are there any comments online, Jay? What were people saying? They appreciate it. The Precision Agriculture, big up, Jay. All right, good, good, good. Um, okay, okay. All right, so a lot of people are saying outstanding work, good work, learned a lot, very education. Okay, good. All right, so where we are on the agenda now is, is a wrap up time, right? So we have, Jeopardy, ready? All right, so we have a little thing that we're going to do with everybody. All right, if, if, if we had everybody in one room, we would have divided you into groups. Um, after City Jeopardy, though, so if you can probably come here with the computer. All right, so what we're going to do. You have to be here for this one. You have to be here for this. All right. Okay. okay. So, so we're back, back to where we started. All right. Everybody can see the screen. Yes. All right. So, so this, this is how we're going, going to do the workshop review. review. Final, Final jeopardy. jeopardy. Well, we'll we'll speed speed here. So we only have a couple of minutes. And you know when. You know when um. You know when the captain I'm, I'm about to make a declaration, and you're telling that you just have to go for swipe, right? In a T20 match, you don't have time to play forward. Everybody has to just swipe. All right. All right. So let's go. Question. Somebody has to select the first category. So anybody select the first category. Do you have to help me on, on this one, please? Uh, CC Agriculture 400, all right? Um, do you have to pay attention, please? Give me your undivided attention. All right, $100. Everybody ready? Those online, anybody, somebody online have to say ready? Who wants to say yes? Do you tell me, give me a thumbs up. Okay, great. Here's a question. Now. What's the answer for this one? What he says? Yes. By modal. Yes, by modal. Excellent. Ask him to tell us what is the next category. Saras, can you select the next category, please? Lisa for 300, let's go. Lisa for 300, coming up now. Yeah, most. Name the weather inputs you need for the file in DSAT. Can you name them out several times? Rainfall, solar radiation. Max me, absolutely, absolutely. All right, Sarah, you're on fire. All right, next one. Tiffany, give me the next category. Lisa for? Yes, yeah, Lisa for 400. Okay, here we go. The dash dash tool allows you to experiment with different soils, cultivars, climates, among other parameters to determine ultimate, ultimate goal conditions. Yes, everybody can unmute if you want and talk. Anybody tell me what is the name of the tool? Tiffany. Tiffany, what she says? 
Sensitivity what? Sensitivity what? All right, we give it that. The sensitivity analysis tool. All right, very good. We're back. We're back. We have five minutes. All right, come quickly. Abbreviations. All right, being dictatorial now because you're not talking fast. Abbreviations for 300. What does the abbreviation smash mean? Don't tell me to crash into a car. Anybody? Anybody? Anybody online? Nobody online remember what smash means. We're in trouble. Um, come on, Andrew Sharp. Come on, Sarah. Sandra, why not? Oh my God, we're in trouble, Rev. Nobody can remember what smash is. Where's Jay? Jay would be Chris Fallen. Nobody remember what smash is. We're in trouble. We are in trouble. All right. All right, we have to move on. Simple model for the advection of storms and hurricanes. All right, that's a week here. So let's go back to abbreviations again. 100. What does CSAC mean? CSAC, anybody? CSAC, going once. You can unmute everybody. You can unmute. What it means? Private smart agricultural company. Go ahead. Climate smart agriculture. Agriculture. Um, compliance tool. Smart smart agriculture tool. compliance tool. Climate smart agriculture compliance tool. Yeah. Climate smart agricultural compliance tool. Climate smart agricultural compliance. All right. It's compliance, not compliant, not compliant but yes, you'll get that one. Excellent. Well, actually, compliance is correct. All right, next question. What is the category now? The person that just get it right a while ago. What is the category? Um, Andrew Sharp, tell us what category and what number. And how much money, please? Can you tell us? Once, twice, nothing. Um, Abbreviation. Same category? Abbreviations, $500. All right, here comes a question. And the question is, what does CRIF mean? CRIF, yeah, one of our sponsors. This is going to be taped, people. Please don't let me down. Caribbean. Nobody? Yes. yes. Thank you, Sarah, for saving the day. You will get more money from CRIF. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> all right, next one. Next, next one. one. Can, Can we just finish abbreviations since we have two more to go? All right, let's go to abbreviations 200. What does the abbreviation accept mean? Oh, no, don't show the into a pit. Please accept. Anybody? 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 Going once? Going twice, going three times, four times. Nobody know what accent means. Oh man. Oh brother, we're in trouble. We are in trouble. So after three days and three nights in the bed of the wheel, nobody remember what accent means. Oh my God, I'm in trouble. I'm in royal trouble. People, we're not going to get any further funding for accept that uh, Jay does show if nobody can guess it. What does A mean? What does CC mean? Must be easy. What is the CC in the context of climate change? All right, so what does E mean? All right, we have to move on. Agriculture climate change evaluation for production. And transformation, J left off the T. Michael left off the T. All right. Next one, last one for abbreviations. Boy, this one really bowled us over. What does T H I mean? Oh boy, we must get this one. J Jane is over in, in her bed now in UK crying. No. Temperature humidity index. Humidity index. Time humidity. 
index, time humidity, temperature humidity index. Temperature humidity index, or it can also yes. be called a thermal heat index. Yes. All right, good. So we'll finish abbreviations now. We're trying to rush through people quickly. Um, what category? Let's go miscellaneous, 200. The, the CSA tool has transitioned to which of the following stages? Excel, mobile app manual, B, manual except mobile, C, manual mobile Excel, and D, Excel manual mobile. B. B. Manual Excel mobile B app. B is correct. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Uh, let's go 400 miscellaneous. Which of the following is the result of elevated temperature and poultry? Increased activity, panting, decreased activity, sleeping. Panting. 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 And decreased activity. And decreased activity. All right. So let's go to climate change and agriculture, 300. Projections of the future suggest that Jamaica's climate will likely be what? 1.5 or over my drier and hotter. Absolutely. Hunter, yes. Absolutely. Dry Absolutely. Hunter. Absolutely. Very good. Very good. Prof. Taylor just smiled a while ago. $500 agriculture and climate. Three impacts of climate change and agriculture are namely, you must know that. Ask the rapporteur if you're not sure. Three impacts. Three impacts. Anybody? Sarah is the authority on this now. More intense droughts. Yeah. Decreased crop yields, yes. Increased heat stress. Higher yes. prevalence of pests and diseases. Very good, very good. Okay. All right, so we're back to agriculture and climate. 200, here we go. True or false, the number of intense hurricane traversing the Caribbean has decreased. True or false? False. 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 Everybody agree? Yes, Three. pause. Okay. All right, let's finish this one. The THI is an index used to measure dash dash in livestock. Heat stress. Yes, yes. heat stress. Okay, heat good. We almost finished. We just have four more to go. Let's go DSAT for 200. Well, five more. True or false? The output of DSAT are 100% accurate. Um. False. 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 The outputs are useful, but will always have a margin of error. Okay. DSAT for 500. To graph your outputs in DSAT, you select which option? Overview that out, plant grow that out, summary that out. Plant grow that out. Absolutely. These are brilliant questions by Michael Card. All right. DSAT for 100, and then we have three more to go. DSAT is an application software. Software. The acronym means what? Okay. People, please. <laughs> Decision support Nobody system. Online. Decision online. support system for. Nobody online, remember? Yes. Decision How about support. Time? Time? How about that you? Decision support system for um, agrotechnology transfer. Decision support system for agrotechnology transfer. Absolutely. Thank you, Abba, for bailing us out. All right. I'm going to send it on for you over WhatsApp. All right. Mr. Nanos, 100. Last one. Second last. Second last. The software that determines the grade of tuna by measuring a cross section of its tail is called A, tuna scope. B, telescope, C, periscope, D, tuna measurement tool. A. A, A is correct. A oh. is correct. Let's go back. Second to last one before Erica comes. True or false? The sargasm is said to be the greatest single threat to the Caribbean tourism economy. True or false? True. True or false? True. True. True, true. Last question. Last question. $500. Which of the following rates is a sign of strong 
heat stress in animals, 98 to 120 breaths per minute, 120 to 160, 200 to 250, all of the above. D. You see in B? B. 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 All right. All right, let's see what the answer is. And the answer is B. The answer is B. All right. All right, so we have final jeopardy. This is the last question now. Final jeopardy says, the Caribbean picture says that temperature will, will do what? You have, to, you, have to, you have to feel it because temperatures will what? Rainfall will what? This is like the cause crop yields to do what? And each stress to what? So you have to fill the space with increase, decrease, don't know, say the same. Okay. Kevin, temperature. Increases. Decrease. Rainfall. And this is likely to cause crop yieldage to decrease and heat stress to increase. All right, let's see. She's right. Increase, decrease, decrease, increase. increase. That's what she yeah. said, right? Excellent, excellent, excellent. excellent. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. Now we have come to the end, end, end of the workshop. If you are going to get your certificate, you must complete the online registration form. Um, Leon, can you just call Michael or Rodika for me, please? Let us put it in the chat um, so that we can we can have it ready. Erica, can you make your way, please? So we're letting you over early today, as we promised. All right, our project manager that provided the, the, the lion's share of the funding for all of this to happen. Our faithful Erica is here. Erica, thank you so, so. Thank you, Erica. I will have more money next time again. Come, 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 come. All right, Erica, come. Yeah, let's go. I don't know if I talk as loudly as you do, so let me know if my voice is carrying. Is it okay? Thank you. So we have come to the end of an exciting and informative workshop. One that demonstrated that the solution to some of the greatest challenges, including climate change, can only be found when persons of different backgrounds and disciplines come together and combine our efforts. How can we thank the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology, Professor Michael Taylor, who before presenting to us the issues facing our planet in his usual engaging and creative style, so graciously entrusted in our care the resources of his office so that we could assist in drawing attention to the 1.5 dilemma in two times as many days. And also, how could we thank Professor Stevenson, who in addition to the support of her department was kind enough to set the climate for the workshop with her gracious personality by chairing our one or opening ceremony and then returning this morning to open the remarks for the third day. We thank our sponsors, the University of the West Indies, CRIF, SPC, and especially the Caribbean Regional Track of the PPCR, whose contribution to this workshop did not stop at funding. They were intimately engaged and involved in the planning and the organization. And it shows that climate resilience is a matter that they take seriously. Special thanks, special, special thanks to Dr. Stacy Kennedy Richards for delivering such inspiring keynote address on our first day. We thank also our presenters. Ladies and gentlemen in the room and online, kindly assist me in giving a round of applause to our presenters. They worked on their presentations, I must tell you, and, and delivered drafts from December. So this was not a fly-by-night setup. They really put effort into ensuring that the participants had a very good experience in attending. They were given the task of breaking down complex concepts to ones and zeros so that even the persons of, a, of least interest are not only able to understand, but for them to develop through enough um, enthusiasm that will allow them to be carriers of the message of climate change. And we certainly have learned a lot in terms of the tools used in, in agricultural and in agricultural modeling, especially. And for those of us who don't have a plot of land yet, 
we can contact Mr. Rankin, Dr. Rankin, and he will advise us where we can um, start our field plots. Right, Dr. Rankin? <laughs> the presenters helped us to build awareness of Caribbean resilient, um, Caribbean resilient options. They have provided hands-on training in the use of e-solutions needed for climate resilience. They have evaluated the Caribbean climate resilience service products for agriculture sector, and they have explored options for financing Caribbean climate resilience. We thank, we thank, we express thanks to Drs. Dale Rankin and Mr. Steve Maxime, who so ably led their team from the planning stage to know, maneuvering through all the dark clouds while providing some dry humor as they tried to convince us of their love for each other. Did anyone get the joke that Dale was trying to give about the police seeing him taking up the bags of cassava? No, I don't think so. <laughs> How do we thank our planning team? This is Dion Mary, Ms. Redita Simon, Mrs. Terry Ann Collins, Mr. Michael Card, and Ms. Tracy Johnson for the resilience displayed in making this workshop possible. Denying sleep when necessary in order to ensure Dale and Steve can have peace of mind. We thank also our videographer, Mr. Hugh Bartley, and his team, who are responsible for the excellent video quality that we're seeing coming through each day. I propose that we thank all the hard workers by ensuring that we take the message of climate resilience and its possibilities to the world. Let us begin to live what we have learned so that others will be aware of all the great possibilities of climate resilience. Thanks to Mr. Ishmael Preston from MITS, who facilitated our streaming across YouTube and continued to communicate with us. No, we haven't forgotten to say thanks to all the participants online. I see 87 of you are still on. We started our first day with about 150. And to still have so many of you on shows dedication and commitment and shows that you were engaged and excited about the material being presented. We thank you. We thank you for dedicating the start of your year to this workshop. And I hope it has set the tone for your year. Over 400 participants were registered, I must note. And we, we were encouraged by those numbers and we were trying to figure out the best facilities to provide this um, joint delivery in terms of face-to-face -face and online. And I'm, I'm heartened that it turned out quite well. Finally, we thank God for making all of this possible. And we encourage you to do continue to explore the tools introduced over the course of this week as we continue to build a climate resilient Caribbean. Thank you. All right, so all that's there for me to say to everybody is safe travel um, to your places of destination. For those of you that are online, safe travel. <laughs> Um, but thank you very much. Um, we're very, very happy to be here with you. Um, certainly, it was our pleasure. We started this planning last year, November, I think, or just about there. At the time, it was just a, just a hype dream, Jim, Steve, and myself. I remember us being on vacation in different countries and just trying to figure out what we were going to do. And thanks to Erica, we managed to pull it off, and she managed to convince the stakeholders that it was necessary. Um, we're very, very, very heartened by the goodwill, the, the messages of support. Some of you have been so generous with your compliments. Thank you so very much. I want to thank also Stephanie, who was my little right hand, who's here today at the back of the room. Um, Erica, before um, this news on UB TV and everybody say we didn't remember them, let's thank the ancillary workers um, who clean the room on a daily basis, our caterers as well. Um, I forgot to mention them and our sharers upstairs and all the members in the physics department that just accommodated as a family. Um, I'm sure everybody felt welcome all the time. I want to thank Kianis Catering, I want to thank Ms. Davis, uh, Ms. Burke, who was in the background pulling the strings, even though she's not well, she's very sick. She calls every day just to make sure everything is done. I want to thank her in her absence. Ms. Burke, thank you so, so very much. Um, thanks to Dr. Stevens again for allowing us to use the, the facilities here. 
um, without charge. Thanks for, for Taylor. And I want to thank our rapporteur who has the unenviable task of pulling everything together that we have now said and done in a report um, that she has promised a very quick turnaround. Maria, thanks in advance. We really appreciate your being here. And thanks to everybody, Dion, and all the others, the rest of you. God bless you. Have a good rest of the evening. Take care. Um, ciao. Peace. All right, so please remember to fill out your feedback form once you fill it out and click submit. Your certificate will be mysteriously emailed to your account. All right, already signed by Prof. Taylor and Prof. Stevenson, but you must fill it out. Thank you. The assessment form. No, but two. And just let me start another loop. And just let me start another loop. Let's put everything in here. The industry, please. Oh, I sent it by three times already. But copy back the link and send it again. You see? All right, we're sending back the link again. Um, we did it twice before, but Dion is going to send it back again. So when you send it, D. All right, so it's in the it's in the chat again. Oh, okay. All right, so here it is again. This is a link for the feedback form. Um, you can send it to all your colleagues, your friends. Please, please, please fill it out. See, you want to just copy this thing into an email just in case anybody can get it. Just email it to me. Boom. Okay, all right. So if you need any further information, please remember you can always email us. All right. Um, All right, guys. Thank you so much. All right, guys. All right. All right. So one last thing: those of you who are asking for the presentations, we will send a Dropbox link with all the presentations. All right. So just give us a few days. All right, people, take care. We're going to end the stream now. Um, thank you so much again. God bless you. Safe travel. All right. Good night.